If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 201, Author Note Hello everyone. I wanted to take this opportunity to say that thank you for all your support and love. I am not a confident person in real life at all but your comments always make my day knowing that what I do, is liked by at least one person. And over the past few weeks, I had gained enough confidence in my shitty skills as a writer to start making my own novel. It took some time but I was able to write a story that everyone will enjoy. If you have liked Berserk, One Piece, Naruto, Tales of Demons and Gods then you will enjoy my story since it has been heavily influenced by the above mentioned series. This is the synopsis of story. As an orphan wandering through the streets, I couldn't help but wonder if I would amount to anything as I didn't have anyone to take care of me, I didn't have the luxury of having a family so I could only survive by begging but one day, a mysterious figure came across me and the next thing I know, I am thrown into this abyss-like prison. Slowly but surely, I began to grow in this prison waiting for the right moment to strike but the events that unfold after are something that introduce me to the world of cultivation and the world of Murim. Even if I don't have any talent, I will practice a thousand more times than a genius. Even if I don't have much potential, I will crawl until I am until the top or I'll die trying. I know it's too much to ask but can you give my new series a chance? The name is, Miriam, Struggle of the Week. Chapter Number 200 The Evil of Lavender Tower The misty terrain of Lavender Tower was shrouded in an eerie darkness, as if it was covered by a thick blanket of shadows that stretched endlessly into the horizon. The air was thick with the scent of decay and rotting flesh, as if the very ground itself was teeming with the undead. The elderly trio of Agatha Ainsworth, Brady, and Grady, stood at the foot of the tower, their expressions grim and determined. Agatha, held a staff, made from a gnarled branch of an ancient tree, adorned with a glowing gemstone that emitted a soft orange light. As the three trainers stood together, the ground beneath them suddenly erupted, and the undead began to crawl out of the earth, held together by strands of causality and malice. The army of corpses charged towards the trio, but before they could reach them, Agatha let out a furious scream, her dentures gritted so hard that blood burst out of her lips and gums. William, Mega Evolve! She shouted, raising her staff and crashing it into the ground. The gemstone immediately burst into an orange light, at the same time as the Gengarite on William's body burst into a light blue light, considerably brightening the dark terrain. The stones launched bolts of colorful energy toward one another, which connected and changed into a dark purple energy that recoiled into Gengar who popped out of Agatha's shadow and engulfed him. William started changing shape right before his trainer's eyes, his back spikes growing far larger and sharper, and showing up around his arms and legs, which also grew. Jengar wailed out in agony from the overflow of energy surging through his body. The dark energy exploded after about a minute, fully revealing Jengar's new form. Aside from the new, enlarged spikes, his face had changed into a darker shade of purple which gradually changed into a red hue as it went down the ghost's body. His legs were still stubby, but his arms had grown considerably, in an almost comical way. As soon as Agatha observed that, however, Jengar's limbs sunk into the ground, leaving the body halfway visible. The shadows twisted and turned into a cross that emerged in the middle of the battlefield. A terrain of darkness converged into the cross as Mega Jengar's shadow tag ability took hold of the battlefield. Shadow Ball William raised his hand into the air and the surrounding ghostly energy swirled into thousands of shadow balls, all attacking the barrier surrounding Lavender Tower. The attack tore apart the zombies like a hot knife through butter, and the sound of their bones cracking and flesh tearing filled the air. Lavender Tower. Boom. Austin couldn't help but gulp. Haunter had tanked all of his Pokémon's most powerful attacks as if it was protecting something. Do you want to battle? A horrifyingly distorted voice called out in a sing-along voice. Austin's mind went blank as Austin suddenly found himself transported to a vast, open meadow. The grass was tall and golden, swaying gently in the breeze. But what caught his attention were the row of headless monks kneeling in front of him. Each monk wore prayer beads that were connected to their decapitated heads. Some had their eyes stitched shut, while others had their ears sewn together. Still, others had their mouths sealed with thick, black thread. At the end of the row, a figure stood shrouded in darkness. Austin couldn't make out its features, but he could feel its presence looming over him like a dark cloud. He blinked, and suddenly, he was back in the Lavender Tower. The graveyard outside was silent, save for the soft rustling of the fog. But then, the haunter moved aside, revealing the corpse of Butch. Austin felt a surge of fear and revulsion as the disfigured body stood up, its eyes gleaming with a manic glee. Do you want to battle? 
Butch's voice was distorted, and Austin could see madness glittering in his eyes. If I win, will you let me go? Austin asked, his voice trembling with fear. Butch's grin faltered for a moment, and then he let out a bone-chilling shriek. You want to leave me, why? Why don't you stay? I'm sorry, but I can't stay, Austin said, his heart pounding. I have friends waiting for me. Butch chuckled, and his eyes narrowed. Sure, I'll let you go if you beat me. No homo, Austin joked, trying to ease the tension while his mind was trying to figure out what the hell was happening. Pika. Pikachu's voice snapped Austin out of his trance. The entity took a step back, and the graveyard began to shift and contort around them. Tombstones rose and shattered, reforming into an ominous battlefield. The ground quivered and groaned beneath Austin's feet, as the smell of decay and rot overwhelmed his senses. He looked to his side, seeing the fear in Pikachu's eyes as they both realized the full extent of the danger they were facing. This was not a time for jokes or games. One misstep, and they could end up like the lifeless corpses that surrounded them. As the entity spoke, Austin felt a chill run down his spine. The voice sounded distorted, as if it were coming from the depths of some unholy abyss. He could feel its power, its malevolence. This was no ordinary opponent. What kind of battle should this be? Austin asked, trying to hide his fear. The entity seemed to read his mind, searching through Butch's memories before responding. Let's have a six on six. Omake paragraph. Back when men fought with swords and shields, the most common among the shields were those made from sand slash. Once a year, a sand slash sheds its skin, and the spikes left behind are gathered by skilled artisans which carve them into shields of the same texture. Sand shrew exists in many places in the wild, but only on Route 23 do they commonly appear as sand slash. This fact allowed the Indigo League to extend its dominance as far south as Pallet Town even back in the Warring States era, although it would be after sand slash shields were left behind by technology that it gained its present mastery over Kanto and Johto. A sand slash shield could be used for attack and defense it is made from the same tough coating as the rest of a sand slash's skin, and the numerous spikes make it far too easy for a sword to get stuck allowing valuable time for a counter-attack. When bashed into the enemy, it both bludgeons and stabs, a well-placed strike could be fatal. These shields, however, struggled to combat the advent of cavalry armies and were made obsolete by rifles, which fire bullets with more force than a sand slash can block. In the popular tabletop RPG Dungeons and Drago Knight, sand slash shields add a plus 2 to the armor class and deal 1d4 damage. Chapter Number 201 Battle at Lavender Tower Austin gazed upon the battlefield built from tombstones that his opponent had mushed together for them to battle. The distorted voice of Butch said, Arise. Chills went down Austin's spine as he saw that corpses all around him seemed to be possessed with some kind of aura before the energy tore off chunks and amalgamated them into a skeletal appendage that looked like a rotting white hand as its bony fingers curled into a half fist with rotting strips of flesh dangling from the bones. Dangling tendons indicate the hand was severed by another creature. BRR. Austin couldn't take in the sight of this rotting white hand as he threw up on the floor. Pikachu patted Austin's back while everyone else looked at the entity and the white hand with their guards up ready to defend their trainer with their lives on the line. I sent my first Pokemon, you sent URS. Austin rubbed his burning throat as he looked at the white hand floating in the center of the ghostly battlefield. Austin didn't say a word as he telepathically communicated with his Pokemon via Muna. RWRR. With a loud screech. Shed Ninja appeared on the battlefield against the White Hand. Shed Ninja, use Shadow Sneak to dodge that thing's attack. In response to his trainer's telepathic command via Muna, Shed Ninja screeched loudly before phasing into the ground becoming a shadow. Punch. The entity called out as the White Hand crashed into the ground shaking the entire floor as cracks spread out causing Austin to gulp. Good thing Shed Ninja was his opponent. Austin thought as he tried to think of a plan to escape he was pretty sure this thing that was possessing Butch's corpse would kill him and his Pokemon regardless if they win the battle or not. It was just playing with them. Austin telepathically asked Pikachu something via Muna as Pikachu jumped into his backpack and switched on the Pokedex before switching towards the transfer system. Looking at Krabby's Pokeball, Pikachu took a deep breath. It works. Muna's message gave Austin a sigh of relief. At least he found a way to help his Pokemon escape. If it ever comes down to it at least he could save them but knowing them, they would stick by his stick till the very end. Is there a way out? I don't know. What if you set up a large enough trick room? We could escape but Pikachu and Caesar wouldn't be able to escape this monster. Boom. 
The White Hand tore the entire battlefield apart but Shed Ninja easily managed to evade everything. But there might be a way. How? I can telepathically sense that the Giant Haunter is somehow being controlled. Are you suggesting that Black F, I mean the Giant Haunter is our way out? Yes, currently Haunter is the most informed Pokemon that would know what that thing is and what its weaknesses are. Muna, are you sure about this? Muna, are you sure about this? I don't know. What the hell do you mean you don't know? I just don't, Haunter is begging for help and I figured that IT will return the favor. Muna, are you saying that your plan is based on a hunch that the Haunter might help us if we help it? Muna, are you seriously going to have US get potentially killed just for a hunch? I am sorry. Sigh, I am also sorry for shouting, I don't think I could live with myself if any one of you ended up like Radicate. Then what should we do? Let me think about it. Muna, can you locate the device that Team Rocket used to hide their presence from the ghost-type Pokemon? I can but why? We are going to use that to escape. Would that work? It could but we'll need help, some insider help. Screech. Orbs of ominous flames covered the white hand as Shed Ninja used Will-O-Wisp on the Frankenstein-like creature. The entity's smile eerily got bigger as it felt that the resentment of the dead with the walls between this plane of reality and the realm of ghosts the afterlife was slowly breaking. The plane between the afterlife and the physical world was loosening. Why are you smiling? Hearing Austin's question, the head on Butch's body did a 360 degrees turn causing Austin to take a step back. Are you scared for me like those people who buried me alive? What? The entity's words caused Austin's heart to almost stop as he remembered a weird creepy pasta floating around on the internet back on Earth about the lost boss of Lavender Tower who was a zombie trainer. Austin paused for a second as he didn't know if this entity was the Buried Alive or maybe was just looking into the similarities between this entity and Buried Alive. Why you were Buried Alive? Kakik, of course, I was. The surrounding ghostly energy began to oscillate at an alarming rate. Caesar and Charm Leon stepped up in front of Austin while Firo and Pidgeot stood at the back. You know why I was buried alive because I wanted to find a way to bring her back. My precious Evie. And what did I get in return, a nameless grave where I suffered until my screaming voice could no longer come out of my mouth. Austin closed his eyes and ears as the hollow wail of buried alive echoed throughout the lavender tower. You know you are quite similar to me. W, what? You lost your precious radicate at the hands of these people. I can see from the memories of this guy, a woman with red hair bragging about how she had used an extremely deadly and incurable poison on your radicate which would cause excruciating pain until death. I wonder how much pain your radicate must have been in during the last moments of its life. Buried Alive's words caused Austin to look down as his hat overshadowed his eyes which glowed red. Buried Alive raised an eyebrow before outstretching his hand. I would like to extend an offer. What is it? Join me. What? Join me and I'll help you in getting your revenge against these people. Omake Paragraph The vast majority of Pokémon exhibit a low rate of gender dimorphism. Compared to humans, the female and male of the species generally differ much less in height, have less prominent breasts, if mammalian, and have less difference in facial structure, indeed, many Pokémon can only be distinguished by the actual genitalia. One of the most prominent exceptions to this rule is the Nidoran. The female of the species exhibit large whiskers and are light blue, while the males have a spikier body, a purple color, and a longhorn. Occasionally, intersex nidoran is found, with the color of one type of nidoran, but the physical appearance of another. It is said that the whiskers and rounded ears of a female nidoran give its senses not only superior to its male counterparts but among the sharpest in the Pokemon world. They are a shy race of Pokemon who have learned the fear of man, and it is these senses which allow them to hide so well in the wild. Although they outnumber the overhunted male of the species by a ratio of about 5 to 2, most trainers believe the two Nidoran to be of equivalent rarity. Chapter number 202 The Secret to Win The wind howled mournfully through the decrepit gravestones as Austin stood facing the twisted figure before him. Buried Alive's disfigured face twisted into a grotesque smile as he spoke. Of course, I can help you get your revenge, boy. But you must help me first. Firo screeched angrily at Austin its wings flapping furiously. As Austin tried to calm the enraged bird. I know you're angry, Firo, but please calm down, Austin said. Austin spoke up, his voice low and filled with tension. Team Rocket is an international criminal organization. How can you possibly help me take revenge against them? Buried Alive chuckled, the sound sending shivers down Austin's spine. You underestimate me, boy. 
I am a servant of the void, the darkness that Arceus banished from this plane of existence. Do you really believe I cannot help you achieve your revenge? Austin hesitated, unsure of what to make of this strange and unsettling figure. Buried alive seemed to sense his unease and leaned in closer, his eyes gleaming with a mad intensity. When I look at you, boy, I see myself when I was but a naive fool, struggling to get justice against the world for taking my precious EV. I can help you get your revenge, but you must become my vessel. Austin felt his heart race as Buried Alive outstretched his hand, which began to glow with a ghostly aura. You will become the strongest, boy. All this power you see before you, all of it will be yours, as long as you become my vessel. So that's what his plan was. Austin thought as Buried Alive spoke, Austin's Pidgeot and Firo screeched in protest, their wings outstretched. Sigh. Austin suddenly opened his pokeballs as he returned the two avians causing orbs of white to form around them that suddenly disappeared. Austin returned Wordertle, Charm Leon, Krabby, Ninjask, and Bulbasaur. Walking alongside Pikachu, Austin took a step forward as he returned Shed Ninja. But Austin remained resolute, taking a step forward and asking, Will I become as powerful as you? Buried Alive smiled, a grotesque expression that seemed to stretch his already twisted features to their limits. No, boy. You will become even stronger. As Austin moved closer, Buried Alive could barely contain his excitement. He could feel the power coursing through his veins, ready to be unleashed. But just as Austin was about to step within arm's reach, he stopped. What's wrong? Buried Alive asked, his smile faltering for a moment. Can I ask you something? Austin said, his voice oddly calm. Buried Alive hesitated, unsure of what to make of Austin's sudden change in demeanor. Did you meet Giratina before or after you died? Buried Alive's eye widened at Austin's words. Before he could respond, however, Austin's jacket opened, revealing a miniature Clefairy whose entire body was covered in a psychic aura. With stored power, Clefairy converted his belly drum and Butterfree's quiver dance into pure psychic energy that had only one target. With a sudden burst of energy, Clefairy unleashed a wave of psychic energy, blasting Buried Alive and the Alpha Haunter back into the wall. The force of the blast shattered the gravestones around them and sent debris flying in every direction. Boom. Caesar emerged from Austin's shadow using pursuit as he clashed with the white hand using brick break. The floor beneath Caesar's feet cracked as he threw a device with a crystal embedded into it towards his trainer who activated the device suddenly dark type energy flowed out covering Austin and Pikachu who seemed to turn invisible to the ghosts of Lavender Tower. Caesar mocked the white hand before disappearing into the shadows. Buried Alive was pissed as it found the human boy to be missing. Through Butch's memories, Buried Alive knew that the human was using a special crystal that was made naturally when the bodies of Dark-type Pokémon are fossilized for thousands of years under the pressure and heat of underwater volcanoes hence these crystals were rare. So rare that only a hundred people in the entire world knew of their existence. These crystals could cover the body of anyone touching it in a veil of Dark-type energy effectively making them invisible to ghosts. Buried Alive had a sadistic smile as he let out a bellowed laugh that showed traces of insanity echoed through the halls. Hide, hide like the prey you are. I'll enjoy hunting you down. Austin's spine tingled with an icy sensation as he heard the maniacal cackling of Buried Alive echo through the halls. Crack. Boom. Under the command of Buried Alive, the white hand began thrashing about causing destruction wherever it hit. Austin and Pikachu hopped onto Caesar's back as they flew out of the room at high speeds. Austin had given an explicit command. Find Murawak. While Caesar and Pikachu were confused at their trainer's decision of action but they didn't question him as they knew their trainer wouldn't give them a command that would get them into danger. Muna meanwhile had figured out what Austin was trying to do. Buried Alive would more than likely target Murawak and her son and use them as hostages to flush them out. Muna, can you think of a way to get some help from that haunter? I can but that would alert that thing. What if we distract Buried Alive? Could you then contact Haunter telepathically? Yes but you have to distract the thing long enough for me to establish a telepathic connection. How long? One minute. Trainer, are we going to be okay? Don't worry Muna, we will be fine. Just think of this as a bad dream. That's called a nightmare. Chuckle, I wasn't aware. He he he. Muna, can you tell Caesar and Pikachu my plan? I am all ears. You don't have any ears. Muna. That's cringe. Just tell them my plan. Austin said with a frown as he clicked on his poke decks. Lavender Tower, Hidden Burrow. Cubone shut his eyes tight, trying to drown out the cacophony of destruction wrought by the white hand. 
Clutching to his mother's club, he huddled next to her, scanning the shadows for any sign of danger. Murawak, on high alert, peered up at the trembling ceiling, wondering about the fate of the human boy. What manner of creature could control such a monstrous power? And what horrors lay in store for them all? Omake Paragraph The Pokémon world is a diverse place, and many cultures have had different interpretations of what the markings on the moon mean. To some, they are men, to people at extreme latitudes cheese. Most commonly, they are said to represent a neat arena, and therefore that Pokémon is typically associated in myth with lunar deities, who are therefore considered female. In reality, the markings could just as easily represent a Buniri, or perhaps a Nidorino or Nidoran, or even a Pikachu. But it is Nidorina who claims this title most often by far, for it is Nidorina who always seems to be staring up at the moon, waiting for a piece of it to fall to Earth so they can evolve. The origins of these mysterious moon shadows are still debated by astronomers, but current speculation holds them to be a sort of giant geoglyph, similar to the pattern bush in the Caei Islands. Whether this means the moon is dominated by men who worship Nidorina, or perhaps some similar shaped Pokemon, a society of Nidorina themselves, or something else far stranger is known only to its inhabitants in the Clefairy. Chapter number 203 Distraction Buried alive limp through the graveyard, his spectral form gliding past the crumbling tombstones and tangled weeds that had grown over the graves. The chill of death hung heavily in the air, and the faint whispers of the departed echoed all around him. He paused as he reached one of the oldest graves in Lavender Tower, and his ghostly energy began to swirl around the headstone. With a flicker of his ectoplasmic essence, he cleared away the centuries of mold and decay that had obscured the stone, revealing the faded inscription that had lain hidden for so long. Here lies Eve, he murmured, the melancholic note in his voice carrying across the silent graveyard. His spectral hand phased through the grave, and he retrieved a crystal orb from within. Its surface glowed with a ghostly aura, and buried alive could feel the power radiating from it. This was the Forbidden Life Orb, an item created from the remnant soul of a powerful Pokémon. This was the Forbidden Life Orb. An item that was created from the remnant soul of that bastard. Crack. Boom. Suddenly a loud bang caught the attention of Buried Alive as he threw the Life Orb toward the Alpha Shiny Haunter. Stop it. Buried Alive just smirked at the Alpha Shiny Haunter's pleas. Buried Alive merely smirked at the Haunter's pitiful pleas. Blame your trainer for abandoning you and dying he spat out. What was his name again? Ah, yes, Ethan Ainsworth. He got what was coming to him. Cubone looked up to the ceiling from his nest as he held his mother's club tightly near his heart that beats faster and faster as he and his mother heard steps coming towards their nest. Cubone looked at his mother who had a feral look in her eyes ready to defend her child even if it meant dying. Suddenly the steps stopped in front of the wooden plank that acted as a slanted roof for the mother and son. Murawak took her club from her son as she stood in front of Cubone with her club outstretched. Creak. As if an otherworldly force was acting on the plank as it was suddenly lifted. Murawak threw a boomerang attack at the same time the roof was lifted. Thud. Oops. Austin almost barfed out all his breakfast as Murawak's boomerang hit his stomach thankfully Butterfree was able to stop it on time otherwise Austin's stomach would have gone. Free. Butterfree yelled at Murawak for almost killing his trainer. Murawak bowed her head in shame as Cubone ran out from his mother's back he hugged Austin's leg holding his stomach in pain. Putting on a smile, Austin managed to squeeze out while patting Cubone's head. D. Don't worry, I, am. All right. Maro. Murawak stepped forward to apologize but Butterfree's death glare caused her to stop. Free. Hearing Butterfree's concerned voice, Austin held his up to reassure the butterfly Pokemon that he was all right. Fighting against the pain. Austin went on one knee as he said, Miss Murawak, buried alive is roaming the halls of this tower. Currently, it is too dangerous for you and your son to remain here. So for your safety please go into this pokeball and I'll transfer you to safety. Murawak understood Austin's words via Butterfree's translation. Looking at the pokeball in Austin's hand, Murawak's mind flashed to the time when she had first encountered Team Rocket. Murawak looked on as Austin smiled when Cubone showed him his club. Murawak knew that she could trust this kind of human who was unlike those monsters. Cubone curiously looked at the pokeball in Austin's hand before tapping it. Austin and Murawak couldn't react at all as the pokeball in Austin's hands glowed with white light before teleporting to Professor Oak's lab. Murawak touched Austin's hand in disbelief as tears began to flow down his eyes. Where is my son? Where is my son? Seeing a hysterical mother crying Austin fumbled to calm her down. 
Don't worry Miss Murawak, your son is fine. Cuban is. Austin's words were cut off by a mind-numbing presence that appeared behind him. Or is he? Austin immediately turned around pushing Murawak behind him as Butterfree's eyes glowed while looking at the reanimated rotting corpse of Butch. There stood in the corner with a poke ball rotating on his finger was buried alive but he looked kinda different. The skin of Butch's body had turned blue as blood flowed out from his eyes. You think you can save them? You couldn't even save your Raticate. What makes this any different? But I have to say, getting your Pokemon to cause a distraction while you save the mother and child was admirable. Foolish of you to assume that I couldn't see through your plan, boy. Buried Alive's words sent chills down Austin's spine as he recognized the poke ball spinning on his finger. It was Cubone's poke ball. But how? Krabby's poke ball was easily able to go through. Did Buried Alive intercept the poke ball mid teleport? Hey, 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 let's calm down. You said you wanted a vessel, right? Buried Alive had an insane look in his eyes as he clenched Cubone poke ball. No. Austin stepped forward with sweat dripping down his face. You need a vessel? Right? Just let go of that poke ball and I will become your vessel. Too late boy. The hands of Buried Alive clenched with an intensity that would make the devil himself tremble. Murawak, Butterfree, and Austin stood frozen, their eyes transfixed on the unfolding horror. And then, in a burst of violent energy, the poke ball detonated with a force that shook the very ground beneath their feet. At the top of Lavender Tower, Caesar dodged past the white hand's punch as Pikachu on Caesar's back released a thunderbolt towards the manus of an amalgamated cadaver. White hand froze mind air as the smell of burnt flesh made Caesar and Pikachu hold their nostrils. Whoosh! The shadows parted as a giant claw grabbed onto Caesar's metallic abdomen. Pikachu glared at the eerie smile on the shiny haunter's face. White feathers shot out from somewhere in the sky catching the shiny alpha Pokemon off guard as the feathers seemed to appear from all directions. Just what is going on? Haunter thought with a frown as buried alive seal on his soul caused him to lash out violently. Dark energy gathered around Haunter's claws but unlike before this energy was much more chaotic. This amplification was caused by the life orb dangling around Haunter's neck. Haunter looked at the Pokemon who were charging up their attacks toward him. Escape. 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 Haunter was barely able to speak as he tried to warn these Pokemons. Please escape or it will enslave you. Haunter had a melancholic look in his eyes as he launched a gigantic claw-like wave of dark energy at Caesar and Pikachu while thinking. Just what would you have done in my situation, Ethan? Omega Paragraph Nidoqueen is said to be the queen of the Safari Zone, a majestic Pokémon fit only for royalty. History has shown them to be far more popular among usurpers, petty lords, and dictators than actual rightful kings. Giovanni's Nidoqueen is the latest in this long tradition. Some speculate that the fact that they have Nidoqueen is why these tyrants can gain power, and not the other way around. They are indeed powerful Pokémon, with tough skin and the ability to create earthquakes when they stomp the ground, many have strengthened an army, but they are not so strong as for a single one of them to be the difference between victory and defeat in warfare. The reality of the situation is equal parts tradition and megalomania. Those with pretensions to monarchy catch Nidorina and search high and low for moonstones, in the hope of legitimizing themselves through their possession of a Pokemon of Monarchs. But it is also true that Nidoqueen is a Pokemon that loves luxury and battle and spurs their trainers to seek the power of a king so that as a king's Pokemon they can win for themselves power, not unlike a queen's. Chapter number 204 Fate Can't Be Changed Roughly eight decades ago. I do not understand, Ethan, what good would it do to leave the territory when you have the perfect haven to become a ghost master? The elder man looked at his only son with apprehension. You may think that you ran away, but in truth, we allowed you to travel all across Kanto to give you a taste of the life outside our haven so that you might realize the futility of your beliefs. We never anticipated that you would get lost in your delusions. Ethan, now 19, simply looked away. He was tired of the rigid laws and traditions that his father, Artemis Ainsworth, upheld with great faith. Over the centuries, the House of Ainsworth had produced some of the most powerful and accomplished ghost masters in Kanto and the surrounding regions, so much that the name Ainsworth had come to be associated with mastery in ghost types. However, it was also true that the accomplishments dated over several generations, and there seemed to be an acute shortage of such accomplishments over the last three generations. I am only trying to stand up to the Ainsworth name, Father. He replied, pride filling his voice. We have stagnated, and we need to change in the coming times. We cannot just pretend that the world is all the same. 
Ha! Ah. The sixty-ish man laughed. If one also changes with the changing world, then how will one know that the times have changed? Ethan rolled his eyes. He had left Lavender Town back when he was fourteen, with his ghastly who was born with the monster gene, who had, through training, effort, and experience, evolved into a formidable alpha hunter. He and Hunter had faced the Draconids of the East, the Blackthorns, the Wadara people, the Caucasians, and the Ice people of the North. He and Hunter had grown in their self-imposed exile from home, learning, experiencing, and growing. And now he was back for more of his family's residence to experience the larger world outside. He had, simply not estimated the true breadth of the situation. You ran away, dreamy-eyed like that, stayed out of communication for years, married that little skank from the Bavarian cliff. Her name is Emily, and she's my wife. I'd request you not call her that. Ethan growled. Ha! Huh. Artemis laughed. As if some fisherwoman would ever become the lady of our elevated name. Admit it, Ethan, you have made many mistakes, but this is the end of it. I will not allow anyone to muddy the Ainsworth name to suit their foolish fantasies, not even my heir. The man's eyes shone crimson red. I thought yourself capable of listening to proper advice, but it seems that won't be. I will have to show you the error of your ways, no matter if you want to accept the truth or not. Almost instantly, something large and powerful gripped Ethan in behind, as two crimson eyes glowed in the darkness behind him said creature's powerful claws gripping his shoulders, squeezing them to the point of hurting. Caesar. Ethan almost whimpered, as Caesar his father's haunter, began to slowly manipulate the ambient ghostly energies that Ethan's body had soaked over the entire time he had lived at the mansion, making the young man whimper in agony. Father, tell him to stop. He will stop when you realize that I am the head of the Ainsworth name and that you are duty-bound to follow my orders. The man barked. Caesar, bring him in. But Ethan had other ideas like managing to push his elbow into one of the apricorn devices he had managed to acquire from a craftsmith in the canyon, in which Pokemon could be stored for short intervals of time so that they could rest when injured. Sadly, the devices were quite fragile, despite being handy. So it was no surprise that the apricorn ball fell from his robes to the ground, shattering into several pieces, as a dense cloud of dust and venomous gases shot out of them, condensing furiously into the form of a haunter. Sylvie, Ethan yelled letting out another whimper as Caesar's grip tightened, drawing blood. Defend me. The alpha haunter, let out a cackle, as her ominous eyes stared at Caesar, as the female ghost stared at her father after so many moons, before pushing herself with a gust of otherworldly energy, enough to push Caesar away from Ethan, slamming him through the walls, passing through them as if they were simply nothing, much to Artemis's apprehension. Sylvie. The man muttered, the one born from Caesar's fumes, wasn't it? That ghastly joined you on your foolish endeavor. How, serendipitous. And she has grown out of her father's dominion. Ethan returned, as he spotted Sylvie grabbing Caesar against the floor, trying to suffocate him through miasma, a technique the Ainsworths were famous for. Ethan had only developed and refined the technique further to make it much more lethal and devastating. As have I. The little dog has finally learned to growl, I see. No. You are simply hearing it for the first time. Artemis stood in his place. I suppose I am. His fists clenched. I will, however, not accept any lowborn as part of my family. If you wish to continue with your woman and your foolish endeavors, then you are no longer my kin. Neither that woman nor your future offspring shall ever become an Ainsworth, not until I am alive. Ethan however, was no longer listening, as he pulled out two more apricorn balls out of his robes the very same ones in which he had captured two ghastly he had found loitering inside his old room, wanting to take them with him in his journey. In that case, I declare that I captured two ghastly from the mansion, Lord Ainsworth. He replied formally, raising the apricorn balls, not noticing the surprised glance his father gave him. I need no further aid from my ancestry. I assure you, you will never hear from me, ever again. He turned towards Sylvie. Come on, Sylvie. The haunter in question, reformed back into her corporeal self, before positioning herself behind his shoulder. Without another word, Ethan and Sylvie walked down the steps of the mansion, much unaware of the look of complete shock in Artemis's eyes. Eth. Artemis croaked. Did my son just desert me, Caesar? Caesar just stared at the duo walking away from the Ainsworth mansion, his crimson eyes glowing ominously. Well, he will return. They all do, 
freedom isn't in the fate of the Ainsworth family. He is will return one day and fulfill his duty. Minus zero. As Sylvie, the alpha shiny haunter, traveled the tumultuous sea with her trainer, she couldn't comprehend the words of the family head. But as the years passed, her trainer matured in a way that felt almost unnatural, as though destiny had marked him for a return to a place that once made him feel like a caged bird. And so it was that he fulfilled his fate, sealing away an unspeakable evil with his very life. Sylvie, unfortunately enslaved by buried alive, knew deep in her bones that it was fate for her trainer to perish, fate for her to be enslaved, and fate for her to take the lives of other Pokémons. Many claimed that fate could be changed, but Sylvie snorted at such a notion. In her eyes, fate was an absolute fact, unchanging and unwavering. She closed her eyes, unwilling to bear witness to yet another life lost at her spectral hands. For such was the cruel nature of fate, a force beyond the control of any mortal being, even a ghostly haunter. Omake paragraph. By all rights, male Nidoran should be more common than their female counterparts in the wild. They have a sharper hide, a more potent venom, and a longhorn, all of which makes them much more able to defend themselves. But a male Nidoran's horn is a double-edged one, as it is for this horn's special properties that they have been hunted to rarity, if thankfully not a place next to Bulbasaur, Lapras, and Farfetch'd on the endangered Pokémon list. When ground up, the horn produces a nearly tasteless poison that can knock a grown man out instantly. This poison is typically used by kidnappers and date rapists, and a lucrative black market exists in the Nidor and horn trade. Although some are harvested by scientists for legitimate uses, such as Rapidash tranquilizers, the vast majority are traded in the black market. Some have advocated a program of tagging Nidoran to effectively snuff out this trade, but their pleas have been rejected on the grounds of expense. Instead, the police content themselves with occasional raids and monitoring of habitat which have proven ineffective at stopping the poaching of Nidoran horns. Chapter number 205 How to Defeat a Monster POV Change The top of Lavender Tower was a desolate place, with gusts of chilly wind whistling through the cracks in the stonework. The grey sky overhead hung low, casting a gloomy pallor over everything. The air was filled with the sound of flapping wings, as a haunter materialized before Caesar and Pikachu. Haunter's melancholic expression belied the wickedness in his heart, as he unleashed a massive, claw-like wave of dark energy towards Caesar and Pikachu, who didn't show an ounce of fear. As Haunter's attack bore down on them, a fero appeared as if from thin air. Its talons glowed with a bright white light as it slashed through the air creating a black portal outlined in white. Firo then plunged its talon into the portal, before unleashing the same attack back at Haunter's shadow claw. The two dark type energies collided, struggling against each other with titanic force. Haunter was surprised by Firo's sudden appearance, but then noticed a residual trace of dark type on Firo's feathers. It dawned on Haunter that these Pokémon were using that crystal to hide. Despite her vicious nature, Haunter couldn't help but smile. Perhaps these Pokémon had a chance to survive. Pikachu gave a thumbs up to Firo, who snorted dismissively and turned his head. I don't need your acknowledgement, he seemed to say. Pikachu rolled his eyes before patting Caesar's head. It's time, he said. Caesar clamped his claws before sinking into the shadows, in hot pursuit of their foe. Pikachu closed his eyes, channeling dark-type energy in his mind with a nasty plot. Firo shot towards Haunter with aerial wing but was intercepted midway by a white hand. Firo's eyes flashed with anger before remembering a move his trainer had him working on. The white hand karate chopped at Firo's wings, but Firo suddenly turned his aerial wing into a drill run. Spinning mid-flight, Firo dodged the white hand's chop and used the momentum provided by both aerial ace and drill run to land an extremely powerful steel wing onto the white hand. Firo's steel wing slashed through the lumps of flesh held together by ghostly energy. Firo held through the pain as he outstretched his wings and flew up. The white hand was reduced to a pile of lumping pieces of flesh, meat and bones held together by strings of ghostly energy. Firo smirked as he saw the white hand turn towards him. The white hand moved forward, but its path towards Firo was immediately halted as a line of dark clouds moved through it. Pika! Pikachu shouted as the line of black clouds erupted in a thunderous roar of electricity, disintegrating the white hand out of oblivion. One down, one to go, he thought as he turned toward Haunter fighting against Caesar. Haunter's life orb glowed as his claws glowed with ice-type energy. A layer of ice covered Caesar's claws, but Haunter could see that Caesar wasn't afraid. Suddenly, Caesar's body glowed with an esoteric aura before he teleported away. Left in Caesar's place was Mana, whose attire consisted of a pink fur pelt and a glowing orb of psychic energy. 
Using ally switch, Muna and Caesar swapped places, as Muna's eyes glowed yellow. Psychic hypnotic waves shot out of them, putting the shiny alpha haunter in a trance. Sleep, Muna's voice whispered, as haunter's eyes rolled back in his head. Caesar looked annoyed at Pikachu who was using his tiny claws to break the layer of ice. Thud. Swinging his metal claw at the floor, Caesar broke the layer of ice as he looked at Pikachu as said. This is how you do it. Pikachu pouted and looked away. I was just trying to help. Firo rolled his eyes as he looked at Muna and Haunter before thinking. This plan better work or I just left that weak human of mine to that pathetic Pidgeot for nothing. Muna's eyes glowed red. The sleeping shiny Alpha Haunter then also glowed red as a stream of red energy connected the two. Firo, Pikachu and Caesar took a step forward as they knew that the plan had worked perfectly. Nothing could ruin this moment. Suddenly, Lavender Tower was filled with a deafening boom as a crimson aura blasted through the middle of the tower, shaking the entire structure. The Pokémon stood their ground, protecting Muna as she used Dream Eater on Haunter. Caesar, Pikachu and Pidgeot all looked on in awe as the swirls of aura covered the entire Lavender Tower. But then, Firo's eyes widened, and he used Aerial Ace to fly off suddenly, leaving Pikachu and the others confused. Why did he suddenly fly off? Pikachu wondered aloud. Firo dive-bombed down Lavender Tower as he recognized that Crimson Aura. When he was injured by Charmeleon's previous trainer he sensed a spike of aura from his trainer. Just before he found out about Raticate's death, he remembered again feeling that spike in the aura. This Crimson Aura was the same as that of his trainer's. Firo's heart sped up as he anxiously thought his trainer might be in danger. STTSH Firo used Drill Run to break through Lavender Tower windows as he entered the floor Austin was on. What he saw truly shocked him to his core. Haunter's Dreamland The mist clung to the small tawny hills like a soft, ethereal blanket, obscuring the surroundings with an eerie ambience. Muna, her eyes swirling with blues and purples, rose to her feet, but to her astonishment, she found herself in a human body. Her jaw hung open as she surveyed her new form, feeling small and insignificant in this vast and surreal world. A soft beam of light pierced through the canopy of leaves, illuminating the lush surroundings with a subtle radiance. The air was thick with the sweet aroma of honey and rain, and Muna's transparent hands gleamed in the light. She surveyed her surroundings, taking in the overwhelming array of colors and glows that permeated this fantastical realm. As she walked through fields of crunching grass, the low bellow of a whale filled the air, causing Muna to jump in surprise. To her amazement, the massive creature swam joyfully through the air, as if it were swimming in water. A group of whales joined in, delighting in large bubbles that flowed through the air. Muna quickened her pace, traversing fields of grass with dew forming on the tips that glittered against the sunlight that cut through the cloud cover. Her fingers brushed against the cool bark of a willow tree as she passed, and she walked through a small flower field where tiny butterfree emerged from their sleep. The cobalt butterfly caught her eye, and she reached out her hand, causing the delicate creature to settle gently on her finger. Beautiful, she breathed in astonishment, marveling at its dazzling colors. It is, isn't it? A voice spoke out, causing Muna to jump in surprise once again. The butterfly flapped its wings in alarm, taking flight towards the clouds. Muna turned towards the source of the voice, her eyes widening in surprise. A tall, blonde man stood before her, clad in a lime green hoodie and black jeans, with a smile charm on his belt and gloved hands. His green eyes bore into hers, and he wore a calm smile on his face. Hello, he grinned. To think the move Dream Eater could be used in such a creative way. Amazing. Muna took a step back, inspecting the stranger with a mix of curiosity and wariness. Haunter. She asked, recognizing the name from her dreams. Like my form? This is what my trainer used to look like, Haunter replied with a smirk. He is handsome, Muna responded, to which Haunter chuckled. I'm sure he would have loved to hear such words. Muna turned away from him taking in the breathtaking view of clouds and mist that lay across the land. She could see a group of warlords from here, their happy bellows shaking the air. The two stood on a hill, the bench accompanied by two power lines. Tiny birds perched themselves on the wires, singing their songs to one another. The world of dreams is a beautiful one, Haunter said, but his small smile disappeared as a replica of Lavender Tower formed in front of them. I know what you are here for, Haunter continued, his tone serious. If you had asked me when I was not under that thing's spell if it could even be defeated, I would have laughed. But now, after spending decades under its command, I have found a way. 
Let me show you how you can defeat this monster once and for all. Omega Paragraph The vast majority of winged Pokémon use them to traverse the air. A few bugs, such as Beedrill and Venomoth, have wings that are primarily used in other attacks such as Poison Powder, and fly low through the forests despite lacking the flying type. A cleffable swings are commonly believed to be purely for decoration, having no obvious use, but this is not the case. In the reduced gravity of the moon and the upper atmosphere, cleffable flies around on the back of their tiny wings, it is simply that Earth's gravity is too strong to allow them to fly. However, they remain awkward Pokémon on land and continue to seek a way back to the stars. To this end, the cleffable invited Zubat to share their caves beneath Mount Moon, in the hopes of evolving them and using them as mounts. Unfortunately for the Clefable, few Zubat evolved within such cramped living conditions, and those who did led the Zubat to turn against their hosts. In a ferocious war mostly unseen by man, the Zubat killed all the Clefable and most of the Clefairy and seized the caves for themselves. It is said that some caves have remained the property of the Clefable, their entrance barred to humans and Zubat alike, and that only on the night of the full moon do the Clefairy and Clefable emerge to pray for a spaceship to return them home. Chapter Number 206 Theta Nigram POV change. Firo's heart sped up as he anxiously thought his trainer might be in danger. STTSH. Firo used a drill run to break through lavender tower windows as he entered the floor Austin was on. What did he see truly shocked him to his core. A few minutes earlier. Buried Alive's hands clenched harder under the shocked eyes of Murawak, Butterfree, and Austin. The poke ball exploded. No. Austin shouted as something snapped within his head. Boom. Buried Alive's rotting body was flung and waves of aura escaped from Austin's body. Murawak used her bone to prevent herself from being flung back unlike poor Butterfree who crashed into the walls. Free, Butterfree grunted as he saw his trainer run forward and crash his fist into Buried Alive's face. Buried Alive turned to Austin who was blinded by anger. Butterfree sensed a ghostly aura gather in Buried Alive's hands as he used to open one of Austin's poke balls before crying out. Free. Bulbasaur appeared beside Austin as he immediately launched an energy ball toward Buried Alive's hands under Butterfree's shout. SSSS. Bulbasaur's energy ball clashed with Buried Alive's ghostly energy. Using this split-second opportunity, Murawak's bone is outstretched as a blue aura forms into bone constructs. Murawak then used fling as dark-type energy wrapped around her bone rush. Murawak gazed upon Buried Alive with hatred as she flung the bone rush at his head. Whoosh. Murawak's bone shattered Buried Alive's jaw. Austin used this opportunity to throw an overhand punch as he twisted his hips while performing a semicircular and vertical punch thrown directly at Buried Alive's face. Buried Alive was disoriented as he crashed into the ground. His face turned to see Murawak charging at him with a skull bash. Fuck. Buried Alive couldn't help but curse as Murawak's attack made Butch's rotting corpse into a paste smothered on the wall. Murawak. Murawak screamed up as the last attack was of a mother for her lost son. Austin couldn't even feel sympathy for Buried Alive as he was too disgusted and furious about its actions. Firo broke through the windows as it looked shocked at the scene before rushing to his trainer. Austin smiled as he saw the look of worry in Firo's eyes. It's not over yet. Hearing the telepathic command of Muna, Austin's gaze hardened before one of the Pokémon on his belt was suddenly enveloped by a greenish aura before it was replaced by the dark crystal device. Austin received a lot of information from Muna telepathically as he looked at Firo. Think you can give us a ride? Firo. Firo caught and puffed out his chest. Who else is going to give you a ride? Austin climbed into Firo as he returned to Butterfree and Bulbasaur. Get me to the bottom of the Lavender Tower. Fia. Murawak gazed upon Austin as he left Firo's back. She knew that it was partially his fault that her precious son was gone but she couldn't blame him. He didn't know that her son would die at that thing's hands. He even tried to save them. Murawak closed her eyes as she sent a prayer to Arceus to keep the human safe. The destroyed shards of Cubone's Pokémon scattered around the floor suddenly shattered into pieces of sparkling dust. Miss Murawak, I know it's not the time to ask you this but can you help us? Lavender Tower, Sealed Room The severed white hand was covered in a ghostly aura as intricate runic symbols carved into the hand glowed in a purplish light. The surrounding talismans began to be enveloped by another wordly flame. Boom. The door to the sealed room was suddenly blasted open as a spinning Wordertle made his entrance with a dab. Wordertle shot a water gun onto the otherworldly flame but the water didn't have any kind of effect on it. A pink paw outstretched from the blasted hole in the door as Clefairy used gravity to separate the otherworldly flames from the talismans. 
Werderdle gave Clefairy a thumbs up which he returned with a double thumbs up. Austin crawled along Bulbasaur and paused while looking at the severed white hand holding onto the ancient pokeball and the distorted statues of the three evils. Creepy. Austin gulped before taking a few breaths while moving forward. Clefairy, Werderdle, and Bulbasaur stood guard over Austin who pulled out a knife to prick his finger causing blood to flow out. Buried alive Sora spiked as he sensed what Austin was doing. Austin meanwhile drew the symbol Theta Nigrum onto the severed hand while thinking. I am going to wash this hand a hundred times after this. Suddenly Austin's Theta Nigrum glowed with a crimson aura that seemed to cause the other intricate runic symbols on the carved hand to dim before the glow completely vanished. Screech. Buried alive scream bellowed out from the surroundings as Firo who used pursuit to hide in Austin's shadow shot out using an aerial wing. Firo's wing slashed through the severed hand's wrist before ghostly energy swirled into reality. Buried Alive's face manifested into reality scaring the ever-living shit out of Austin and his Pokemon. R-E-T-U-R-N-I-T, -E -E return it. Buried Alive bellowed out in his distorted voice as Austin used every last bit of courage to catch the falling severed hand. Muna, when is the talisman coming? It's on its way. Hurry up. Austin thought as he scrambled to run away from the astral head of Buried Alive. Clefairy, Bulbasaur, Werderdal, and Firo launched their strongest attacks at Buried Alive whose eyes glowed in response before waves of ghostly energy enveloped everything around them. Their attacks faded away like mist as Bulbasaur, Werderdal, Clefairy, and Firo were knocked to the floor. They tried to stand and defend their trainer but Buried Alive's aura was too much. Clefairy looked at Buried Alive approaching closer and closer to his trainer who tried to run and hide using the dark crystal device but they were in its domain, there was no place to hide. Omake Paragraph at the moment there are indeed no wild Nido King. This is not to say that they never appear in the wild, it is simply that the average lifespan of a wild Nido King is about one year before they are killed in battle. It is a good thing for all of us that they are. Nido King is a great pillager, a great barbarian, a desperate and successful gasp of wild Pokemon pushing back against the march of human civilization. When a stone falls from the moon to the earth and a wild Nido Reno finds it, they walk through the tall grass at night attracting followers by the simple fact of their existence. After evolving from Nidorino, Nidoking becomes kings in the old sense of the term not solely by birth, but also by valor, winning their subjects' esteem so they can lead them into war, and growing their army with every victory. When a human stumbles upon it and escapes alive, or when one has gathered a sufficient Pokémon force, they lead armies to descend on nearby towns. When they reach one, Nidoking personally crushes buildings by using earthquake and commands their troops to kill every human they find. Some of these attacks have entered the history books, typically as among the direst challenge a city or nation has faced, the kind which makes men pledge loyalty to their old enemies in a desperate hope for survival. Others only enter the archaeological record, provided the Pokémon have grown peaceful enough with the time that the archaeologists can find it. Not all wilderness has always been that way. Chapter number 207 Experiencing Hell POV Change Werderdal, Bulbasaur, Firo, and Clefairy tried to stand and defend their trainer but buried alive's aura was too much. Clefairy looked at Buried Alive approaching closer and closer to his trainer who tried to run and hide using the dark crystal device but they were in its domain, there was no place to hide. Buried Alive was a few feet away from Austin who suddenly smirked before he raised his hand revealing a poke ball. Dragon Pulse Austin said as the poke ball opened in a flash revealing Charm Leon who had a look of absolute fury while glancing at the condition of his trainer. Charm Leon opened his maw as a giant wave of draconic energy clashed against Buried Alive's ghostly energy. Clefairy gritted his teeth as he closed his eyes. Muna, send it to me. G, T, it. Clefairy found that one of the talismans beside his hand was replaced with the moonstone. Placing his hand on the moonstone, Clefairy willingly chose to absorb the energy sealed within the crystal. As Charmeleon's dragon pulse clashed with buried alive's ghostly energy a light broke out through the darkness as Clefairy's body was engulfed in a bright light. The dark room lit up as a tall, pink Pokemon with a vaguely star-shaped body. It had long, pointed ears with dark brown tips and black, oval eyes with wrinkles on either side. A curled lock of fur hangs over its forehead, much like its long, tightly curled tail. On its back is a pair of dark pink wings, each wing has three points. Its hands had three fingers each, and its feet have two clawed toes and dark pink soles. Clefable. Clefable cried out as she outstretched her hand. The surrounding ghostly energy was instantly suppressed by Clefable's gravity. Buried Alive cried out in anger as the ghostly energy began to become more volatile. Austin suddenly felt one of his pokeballs disappear as it was replaced with a weird talisman. Attach it to the pokeball. 
Muna's mental shout snapped out Austin of his days as he ignored the putrid smell of blood on the weird black talismans. It felt as if he was touching a fur pelt. Ignoring his weird thoughts, Austin attached the black talisman to the ancient poke ball held by the severed hand. The black talisman began to flow with a beautiful azure aura as the surrounding ghostly energy began to die down. No, no. Buried alive roared in pain as he could feel his entire body burning up. What is happening? Buried alive looked around as his ghostly energy was dissipating, fast. What did you do? Buried alive lunged forward toward Austin but Clefable Smoon's blast diverted his path toward the wall. Boom. Buried alive roared out as his entire ghostly face lit up in flames of darkness as if the abyss was absorbing him. Buried alive outstretched his hand towards Austin. You caused this, you bastard. Buried alive clenched his hand as his entire soul was engulfed by the flames of darkness. If I go down, I am taking you with me. The runes on the severed hand glowed as Austin threw the thing away. Charm Leon launched a flame burst at the severed hand but to Austin it was different. The severed hand shattered like glass before tendrils of energy shot out engulfing him. Kakik, if you think you can escape from me this easily then think again, boy. Arg, spare me those villain dialogues. He he he, let's see if you can joke after experiencing hell. The surrounding abyss began to shatter like glass as ghostly hands outstretched out in the void. The shattered pieces of reality instead of falling into the void, the shards hung in midair. As if moved by an invisible hand, the pieces began stacking one on top of the other into columns. The pieces lined up perfectly when stacked in the correct order. The two towers began to lean and met in the middle, forming a huge stone archway. The rocks glowed and pulsed and the cracks between them shrunk until they became a single section of unbroken stone. The sound of rock grinding against rock filled the air. This time it was the ground shaking. Austin couldn't help but feel his legs give out as he saw it. Something beyond his comprehension. Buried alive appeared in the form of Kunihiko Yuyama but half of his face was covered in eyeballs. Words couldn't come out of Austin's mouth as he was in shock. How come something like that even exists? Buried alive said, Valo always wanted to understand God but unlike that loser, I was able to understand God to such a degree that I became one. Insanity exuded from Buried Alive's voice that seemed to change every few seconds from young to old, from man to woman. Why don't you join me? Buried Alive smiled as his eyeballs began to flow out and attached themselves to the void around them. Austin tried to run away but what could he do against something like that? The eyeballs opened up causing tendrils in the shape of the hand to outstretch as they held Austin's within their grip. The abyss seeped out from those eyeballs as the body was covered in a veil of darkness with one Austin remaining as he was held by the eldritch hands of the abyss. <laughs> Austin screamed out as energy seeped into his mind. Austin was beginning to break as Buried Alive showed his mortal mind the true form of the banished god of the distortion realm. Buried Alive smiled as he heard the sweat symphony of Austin's screams. <laughs> how does it feel to know it, to look at the true form of the ruler of the abyss? Tell me how you feel looking at the true form of god. Oh make paragraph. It was said that touching a nine tails tail will bring about a curse that lasts a thousand years. The fans of the Cherry Grove Electabuzz are elated to learn that this one only lasted 86. Cherry Grove dominated the baseball world around the turn of the last century, winning championship after championship until a game with the now dominant Goldenrod Giants, then called the Nine Tails. The Electabuzz won the last game of the championship series by a single run in a game that saw beanball wars and bench clearing brawls. The Electabuzz was playing in Goldenrod and the players were more than willing to rub their success in the home team's faces, a championship celebration turned into a riot in which even the mascots, live Pokemon back then, got involved. It ended with an Electabuzz grabbing a nine tails and sending a powerful electric shock through its tail, sending it to the emergency wing of the Pokemon Center. It would have its revenge. The owner of the Electabuzz soon ran into financial trouble and was forced to sell off the team's stars. They would rebound in time at one point losing the Johto Championship in the finals every three years, almost always in the last possible game. The fans of Cherry Grove became known far and wide for their loyalty, following their team through heartbreaking loss after a heartbreaking loss, going so far as to hire a string of exorcists to no avail. The Nine Tails fans were willing to taunt their fallen rivals, but in time became so horrified by their foe's bad luck that they changed the team's name. And then last year on a walk-off home run the Electabuzz somehow topped the baseball world once again. Compared to most Nine Tails victims, the fans of Cherry Grove got off incredibly easily. Chapter Number 208 Funeral 
buried alive's twisted grin stretched across his face as he basked in the sweet melody of Austin's screams. The piercing screams echoed through the void, filling it with a chilling atmosphere. How does it feel to know it, to look at the true form of the ruler of the abyss? Tell me how you feel looking at the true form of God. Buried Alive's voice boomed through the empty space, his words filled with malice and glee. Austin's mind was being torn apart, his screams now a deafening silence as he struggled to comprehend the sight before him. Was that hideous monstrosity really a god? It was beyond any comprehension, and Austin felt his mind shattering into a million pieces. Buried Alive's grin slowly faded as he watched Austin's life force dwindle. This is the consequence of your actions, boy, he murmured, his voice barely audible amidst the silence. But then, something unexpected happened. A beam of aura rose out from Austin's chest, the lunar wing emerging from within him. Its powerful aura transformed the void into a paradise of beauty, with gaseous clouds of purple, pink, blue and yellow spreading throughout. The symphony of dreams began to play, and buried alive could feel the power of the lunar wing overwhelming him. He tried to resist, but what could a mere mortal do against a fragment of the Queen of Dreams, Cresselia? Buried Alive's surroundings began to warp and twist as the Lunar Wing's aura engulfed him, tearing his very being from reality itself. Austin's eyes fluttered open for a moment, and he saw the beautiful aura of the Lunar Wing surrounding him. He was amazed by the serene beauty of the clouds and the symphony of dreams playing in the background. Where am I? He whispered, his voice barely audible. The warm embrace of the Lunar Wing enveloped him, and he felt a sense of comfort and safety that he had never experienced before. He closed his eyes allowing himself to succumb to the blissful sleep that had taken hold of him. As Austin drifted into slumber, buried alive screams echoed in the distance, his cries of anguish and terror now muffled by the void. The symphony of dreams continued to play, its hypnotic melody guiding Austin towards a peaceful sleep. Lavender Tower Austin suddenly opened his eyes as he found himself laying flat on the cold hard floor. There was a putrid smell all around him. His body was burning up. Austin tried to get up but sudden sharp pain caused him to stop. Slowly Austin crawled to a tombstone and pushed himself up into a sitting position. Breath in. Breath out. Austin looked at the lunar wing which seemed to have lost its luster. Austin closed his eyes as he didn't want to think about that experience. Even though the memory was gone, he still had a vague feeling about what happened to him and he didn't want to remember that morbid moment. Austin's hand brushed against something causing him to open his eyes as he found a white box. Curiously, Austin picked it up. The cover opened revealing a row of cigarettes. Maybe it had fallen from the pocket of one of the members of Team Rocket. Austin thought as accidentally one of the cigarettes fell to the ground lit up. Austin said, what the? As he picked up the lit cigarette. How did it get lit on its own? Austin wondered before looking at the white box that had a blue coil-shaped structure on its bottom. Austin shook his head before placing the box down. Grady and Brady walked into the room as they wanted to give Agatha a few moments to herself. The curse of the Ainsworth family was gone? That evil being was finally gone without their friend sacrificing her life for that cause. Brady and Grady suddenly stopped as they gazed upon the lavender tower floor, shattered tombstones, and rotting corpses of men and Pokemon littered the entire floor. Between all of this Austin was seen by the twin sisters laying against a tombstone with a cigarette in his mouth. Austin spat out the cigarette before being reduced to a fit of coughs. Brady and Grady's sweat dropped at the boy's actions who picked up the cigarette again. It was as if he was using the cigarette and the horrid taste of nicotine to make himself forget even if for a few seconds of the hell he was in and the hell he had experienced. Austin's gaze meanwhile was fixed in a particular direction. Brady and Grady walked towards the dazed Austin before smacking the cigarette out of his mouth. You're too young to do that. Austin raised his eyebrow before rolling his eyes which caused Brady and Grady to glare at him. Yet, yet, yet. Austin looked at the elderly twins before asking, did you get the help? Brady and Grady winced at Austin's tone before Brady nodded causing Austin to sigh. Seems like they missed the party. Austin's words caused the elderly twins to be pierced with guilt as they looked at his condition. His hand seemed to be broken, they could see dried up blood sticking to most of his clothes. Small wounds littered his body. Brady and Grady looked down in shame for putting someone so young in such peril. Austin sighed before asking, where are my Pokemon? Grady and Brady replied at the same time, they are scouring through Lavender Town looking for any kind of medicine which we guess is for you. You see Zor broke into a few houses. Do I have to pay for any of the things they destroyed? 
we don't think so. Great, Austin said as he picked up his cigarette which caused Brady and Grady to scowl. Wordertle, Pidgeot, Butterfree, Ninjask, and Krabby were looking at Clefable with sparks in their eyes. Clefable silently chuckled in awkwardness from the attention he was getting. Firo peeked at Clefable before turning his head away. Why didn't I get such a welcome when I evolved? Oh, who cares, I need their attention. Pikachu, Bulbasaur, and Charm Leon were looking at their sleeping trainer with worry in their eyes. Arh Austin grunted before opening his eyes. Just where am I? This thought was answered by Pikachu, Charm Leon, and Bulbasaur tackling him in a group hug. Pika, Pika, Pi. Bulba, Bulbasaur. Char, Char, Char. Austin chuckled but there was a hint of disappointment lacing his tone. Guys, I am fine but can you get off me? Pikachu and the others sheepishly laughed before getting off as Austin gazed upon the lunar wing which had lost its previous shimmer. To think I would gaze upon Giratina's true form. Did that mean that the other legendaries also had true forms? Austin ignored his thoughts as he rubbed the lunar wing. I have to thank Cynthia for giving me this. If not then I would have become a brain-dead vegetable. Austin shuddered at the thought as he heard Firo's caw before looking up as all of his Pokémon were charging at him. Guys, guys, guys. While Austin was being dogpiled by his Pokémon, his Pokédex beeped as Professor Oak called him. The ghostly aura around Lavender Town was slowly dissipating as a Mega Gengar tore apart buried alive sealed room. Agatha's staff went through the skull of a statue. At least I can rest easy knowing that monster was gone. Austin walked out of the room with Pikachu on his shoulder he took a deep breath when Murawak appeared in front of him. Murawak had a melancholic look in her eyes as she handed over a beautiful flower that looked like a cross between a chrysanthemum and a spider lily flower to him. Austin remembered what the teleporter girl had told him when giving him the same flower. I am sorry for your loss. It's no problem but why are giving me this flower? These flowers are known as the flowers of death and rebirth. It's a tradition in Kanto to give mourners this flower. There is an old saying behind these flowers, in life, death, and rebirth I will be at peace so don't cry over my departure. Austin felt tears building up in his eyes as he took out a poke ball and opened it, revealing a teary cue bone that ran up to his mother to hug her. It looked like Buried Alive's actions were just an illusion since Cubone's poke ball had been transported to Oak's lab. Murawak meanwhile was left in shock as she felt her precious son's hug. Murawak tried to stay strong but tears began to flow out of her eyes as she hugged her son back. Pikachu jumped down from his trainer's shoulders while looking at the mother and son duo crying while hugging each other as a thought filled his head. When I left, did mom and sis cry? Pikachu's eyes closed at this somber thought. As Austin and his team gathered to lay Raticate to rest. Murawak, with its bone club in hand, was busy digging a hole for the casket. The sound of the dirt being displaced by the club echoed through the quiet countryside. Each member of the team stood somberly around the grave, their attire reflecting the seriousness of the occasion. Austin wore a black suit, his red eyes puffy from crying. Pikachu stood next to him, tears rolling down its cheeks, its fur slightly ruffled from the breeze. As the casket was lowered into the ground, the sound of the ropes creaking and groaning filled the air. Everyone held onto the casket as they slowly lowered it into the earth. The sound of dirt hitting the casket echoed through the clearing as each member of the team took turns scooping dirt with their bare hands and pouring it over the casket. The last person to pour dirt was Austin himself, trying to hold back the tears as he placed the final handful of earth on the casket. His strong front crumbled as he fell to his knees, tears streaming down his face. Each teardrop hit the casket with a small pattering sound. Pikachu, trying to offer comfort, patted Austin's leg with a gentle paw. The sound of its small claws clicking on the ground broke the silence. The rest of the team stood back, holding back their tears. Each one remembered Raticate in their own way. To some, she was a mere acquaintance. To others, she was a friend. To Austin, she was a sister, a partner, and a loyal companion who had sacrificed her life to save her family. Austin patted the grave, his shaking hand holding a lit cigarette. The sound of his breath, labored and ragged, was mixed with the sound of the fire. He gazed at the tombstone with red-rimmed eyes, the letters etched into the stone reflecting the fading light. Here lies Raticate, he said, his voice choked with emotion. A friend, a sister, a partner. Died to save her family. You will be missed. Oh make paragraph. The inside of a jiggly puff like that of a red giant star, is filled with helium. 
it is unknown how a Pokemon came to have this unusual composition most are made of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen but their ability to evolve with a moonstone suggests an extraterrestrial origin. Although they are capable of walking on land, it is also common to see a Jigglypuff drifting aimlessly through the skies. It is this property that inspired the invention of the balloon. The first balloons were not made of rubber but were Jigglypuff with strings tied to them, which would float 30 feet in the air for observation and the amusement of children. The Jigglypuff were often unpleased with being used in this manner, and after one too many incidents of marker to the face, balloons made of non-living materials became popular instead. This usage of Jigglypuff is still recalled in their ability to inflate and carry a rider for short periods. Occasionally they are controlled by a small fire-type Pokemon held below it by the trainer in a way similar to a hot air balloon. They are not used for intercity flights, as they move slowly and cannot stay aloft for longer than a couple of hours. Nonetheless, when escaping from a mountain or a tall building, Jigglypuff is extremely valuable to trainers who do not have any large flying-type Pokemon on their team. Chapter Number 209 Lucian vs Cynthia Here Thom City, Sinnoh The entire arena seemed flooded with flashlights all around. The grand arena boasted of a Bermuda grass pitch, covering an area of 2,000 square feet, with a gallery holding a housing capacity of 2,000, and by the looks of it, the place was overwhelmed with spectators, who had, despite not getting seats, chosen to stand against the archways if only to get a chance to spectate the grand event that was to be this oncoming match. The final and last attempt at beating the current Sinnoh champion off her champion status. All right, battle fans. It's the time. The MC yelled over the megaphone, his voice almost hoarse with the constant commentary over the last few days. The battle we have all been waiting for is finally here. On the red end, we have the defending champion Cynthia, who shall be defending her status as Sinnoh champion. Will she be able to maintain her hold? Or will Lucian, Psychic Master, and Elite Four, claim the throne for himself. Cynthia stood in her impeccable black robes, staring calmly at the figure of Lucian, the new winner amongst the Elite Four, and the competing trainers over the series of events that had happened over the last months, and finally was in, to challenge the champion herself. Should Lucian be able to defeat her, her champion status would be provoked, and she would remain as an elite level trainer. However, if she managed to defend it against Lucian and his team of psychics, her position as champion would be solidified for a year and more importantly, the Elite Four and the Ace Squad would rightfully accept her as their new leader. And between her and that outcome, was a single match. A three-on-three -three battle, between herself and Lucian. And I will shut all mouths, and prove myself. She cast a casual glance at the top tier of the gallery. Even from this distance, she could see several of the Elite from other regions standing beyond the glass wall, staring into the battleground beneath them. She knew for a fact that Lance and Stephen from Kanto, Wallace, the champion of Hone, Lorelei Canto Elite Four, and Diantha, the champion of Kalos were present there, to name a few. All of them were standing there, some with ulterior motives in mind, some for support, and some like Stephen, for pure entertainment. And the challenger, Lucian of the Elite Four, will be choosing first. The MC announced. This will be a three-on-three -three battle, with no carryovers, no substitutions. Lucian, a crimson-haired man, with matching sunglasses, wearing flamboyant robes and a half-arrogant grin on his face, lifted his first ultra ball before holding it up in Cynthia's direction. Bronzong, I choose you. Why am I not surprised? Cynthia mentally drawled. That Bronzong, in question, was Lucian's signature Pokémon, much akin to how Garcomp was for herself. For 90% of his formal battles, Lucian always allowed Bronzong to deal with his opponents. The Steel Slash Psychic type was his sweeper, his frontline assault, a Pokemon powerful enough to deal overwhelming damage to most opponents down the line. It was indeed, a rare occasion, when Bronzong took significant damage, or worse, had fainted mid-battle, only to be substituted with the next in line. If not for his battle against Flint, I'd have thought Bronzong was his most powerful. Are you ready to truly face the wrath of an Elite Four, girl? Lucian taunted. Cynthia rolled her eyes. The Psychic Master had forgotten that to become a champion in the first place, one had to defeat all of the Elite Four, and then the reigning champion. Then again, that was over four months ago, and Lucian would probably have some new aces up his sleeve. She lifted her poke ball. I choose you, Garcomp. With an earth-shattering roar, Garcomp slammed his feet onto the ground, materializing out of the ultra ball he was kept in. And Cynthia has chosen her Garcomp to battle against Lucian and his bronze zone. 
who will win? The MC continued. Bronzong has a dual advantage against your Garkomp. Is this your magnanimity or have you already accepted defeat? Nah, I just decided that even when against the tide, my Pokemon can wipe the floor with yours. Cynthia thought but didn't say. Lucian had been, not that she needed any reminding, one of the most vocal in opposition to her status as champion after she had defeated the previous champion. Ironic, considering that Lucian had been the elite that she had defeated most soundly back during her working through the elite circuit. Let the battle begin. The referee announced from his safe position. After all, only an idiot would prefer to stay in the middle of a battle waged between two monstrosities. And considering that the Pokémon battling were both elite level, monstrosity was one way of defining them. Let the battle begin. The referee announced from his safe position. After all, only an idiot would prefer to stay in the middle of a battle waged between two monstrosities. And considering that the Pokémon battling were both elite level, monstrosity was one way of defining them. Lucian raised his right arm. Flash cannon. Bronzone raised itself upward, before revealing its hollow bottom, which seemed to get saturated with blinding, white light, before propelling the energy out as a concentrated, white area beam toward the dragon. Cynthia's expressions didn't betray her inner thoughts. Fly up and use a flamethrower. Garcomp roared, before leaping off the ground, and sending out torrential flames toward Bronzone. The powerful flash cannon missed its target as it passed underneath towards the periphery. Lucian smirked. Relocate. Bronzone let out a mechanical noise, as a bluish aura outlined the powerful steel-type attack, literally deviating it from its path, incrementing it to unbelievable speeds, as it shot towards the dragon. Meanwhile, Bronzong simply teleported from its location, avoiding the flamethrower attack by a significant distance. Garcomp leaped to his right, and the flash cannon followed, making the dragon leap and fly all around the arena, with the powerful steel-type attack right behind him. Looks like Bronzong has Garcomp dancing to its tune. The MC went on. Cynthia arched an eyebrow. It seemed like this relocation had locked the flash cannon attack on Garcomp. Garcomp. Show Bronzone what super speed is like. And Garcomp vanished. And it looks like Garcomp has somehow teleported. Is that even possible? The MC asked no one in particular. Even the relocated attack had been too overwhelmed and had crashed. Not possible, Lucian muttered under his breath. So then where is it? Almost as if in answer to his question, several illusory versions of Garcomp appeared all around the arena, all of them surrounding Bronzone the scythe-like protrusions on their arms glowing with draconic power. Since the dragon. Lucian commanded. And relocate Confuse Ray. He mentally smirked. Bronzone was notoriously mechanical in their dealings. Just like a supercomputer, they followed every single command to the T and executed it without an error percentage of fewer than three places of decimal. So obviously, Lucian was completely blown out of his mind, when he saw Bronzone form a powerful Confuse Ray attack before dispersing it into twelve separate fragments, firing them successively. Why did you do that? Bronzone fired at the dragon, as Master ordered. Came the mechanical voice in his mind. What the? Checkmate. Omake paragraph. Virtually all ghost Pokémon take on a different appearance from their living form, one sufficiently distinct that few can tell what kind of Pokémon they were in life. Even in those which are known to be connected to a living species, such as Jengar and Clefable, there is no mistaking the living for the dead. This is not the case with Vulpix. A trained Vulpix is a fire-type Pokémon with no ghostly powers or techniques save Will-O-Wisp. This is because these are the only ones weak enough to be caught in the wild and because Vulpix lives longer lives than their trainers in captivity. A flame burns hot inside the body of each living Vulpix which acts as the Pokémon's life force, when it burns out or is doused by water or injury, the Vulpix becomes a ghost. There is no safe way to tell the living Vulpix from the walking dead, one can attempt to determine it through provocation, but this typically results in a fatal curse, if dead, or flamethrower, if living, consequently, estimates of what percentage of Vulpix today are alive vary wildly, from a twentieth to a half of the total Vulpix population. As ghosts, they gain the ability to curse their enemies, summon apparitions, and shapeshift into small children. It is said that if you take in an orphaned child and raise it with compassion and honor, it may turn out to not be a human child, but a ghost Vulpix. If this happens, you will be rewarded with good fortune and long life. Some believe this to be true to this day, but most consider it a tall tale invented by governments and clergy to facilitate the placement of orphaned children with loving families. 
Chapter Number 210 Mega Evolution Bronzong fired at the dragon, as Master ordered. Came the mechanical voice in his mind. What the? Checkmate. Cynthia's. Clear voice was heard from the other side of the battleground, as the apparently illusory forms of Garkomp, none of them even registering the effect of the much weakened Confuse Ray, delivered successive Dragon Claw attacks on Bronzong, who was thrown off from his position, tumbling, bruising his way through the grassy floor. Flamethrower. Cynthia calmly ordered. Gaia. The several illusory forms of the dragon roared, before throwing in a frightening amount of scorching flames from their maw, all of them converging into Bronzong, causing an explosion, proving that all of them were, original flames, and not mere illusions. But. How? Lucian almost stammered. They were illusions. They have to be. If you say so. Cynthia mused as the apparent non-illusions faded revealing a single Garkomp, standing in the middle of the arena, looking downright formidable and menacing. Use Fire Blast! Chomp! The Great Dragon summoned its inner flame to a superlative degree, before throwing a formidable Fire Blast, head on toward the fallen Bronzong, who looked already exhausted. Light Screen! Lucian commanded hurriedly, as Bronzong created a light screen in front of itself, as the wall of fire slammed into it. Just like with a light screen, it reduced the attack power by at least 50%, which in the case of someone like Bronzong, became a little more than 90%. Incinerate. Don't let it get control. And Garkomp did the same. With the efficiency and control that would send any self-respecting fire type into a massive inferiority complex, Garkomp kept on throwing in a continuous shower of never-ending torrential flames, right ahead on the light screen, which served its purpose perfectly. Your flames will not burn my Bronzong. Lucian returned. Cynthia smirked. Of course, Lucian was right. Light screen was a perfect counter to a special attack like Incinerate, and there was a little more than zero chance that it would burn someone as powerful as Bronzone. But that didn't take into account the other part of the equation. Who said anything about burning it? Cynthia asked. And sure it was. Bronzone was safe from the scorching flames, courtesy of the powerful light screen. But as powerful as the psychic defense was, it lacked certain fundamental attributes. Like the attribute of protection against raw, overwhelming heat. Not a good thing for a Pokemon with part psychic typing. A thin smile twisted its way through her lips. Sunny day. An overwhelming sunlight descended into the stadium, increasing the power behind the incinerate attack by another overwhelming 50%, enough to melt its way through the defenses. Enough. Lucian bellowed. Use payback and return with Hyper Beam. It was a testament to Bronzong's incomprehensible innate strength that the Bronze Bell Pokemon was able to use Payback, doubling the remnants of his declining power reserves to form a powerful Hyper Beam, aiming it straight at Garkomp, who was currently using Incinerate on him. The effects of Sunny Day only hastened the process. Use Substitute, and finish it. Cynthia calmly ordered. The Solar Beam came in and smashed into a life-sized illusionary decoy created by Garkomp, created at the cost of his power as the real dragon vanished again, only to appear right behind Bronzong at an incomprehensible speed, before spearing the two blades into the steel type from behind. Solo Meteor Cynthia calmly muttered as Garkomp belched out an orange blob onto Bronzong, covering it with a bright, sticky orange semi-solid, before throwing it high up into the air. What was? Lucian's words remained behind inside his throat, as Bronzong exploded alongside the orange substance, as smaller Draco meteors began to fall to the ground one of them being the form of smoking and completely unconscious and broken Bronzong. Bronzong is unable to battle. The commentator announced. Garkomp wins the battle. The first point to Cynthia. The crowd cheered madly. One down. Two to go. And both Spiritum and Malamar are unable to battle. The commentator roared into the megaphone, his voice now completely strained and hoarse, but no less excited. What a battle, ladies and gentlemen. And now, one more battle left. Should Lucian be able to defeat the reigning champion, then the battles will continue. Should Cynthia manage to overpower Lucian, she would seal her name as the official leader of the Sinnoh Elite Four, an ace squad. So what will it be, ladies and gentlemen? Lucian's conquest, or Cynthia's continuance? I choose you, go Alakazam. And Lucian chooses Alakazam. Will Cynthia's Pokémon be able to battle against Alakazam to score another victory? Cynthia knew what was coming ahead. Lucian's ace in the hole. 
and she knew just what she needed in case that came to pass. She had been rather, conflicted about using it in public, but if push came to shove, she knew she would have no choice but to go ahead with it. She raised her last ultra ball and unleashed her last battler, one she had complete trust in, to overwhelm Lucian's Alakazam. I choose you, Charizard. The creature that appeared in front of her, and stood, facing Alakazam was a ten-foot behemoth, with wings raised on either side, each spanning a length of over eleven feet, literally changing the status quo from being the next battler to the most intimidating presence in the entire arena. With a snort, it belched out crimson flames from its snout and stared at the pitiful excuse of a psychic that had the guts to stand and face its mighty wrath. With an incredible roar, Charizard declared war on Alakazam. I'm not done, yet, Lucian uttered audibly. Allow me, to show you my latest acquisition. He lifted his right hand, upon which stood a ring, with a spheroidal pearl-like substance glinting in the sunlight. A Meganite stone. Cynthia confirmed. Just as I expected. Now that she noticed, even Alakazam had a similar pearl, on one end of the spoon in its right hand. Alakazam, Lucian commanded in a high tone, bright light emanating out of the pearl. Time to exterminate that Charizard. Mega Evolve. And Alakazam roared. Its mustache increased by copious amounts, as its overly large head magnified in size. Its arms and legs atrophied considerably, as it now sat, cross-legged, levitating in the air, with five spoons of pure silver, floating in a half corona above its head. And the audience went mad with hysteria. Hysteria. Oh, my word. It seems that the conspiracy theories were true. The second form of evolution, Mega Evolution, is actually, a possibility. Alakazam has indeed, evolved into a further and higher advanced stage, Mega Alakazam. The commentator yelled himself hoarsely. Above the glass-walled balcony, several of the spectators were watching the entire thing with a varying range of expressions. From interest in Stephen's face to outright scowl and lances, to pleasantly surprised in the case of Diantha. Lorelei, who had yet to see a Mega Evolution in the face, seemed dead curious. What is that idiot thinking? Lance muttered furiously. Demonstrating the power of a mega evolution in such a public event? Does he even want to give away every card we have up our sleeve? Diantha, who was standing just next to him on the right, seemed to be more understanding of Lance's fury. I can understand. This will attract all sorts of negative attention on Mega Knight research. Lucian must have been pushed if he has resorted to this, Stephen muttered. But you are right this will have a greater impact on the state of affairs. Meanwhile, a person sitting far, far away from Hirthome City, far from Sinnoh as a whole, couldn't help but smirk at Stephen's words. My word, you are more right than you know, Deputy Champion. His lips twisted. You are more right than you know. Cynthia observed the Alakazam, now Mega Alakazam, levitating in the air, its psychic aura giving her slight creeps. Now, she wasn't a psychic by any accord, but judging by what she knew about Mega Evolution and Alakazam in general, there was a high possibility that the Mega Evolved Psy was scanning her Charizard, inside out, and the more she allowed Charizard to be in its direct psychic gaze, the more his secrets would be milked out. I need to end this quickly. Charizard, use Dragon Pulse. Charizard lifted his maw, before releasing a powerful burst of spectral energy, which automatically shifted into the shape of a large, spectral dragon before shooting toward Alakazam who didn't seem at all concerned. Rip control, and send it back. Lucian commanded. Kazum. The Psy type muttered as the five silver spoons floating above it shone with eldritch power, forcibly containing the dragon's pulse back into a sphere of compressed energy, before propelling it back to Charizard. Charizard raised his left arm, the claws elongating as draconic energy seeped in, before swatting away the incoming attack to the right. The redirected dragon pulse slammed into the ground, creating a terrific explosion. Take to the skies, Cynthia warned, as Charizard flapped his wings, pushing himself into the air. Use Psycho Cut. Lucian commanded. Instantly, several Psycho Cuts appeared in front of the mega-evolved creature, who sent them towards the Fire-type, said Fire-type easily dodging them, and if not, countering them with Dragon Claw. Not that it mattered to Alakazam, it had all the psychic energy in the universe to harness and use for this battle. Analyze. Precision set. Successive fire. Came the next command. Instantly, a dozen psycho cuts reappeared in front of Alakazam, 
as the C-type instantly calculated the possible flight patterns as demonstrated by Charizard, depending upon its analysis of Charizard's height, weight, body movement, move sets, shape, and length of wingspan, and hundreds of other statistical data that Alok Azam had gathered via its psychic scan on the fire type. In less than a second, all that information was matched with the flight patterns that Charizard had just demonstrated, and the trajectories were created, and set, taking wind movement and probability distribution into account. Set. Fire. All twelve psycho cuts shot into the air, and despite all of Charizard's weaving through the air, several of them slashed into the great behemoth, making him fall to the ground, roaring in pain. And Mega Alakazam makes the first strike. Will this mean the defeat of Charizard? Don't stop, Lucian ordered. Repeat fire. Kazum. Another set of psycho cuts appeared in the air their trajectories now taking into account Charizard's injury and position on the ground, before being projected towards the pseudo-dragon. Incinerate, Cynthia ordered calmly, as the fire-type lifted his maw, to unleash hellish flames towards the Psy-type, directly in the face of the Psycho-cuts, creating an explosion that destroyed nine of them. Two of them moved away, one to the right, and one to the left, spinning like a boomerang, as they attacked Charizard from both angles. Slash them away with Dragon Claw. And then the third and remaining Psycho Cut slammed into Charizard from amidst the smoke, scoring another head-on strike. And Lucian scores another. The commentator roared madly. Mega Alakazam is playing with Charizard. No one plays with my Charizard, Cynthia whispered, as she cast a sideways glance toward the glass balcony. No one. She touched the teardrop ornament on her neck, as she cupped it with her palm, before beginning to whisper, what sounded like chanting. Keystone. Respond to my heart. Beyond evolution. Mega evolve. And the arena was inundated with overwhelming, bright light. Omega paragraph. It was said that touching a nine tails tail will bring about a curse that lasts a thousand years. The fans of the Cherry Grove Electabuzz are elated to learn that this one only lasted 86. Cherry Grove dominated the baseball world around the turn of the last century, winning championship after championship until a game with the now dominant Goldenrod Giants, then called the Nine Tails. The Electabuzz won the last game of the championship series by a single run in a game that saw beanball wars and bench-clearing brawls. The Electabuzz was playing in Goldenrod and the players were more than willing to rub their success in the home team's faces, a championship celebration turned into a riot in which even the mascots, live Pokemon back then, got involved. It ended with an Electabuzz grabbing a nine tails and sending a powerful electric shock through its tail, sending it to the emergency wing of the Pokemon Center. It would have its revenge. The owner of the Electabuzz soon ran into financial trouble and was forced to sell off the team's stars. They would rebound in time, at one point losing the Johto Championship in the finals every three years, almost always in the last possible game. The fans of Cherry Grove became known far and wide for their loyalty, following their team through heartbreaking loss after a heartbreaking loss, going so far as to hire a string of exorcists to no avail. The Nine Tails fans were willing to taunt their fallen rivals, but in time became so horrified by their foe's bad luck that they changed the team's name. And then last year on a walk-off home run the Electabuzz somehow topped the baseball world once again. Compared to most Nine Tails victims, the fans of Cherry Grove got off incredibly easily. Chapter number 211 I am the champion. And Lucian scores another. The commentator roared madly. Mega Alakazam is playing with Charizard. No one plays with my use Cynthia whispered as she cast a sideways glance towards the glass balcony. No one. She touched the teardrop ornament on her neck, as she cupped it with her palm, before beginning to whisper, what sounded like chanting. Keystone, respond to my heart. Beyond evolution. Mega evolve. And the arena was inundated with overwhelming, bright light. The Charizard line, was a rather peculiar line, even amongst fire types. For one thing, there existed no other Pokémon to date, whose genetic constitution matched so closely to draconic DNA, as it did in the case of Charizard. One only needed to see a Charizard to understand the draconic parentage in them, what with their entire body anatomy being better suited to draconic species than most dragons out there. And yet, they were classified as a fire-slash-flying type species. Initially, the official record about their classification generated much negative public opinion. After all, if it looks like a dragon, flies like a dragon, and belches flames like a dragon, it must inevitably be a dragon. The answer to that conundrum came from a research report submitted by Lazarus White, a reclusive Pokémon researcher from Northeast Johto. His granddaughter Liza, 
is presently the current head of the family and the caretaker of the Cherisific Valley, a haven for Charizards. The protection and maintenance of the valley have been with the White family for several generations now. According to Lazarus, the Charizard line came showed direct descent from two very specific draconic DNA the first is Tyrantrum, a fossil Pokemon species whose remnants were excavated out in Kalos around 90 years ago. The second, unbelievably so, was Moulters as was discovered after a detailed analysis of one of its feathers that was gifted to the Wataru clan some two centuries ago. It is not clear how such a genetic combination came into being, though it is believed, that the amplified potency of the fire nature in Moulters was somehow able to dominate over the draconic nature in Charizard, giving higher priority to fire typing than dragon. The exact answer is still a subject of research, but it is clear that the Charizard line, is the only fire type in the world of Pokemon, that is, to put in more crass words, not a glass cannon, like most fire types generally are. While the draconic DNA turned recessive, it did impart the physical strength and might of dragons to the Charizard line, a fact that becomes extremely distinct with each successive evolution. As a Charmander, almost nothing save a dragon dance, or a paltry dragon breath was what it was capable of, but on further evolutions, a Charizard was capable of performing almost everything that a pure dragon could do. And yet, its innate fire nature didn't give way to dragon to establish dominance. The answer to this quandary came in the form of Mega Evolution. When flooded with Mega Evolution energy, the two segments of Charizard's DNA reacted differently. Apparently, on evolution to Charizard, the draconic genes became almost at par with the genetics it had obtained from Moulters, enough that both had equal chances of evolving further. The theory, that there existed not one, but two CO-dominant genes that could establish themselves through Mega Evolution, had initially shocked the world and had been taken in with a pinch of salt by researchers throughout the world. And then, Mega Evolution slammed the truth to their faces, as two independent forms of Mega Charizard were obtained. X and Y Mega Charizard X, a type where the draconic DNA got access to further evolve, and become much more active than the extremely potent Moulter's DNA, gave rise to the form of a black draconic Charizard with a dragon slash fire typing. It was, in essence, a quintessential specimen with equal aspects of fire and dragon, both enhanced to massive proportions. The other was Mega Charizard Y, where the Moulter's DNA attained further evolution, making the form the ultimate fire type, second only to the might of the original legendary itself. Its firepower and abilities were superlative, a clear indication that its origins lay in the primordial personification of fire itself. And that was what Cynthia's Charizard had chosen to evolve into. Even as a Charmander, it had a monster egg group and not a dragon one, and thus, had always been larger, stronger and mightier than those with dragon egg bearings. Even as a Charizard, it had been trained to unlock its innate fire nature, using it to a superlative degree. The power of Mega Evolution, flooding its tissues and nerves, now only unleashed it from any chains holding back the power descendant from the primordial fire bird. Mega Charizard Y let out an earth-shattering roar. And every single sound in the entire stadium was silenced all of them in awe of the magnificent Pokémon that stood, head and shoulders taller than the tallest Charizard, with a hooping 13-foot height, and twice as large wingspan. The entire body seemed much more reptilian than before, though several blade-like protrusions were visible on its body, right from the head to the appendages to the tail, at the end of which, burned a massive, scorching flame bright enough to light up the entire battleground by itself. You have a Meganite stone too, hey! Lucian forced it through his teeth, not at all expecting such a comeback. Sure, the girl was good, very good in fact, for a generalist that is. But to have a Meganite Stone and a Pokémon that responded to it, to such perfect levels, was something the Psychic Master had not anticipated. I evaluated her wrong. He admitted to himself, the confession leaving a bitter taste in his mouth. Still, let's match the powers of me and my Mega Alakazam, who can divine nearly almost everything binary but a single gaze against your powerhouse of a Mega Charizard, and the best commands that you can give him. Cynthia grinned. Let it be so. Charizard, bring in the heat. And the entire arena seemed to be submerged with searing, intolerable heat, as if they were all standing amid an active volcano, spewing out magma from its depths. For someone like Alakazam, whose entire existence was maintained by psychic energy, the intolerable heat seemed to provide an extremely annoying distraction, as he forced his power to forcibly create convection, in an attempt to seep away the heat towards the sky. My Mega Charizard YS ability is drought. I'm sure you know what that means. Cynthia asked rhetorically. Lucian cursed under his breath. Drought, his ass. 
He knew drought. His nine tails could bring the effects of drought into battle, enhancing her fire-type attacks better than Blaze under a sunny day. This? This seemed like a monster made out of a dozen droughts at the same time. Raise the field, Charizard, Cynthia commanded. Multi-spin. What the heck is that? Lucian thought in worry. Mega Charizard Y, it seemed, knew just what to do. It flew high into the air, before summoning a mother of all fire spins, before unleashing it into the battlefield, before flying up higher and higher, its wings glowing bright, spinning as it went, before manipulating its momentum effortlessly to send repeated strokes of powerful air slashes into the fire spin raging on the ground beneath, literally slicing it apart with such precision that it would make any self-respecting Metagross die of jealousy. Sliced apart, the fragments of the fire spin reformed, and now, there were six independent fire spins, raging all across the ground. Your Alakazam can calculate Charizard's trajectory. I can admit that. But, can it do so while escaping from these? Cynthia waved at the multiple fire spins, that raised the battlefield, independent of everything else, making it difficult for the mega-evolved Psy to even concentrate in the battle, its entire concentration engrossed in maintaining convection to clear out the heat from wherever it stood at any moment. And just like that, the tables had turned. You can run, but you cannot hide. Cynthia smiled. Alakazam, use Psycho Cut on Charizard. Lucian commanded, inwardly feeling that the battle had once again, turned into the same as his Bronzong against that Garcomp. Shadow Claw, Cynthia commanded, as Charizard's claws got engulfed with ghostly fumes, the very antithesis of psychic power before it slammed said claws head on into the incoming psychic barrage. End it. Use Blast Burn. The fire type let out a furious roar, before slamming its forelimb into the ground, literally uprooting the entire arena as rocks and liquid magma were pulled out of the ground the hellish flames ascending upward all across the battleground, allowing no place where Alakazam could stay unaffected from its unbridled fury. After the smoke receded, only a single draconic creature remained standing in whatever remained of the battle arena. A wounded and completely unconscious Alakazam, now devolved back into its natural form, lay fallen on one of the rock boulders. Silence pervaded the stadium for a while. Alakazam is unable to battle. The winner is Charizard. The commentator whispered his voice slowly gaining strength. And with that, Cynthia has solidified her position as the Sinnoh champion. Said the champion turned towards Lucian, who seemed completely exhausted, and was staring back at her as if seeing her for the first time. Then, the corner of the man's lips twisted into a content smile, as he nodded at her. It was as if, a misty glass between them had dropped, and now the man was realizing something that he had missed spotting in the first place. No words were said, and yet, something far more precious was admitted. And Cynthia smiled back. Omake paragraph. The inside of a jiggly puff, like that of a red giant star, is filled with helium. It is unknown how a Pokemon came to have this unusual composition most are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen but their ability to evolve with a moonstone suggests an extraterrestrial origin. Although they are capable of walking on land, it is also common to see a jiggly puff drifting aimlessly through the skies. It is this property that inspired the invention of the balloon. The first balloons were not made of rubber but were jigglypuff with strings tied to them, which would float 30 feet in the air for observation and the amusement of children. The jigglypuff were often unpleased with being used in this manner, and after one too many incidents of marker to the face, balloons made of non-living materials became popular instead. This usage of jigglypuff is still recalled in their ability to inflate and carry a rider for short periods. Occasionally they are controlled by a small fire-type Pokemon held below it by the trainer in a way similar to a hot air balloon. They are not used for intercity flights, as they move slowly and can not stay aloft for longer than a couple of hours. Nonetheless, when escaping from a mountain or a tall building, Jigglypuff is extremely valuable to trainers who do not have any large flying-type Pokemon on their team. Chapter Number 212 Mutuo and Giovanni Mutuo simply levitated himself upward toward the second floor past the pathetic dark creatures that stood guard around his partner's office. Pathetic, he mentally sneered, as if these pitiful creatures would be able to stand in front of his wrath, should he direct it towards Team Rocket. Giovanni has called for you, boss replied slowly, as the two walked ahead in the empty corridor, away from all interference. Mutuo smiled. The hierarchy within the tiers of Team Rocket amused him to no end. The entire organization, while over two decades old, had truly come to life some, three years ago, with its aim of making its presence known all over Kanto. Before that, 
it had mainly been a cluster of undercover research groups working for a man, a shrewd businessman whose ambition and intelligence were unparalleled among men. Lionel Giovanni Of course, back then Giovanni had funded a significant amount of capital on Project Alpha a project that was supposed to create the most powerful Pokémon in the world. Or rather, that was what it seemed it was. A project that had ended with a blaze, with twisted metal on the ground, the entire island engulfed in ashes and smoke, and a lone survivor, one who would someday, become the Alpha of all. Three years ago. The entire place was in ruins. The scorching flames consuming the entire fortress, the labs underground now nothing more than jaded glass and broken pillars, the machinery destroyed, the lives annihilated, and now, there was nothing else. One single beam of light, one single pair of glowing, icy blue eyes, and everything, decades of research were destroyed, annihilated, and all of that, because of one single mistake. Mutuo looked down at his own hands. All of this, devastation, had been caused by nothing but a couple of thoughts. Wishes, and emotions. Then again, as the man in white had told him. He was the most powerful Pokémon in the world. I had strings, but now I'm free. And then he saw it. Walking towards him, a man, with that large mechanical contraption with wings behind him. A chopper. He realized, as information that he had absorbed from the man in white Dr. Franklin's mind rose to fill in the blanks. He wondered, why this, human was coming towards him. It was not like he would be any. Different? Yes. He is different. The human stood in front of him. There was no trace of fear in the man's eyes. It was almost like, fear, and pain were concepts abstract to him. Just like me. Mutuo told himself. I see that their experiment succeeded. The man spoke in an orotund voice. They managed to create the most versatile Pokémon in the world, and they wanted to make him into a lab rat. He sneered at the end. Mutuo felt his perceptions tilt, observing the man in front of him. Of course, the entity in front of him was human, just like those he had just, slaughtered inside the white building. And yet, this man seemed not to care about his own life. It was almost like he expected no, he knew that Mutuo would not kill him. Not until he had spoken up his mind anyway. Mutuo felt his awareness expand. Interesting. An empathy. I didn't know that humans had these, abilities. Interesting. An empathy whose powers are inverted upon himself. He could see now. This man. Giovanni picked the name out of the man's mind. The man's mind had twisted, and inverted his empathy into itself, making him devoid of emotions, sentiments, and fears. Leaving behind only ambition. Interesting. Very interesting. My name is Giovanni, and I am someone who can help you. Help, me. Mutuo. Spoke up, using his psychic-enhanced voice, as he felt a tinge of emotion, amusement, he recognized. Help each other. The man, Giovanni answered, as he turned his gaze away from him to stare at the burning heaps of twisted metal and concrete. Those people in there, they were only working to create, not to destroy or cause harm. Why did you kill them? Mutuo felt a strange impulse to instantly end the man's pitiful little life, if only for the misdemeanor of questioning him. A prey had no business questioning the morality of the predator. Morality. He mused. Such a twisted, subjective, human concept. I suppose I can humor him. If only for entertainment's sake. He decided. I did not, kill them. I was simply annoyed when I found myself awake, bound in, strings, and them telling me, ordering me, to be there, as if they were the makers of my destiny. Giovanni's lips curled. They did create you. They did. Mutuo could agree with that. He tilted his head slightly. Dr. Franklin was an avid believer in body language. Is that supposed to make a difference? Silence. I didn't like being bound in strings, so I set myself free. Humans, pretty interesting species. I was curious, I wanted to know how they worked. I thought it was funny. The men in white were laughing after all. He paused. It took me absorbing Franklin's mind to realize that they were in fact, screaming. There wasn't an ounce of expression on Giovanni's face. Mutuo felt disappointed. Almost. Those people in there. Giovanni spoke after an eternally long time eight. 7,593 seconds to be exact. They were my men. I can't say they were very bright, but they were intelligent. 
amusement. Mutuo felt it again. But they weren't bad. Giovanni looked up at him. Why did you kill them? A conversation with a human. It was, surreal. Interesting. He would humor him. There is no such thing as bad. What about good? Good and bad are, fairy tales. Humans have evolved to attach an emotional significance to what is nothing more than a survival strategy of the pack animal, conditioned to invest divinity in utility. You seem, very well aware of yourself and the world, despite, being born yesterday. Giovanni returned. Mutuo smiled inwardly. Another emotion. It felt good to slowly discover oneself. He should do it again. I understand the way the human species thinks. Dr. Franklin was extremely, cooperative in that regard. I know about those mercurial beasts you worship as legends, trying to fashion me into one. He looked squarely at the man's face, gauging his reaction. You tried to make yourself one. Me. Well. Giovanni did not disappoint. That was the mission. To create a legend. I live beyond your mission. I see past those, tiny ambitions of the human species. And what do you see? Mutuo smiled again. Good isn't really good. Evil isn't wrong. Bottoms aren't really pretty. You are a prisoner of your meat. And you aren't. No. Why? Mutuo smiled again. I'm too clever. Silence. I'm inclined to agree, Giovanni replied with a mundane finality. Dr. Franklin was a man of many talents. It is good that his death did not go in vain. We got, you. Another impulse to vivisect the man flitted inside Mutuo's mind. I have a proposition for you. Mutuo's eyes glowed with icy fire. Is this the moment when you tell me that I'll know my purpose if I follow you? Giovanni's lips curled. I'm not an idiot. You are, incandescent. However, we can be of mutual help to each other. Interesting. My team spent decades in their attempts to create, you. And here you are, in the flesh. While I admit it hurts seeing my best researchers slaughtered like that, it feels worse to find that the most versatile entity in the universe is a little more than a raging wildfire. Perhaps I should correct his ignorance. Mutuo thought in amusement. You were created, not to become the most powerful psychic, but the most versatile one. Molded after the legendary Mew, someone with the power to become any Pokemon, regardless of type. One, who could use the fire blast of Arcanine in one hand, channel a hydro cannon of Blast Was from the other, while simultaneously managing a Draco Meteor of a Kingdra. He paused. Someone who could become a legend amongst legends. That was the aim. Mutuo closed his eyes, as he began to analyze himself. Interesting. He didn't know he could do that. His very constitution seemed to be made of mutating cells that could transform into any type he wanted. However, he wasn't being able to mutate them at will. It is such a, annoyance. Even he too had limits. You know I am speaking the truth, Giovanni replied. You have your psychic powers available as the default version of your genetic constitution. With my organization's aid, you will be able to learn how to mutate your cells at will, though the progress would obviously, be slow. Mutuo extended his awareness further. The man, Giovanni, was indeed speaking the truth. Or at least, he believed what he was saying as the truth. I have invested a lot of research and money into you. If you agree to my proposition, it would enable my team to continue their research, while at the same time, enabling you, a better and quicker comprehension of your powers. That is all I offer. And if I choose to deny. I cannot stop you, Giovanni confessed freely. If I could, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Interesting. Omake paragraph. Wigglytuff is known as a cute species of Pokemon which exude happiness and whose song can brighten the darkest day. They are considered to be Pokemon as cheerful as Cubone are sad. This is the impression they strive to give off, and most of them are quite skillful at it. It is also an absolute lie. Few Wigglytuff is orphans, to be fair. But the Moonstone warps something in every Jigglypuff's heart, filling it with memories of their bitter exile from the moon and floating through space down to Earth, of long-lost friends who got hit by asteroids before they could finish the journey, of shunning, in the case of Wild Wigglytuff, from their friends and family, for evolution was said to be forbidden until the moon was theirs again. Some say that when a Wigglytuff opens its mouth, there are no teeth and no tongue, but darkness impervious to all light that spreads throughout the Pokémon's body. This is in all likelihood a myth, 
like that of Wigglytuff being immune to psychic attacks and afraid of bugs, but the metaphor is an apt one. Chapter number 213 Six Stages of Grief POV Change Back to the Present After that event, Mutuo slowly watched the metamorphosis of Team Rocket from a private research organization into an actual militant service, working undercover to fuel its research. However, every notorious organization needed a head, a face to lead it, a face that all agents would respect, and a face that would take the blame should things go awry. But Giovanni, the ex-Viridian gym leader, was a businessman. He couldn't afford to be the face of the devil, after all, how else would he be able to enjoy plausible deniability when the time came? And yet, he needed the devil. And so, he created one. The one they called Boss. A man sitting in the shadows, with a Persian at his feet. A man, or rather a position, one that was occupied by two individuals to date. The first is a man called Magnuson, and after his slaughter, a man called Archer. Giovanni remained the ex-Viridian gym leader, the one who was mind-punked by Mutuo and the boss of Team Rocket into following their commands, should Team Rocket be defeated by some grave eventuality. Pragmatism. It was a good skill to have. Mutuo could certainly see the advantages of having it. Where is he? He finally asked. In his gym office. Without further delay, Mutuo disappeared. Austin stood in the midst of Lavender Tower, his eyes focused on Radicate's grave. The air was filled with the scent of burning tobacco as he took a drag from his cigarette. The tower was a solemn place, with towering pillars and ancient cobblestones that whispered secrets from ages past. A cold wind swept through the open windows, causing the flames of the torches to flicker and dance. Tap. The sound of footsteps echoed throughout the chamber, and Austin turned to see Elite Four Agatha approach him. Her attire was that of a witch, with a long black cloak draped over her shoulders and a pointed hat on her head. In her hand, she held a gnarled wooden staff that was crackled with dark energy. Her sharp eyes locked onto Austin, and she spoke in a commanding voice. You know it's considered rude to ignore your elders. Austin took another drag from his cigarette before exhaling a cloud of smoke. He didn't even acknowledge Agatha's presence. Well. Elite Four Agatha, he croaked. It is Agatha and nothing else, the old woman replied, her voice dripping with disdain. Her sharp eyes jumped from Austin to the floating shadow Pokemon hidden behind the pillars. For some reason, the shadow Pokemon felt extremely familiar, and judging by the manner it was shying its eyes away, Agatha knew that it was not a coincidence. She knew this haunter. It was only a time before her memories spotted it. My name is Ash. Ash Ketchum from Pallet Town. I have heard quite many mentions of your name, Agatha replied in a half sardonic tone. Then again, they are not, undeserved. Thanks, Austin replied as he puffed on his cigarette. Aren't you going to tell me to stop smoking like the twin grandmas? He asked. No, it's human nature to find something to wash away your grief with. And again don't let Grady and Brady hear you call them grandma, they are very vocal about that topic. Austin nodded while trying to give Agatha a cigarette. What are you trying to do, speed up my journey to the grave? Agatha said as she took out a military water bottle. Austin could smell the alcohol reeking from the water bottle. So that's what she meant by something to wash away grief. Austin and Agatha stood silently as they indulged in their vices. You know, you have the same look in your eyes just like I did when I was younger. When? A hundred years ago. Kakik, no, make that two hundred years back, Agatha chuckled as she took a huge gulp. The look of revenge, Agatha's words caused Austin's smile to drop before he puffed his cigarette. So are you going to tell me otherwise? No, I was just like you, consumed by revenge when my father died at the hands of the monster you killed. Sorry. For what? For taking away the thing I hated the most. For ruining my revenge. Agatha took another gulp as she said, I don't know who hurt you but remember the words of this old crone obsessed with revenge. Revenge consumes you and pushes away all the people you hold dear. But I know you are not going to listen. I was just the same. They say there are five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance but for people like us who have been scarred by the world there exists a sixth stage, revenge. Agatha's words caused Austin to close his eyes as all the moments he had with Radicate began to flash through his mind. In silence, Austin opened his eyes which glowed crimson red. The look in Austin's eyes told Agatha everything who closed her bottle as she said, looks like my words didn't seem to have an effect. I just came here to thank you for freeing my family from the curse. 
even if I feel anger towards you for taking away my revenge, I am still grateful that the curse is finally gone. Austin absent-mindedly nodded as Agatha turned to leave before Austin curiously asked, Aren't you going to stop me? Kakik, no, you have made up your mind. Even if I stop you here, you will stand up again to walk this path of destruction. I can only advise you to focus your anger on the thing you are getting your revenge on and not let it lash out against the innocent, I made that mistake and to this day I never forgave myself. Austin could feel the sorrow in Agatha's words as she left leaving behind a young man who was at a crossroads in life. Not knowing what he should do next. Murawak and Cubone walked towards the hall. They wanted to thank the human for protecting them. Suddenly as the human came to view, Murawak immediately stopped Cubone from advancing further. Her instincts told her that this human was dangerous. Hearing the commotion, Austin glanced toward the duo and with a nod, he left with Pikachu on his shoulders. Murawak and Cubone glanced at what Austin was looking at. Only to find, a torn piece of clothing with the symbol of Team Rocket on it, set ablaze. Glancing at Austin's back, Murawak had a gut feeling that this human was going towards a path of destruction. Whatever the result would be, Murawak knew that the world is going to go through a storm with that human at its epicenter. Man is such a strange and selfish yet selfless creature. Words and actions can create such an influence on the body and mind of man. These emotions led man to conquer this world and these emotions led man through the pathway of life. Brady and Grady looked at the retreating back of Austin before they walked up the lavender tower to see what made this young man wait from dusk to dawn. On the top floor of the tower, a shiny alpha haunter floated, her spectral form glowing in the darkness. Radicate, a plump and furry creature, stood beside her his whiskers twitching with anxiety. Isn't it time for you to leave? Haunter asked Radicate. Then who will look after that idiot of mine? Radicate replied, his voice tinged with concern. Haunter's response was simple. I will. The air was thick with tension and danger as everyone stood at the precipice of their fate. Omake paragraph. It should not be surprising that a Pokemon which itself is frequently called an epidemic and infestation should also be one of the leading vectors of disease in the Pokemon world. Zubat is not only fearsome in appearance, with their lack of eyes, purple wings, and fangs, but also extremely dangerous to an unprepared Pokemon. A Zubat's mouth is open frequently for echolocation, but this is quite unsanitary and leaves it easy prey for airborne viruses, rare is even the cold that a Zubat does not catch. Although it is far from the only Pokemon to learn techniques such as leech life and bite, its sharp fangs pierce the skin deeper and are shaped in a way that allows for the easy transmission of viruses. Finally, its poison-type immune system keeps it alive to carry diseases that would kill an ordinary Pokémon. Thankfully for humans, it is Pokémon who suffer the brunt of Zubat bites, although woe betides those who venture into a cave without a poke ball. Typically Zubat infections can be cured at a Pokémon center, but occasionally they run across incurable mutant diseases, most of which kill fast and spread faster. To add insult to injury, Zubat is believed to be one of the few Pokémon which can not spread the Pokerus, a strange pathogen that increases a Pokemon's abilities and is prized by trainers worldwide. Chapter number 214 Choice POV Change Walking down the cold roads leading away from Lavender Town, Austin found himself in enjoying the Zephyr that created a beautiful and comforting environment. Pikachu wondered what his trainer was thinking since he hadn't tried to make any kind of lame joke which if Pikachu was honest he really liked. The air about his trainer had changed and the look in his eyes his eyes made Pikachu nervous. Austin suddenly stopped in the open meadow as he said, Pikachu use iron tail on the ground to create line. Pikachu while a little confused obliged as he jumped from Austin's shoulders and with a backflip mid-air tore a line through the ground with iron tail. Austin pulled out all his pokeballs before threw them upward as in a flash of light everyone appeared in front of him. Firo and Charm Leon were ready to battle but relaxed when they saw no one but their trainer in front of them. Clefable and Muna frowned when they sensed the dark aura combining from their trainer's heart. Ninjask suddenly stole Wordertle's glasses before disappearing causing Wordertle to dramatically cover his eyes while using Caesar's legs to hide his shame. Caesar sweat dropped while Bulbasaur's eyes rolled at Wordertle while he took a step away from Shed Ninja who floated midair ready to receive his trainer's command. Butterfree sat on Krabby who was enjoying cutting the grass around him. Pidgeot frowned when she saw there were no trees around them for her to perch. Guys. Pidgeot. And gals. Pidgeot nodded as Austin continued. Can everyone stand over the line? Everyone looked down before adjusting themselves. Austin patiently waited before placing everyone's pokeball in front of them as he stood a few meters away. From today onward you don't have to listen to what I have to say anymore. 
You can go wherever you want. Austin's words shook everyone to their chore. Was their loving trainer abandoning them? I am going to hunt down Team Rocket. It is not going to be easy. Many of you and I could end up like Radicate but I am willing to do it. And I give you all a choice, cross this line if you want to come with me and potentially endanger your lives or you can destroy your pokeball and leave. The choice is yours. The look in Austin's eyes told everyone that this wasn't some kind of joke. Pikachu and everyone looked at each other as they silently gazed upon their trainer who had a calm look on his face but his hands were shaking. Afraid that none would follow him in this path. Pikachu and everyone smirked before charging towards their trainer. Austin didn't need to know what his Pokemon said but he was certain he heard their voices loud and clear. They were in this together. Even if he walked through hell, they would follow him. Austin wanted to tell them how dangerous their journey would be. He wanted to say so many things but the overflow of emotions and tears caused Austin to lose his voice. Lavender Town, Ainsworth Family Mansion Agatha was sitting in the main hall, on a rather old-fashioned wooden rocking chair, her face getting illuminated on and off from the light of the fireplace. Despite it still being morning, the amount of sunlight entering into the mansion was feeble at best. Agatha gazed upon the shiny alpha haunter who was talking to Caesar and the others. You are leaving aren't you? Agatha asked her as she stared at her father's starter. The shiny alpha haunter smiled mischievously as she rubbed her head. The old crone pushed back into her chair. You are going after that unusual trainer, Ash Ketchum. Haunter didn't understand if the young man had just been complimented or insulted by her old master's daughter. It was a compliment. Agatha replied, as if reading her mind. Most trainers are more, shall we say, pragmatic about Pokemon, they consider them as tools, and, pets, if you want a better term. Those which they can easily trade when a better opportunity comes walking. But I can see that young trainer treating his Pokemon like family, if that trainer is your choice then I can say you made the right choice. Haunter smiled as she patted Agatha's head before disappearing into shadows as she left the Ainsworth family mansion. A cruel, sinister look flickered on the old woman's face. You found something interesting in that trainer, didn't you? Maybe it was fate that joined you too, a Pokemon left alone under the rule of a cruel being, rescued by a kind and gentle soul whom they decided to follow through the path of hell, quite poetic. Some time later, in a different office. The man in the shadows petted his Persian softly, making the cat purr at him lovingly, as he stared at the head of tech department car, in front of him, the other man's head down in shame. So, the infamous executive Butch was defeated by a bunch of ghosts. The head of tech looked up, terrified. Please. Please boss, believe me. We received a transmission from the black box. Car's face was blank. And we received confirmation about the death of Executive Butch alongside Magmartar and Duslips that you gave him. And yet, that didn't stop the men from capturing the ghastly population. Your story is, full of holes, I'm afraid, Car. Boss. I'm speaking the damn truth. Believe me. Get a psychic, but whatever, just believe me. I have no reason to lie. The boss frowned. As unfortunate as it is, you are speaking the truth. However, Losing an entire fleet of our men along with an executive is a great loss for Team Rocket. All of Butch's captures, all the prisoners, all the remaining Pokemon, will be transferred to Petrol. Cars paled. Petrol? Why? The man in the shadows smirked. You will find out soon enough. Contact Petrol immediately. He will tell you where to go. Cars' knuckles were white. Yes, yes, boss. Leave. His head bowed the man who was once an admin, turned away to get out of the room. Wait. He stopped. Exactly how many ghosts were there? The man in the shadows sat up, a little straighter. Endless. Endless. Terrifyingly endless from what we have gathered from the black box before the transmission was fully cut off. Carr kept on stammering, as he left the room. Omake oh, paragraph. It is rare for any species of Pokemon to be universally loathed across cultural backgrounds, especially one which is not of the dark type and will not attack humans unless provoked. Nonetheless, Galbat have been demonized, quite literally, in many religions, used as a motif for villainy and terror, including in recent years by Team Rocket, which frequently handed out Galbat to its members, and become the subject of deliberate extermination campaigns. Their imposing fangs, wings, long tongue, and association with the night terrify people in a way which neither Zubat nor Krabat ever do, and humans have confronted this fear with bigotry and unthinking vengeance. 
The environmental movement has made some progress in recent years at rehabilitating Galbat's image, but it is a long struggle with setbacks whenever a foul-spirited trainer uses a Galbat to commit crimes or puts one on their flag when conquering nations never mind that virtually all Pokémon are loyal to their trainers. Indeed, some have privately mused it would be easier to preserve caves if Galbat didn't exist, when they talk about the need to protect endangered cave Pokémon, their opponents describe it as a breeding ground for Galbat. Some would think that, because they can still be found in wide numbers in parts of some caves where most trainers fear to enter, this superstitious loathing has had little ill effect. This is not true, for Galbat did not evolve in caves, but were pushed there by human aggression. Chapter number 215 Severing Connections POV Change Route 8 is a unique route traveling east to west from Lavender Town to Saffron City. As the night sky engulfed the land, Austin finds himself laying uncomfortably on the hard bed of the inn he was staying at. Pika, Pi, Pikachu complained about not having any ketchup to eat with his ice cream. Austin ignored his partner's weird taste choices before he switched on the transceiver to make a call to Bill Montgomery. He held on for a minute of indecisiveness as he knew he had to do this before he moves on to the main plan of destroying Team Rocket. Activating the call function, he selected Bill's contact number, and after three rings, a flash of light appeared on the screen as Bill's weight. What the hell are you wearing? Austin screamed, getting up from the bed, and he yelled into the transceiver. On the screen was Bill wearing a giant EV costume. What's wrong? Well. Do I have to say it out loud? I don't see anything wrong. Bill, is this some kind of kink fetish? How do you know about a kink at your age? Austin wanted to say the internet but kept his mouth closed since to his knowledge, the Pokemon world doesn't have any kind of internet. Okay, okay, I am not going to judge your closed closet kink rituals. They are in. They are not. Can you stop looking at me as if I committed a war crime? Bill replied as he explained how he was checking if pheromones from a mother would induce a response from the children when that pheromone comes from something that visually isn't an EV. This is a kink. Sigh. So what did you call me for? Is your offer of being my sponsor still open? Bill almost jumped at Austin's words before replying, of course it is. Bill, can I ask what obligations I have to do when you become my sponsor? Well it's simple really, I will either have you catch some Pokemon for my research or have you conduct on-field research on my behalf. Austin, I have a proposal for you if you are interested. Austin looked interested as Bill continued. I was watching your match and I can see that you use combo moves in your matches. Yeah, what about them? I have a friend who is interested in buying those moves and converting them into TMS. Really, Austin asked in disbelief before he remembered the summary Bill gave him about TMS. Is the production of TMS harmful to the Pokemon? No, you have my word as a scientist that the entire procedure is regulated under the supervision of a team of scientists, engineers, and doctors. Austin thought about it for a bit before answering. So. Vermilion City, Pokemon Center. Dottie, using quick attack to dodge. Dottie dodged past Nidorino's poison sting. Screech into gust. Yellow commanded with a smile on her face as Dottie's attack resulted in the opponent's Nidorino fainting. Nidorino has fainted hence Yellow wins this battle. Misty as the judge said as Joey returned Nidorino. Ha, if you had faced against my top 1% Rattata then it would have been my win. Misty snorted at Joey's attempts to brush off the loss as Yellow had almost fallen asleep. A little embarrassed Joey scoffed before leaving. Misty smiled as she went up to Yellow who had woken up with Dottie pecking her. Misty, did you ask Professor Oak if Ash is alright? Yellow's question caused Misty to sweat drop as she remembered how Professor Oak had begged her to stop Yellow from asking him about Ash's condition every hour. Misty lightly chuckled as she patted Yellow's head. Misty water flower, Brock, and please come to the front office. A call has come from an Ash Ketchum for you. Misty turned yellow only to find nothing but thin air. Come on, Misty hurry up. Yellow yelled out. Thud. Misty opened her mouth before closing it as she slowly followed after yellow who kept running while rubbing her head that she hid on her way out. Brock, Misty, and yellow all stared at the black screen in front of them. Is the call cut off or something? Yellow asked in worry before a voice spoke from the black screen. No. There is a connection problem where I am so looks like this is the only way we can talk for now. Austin's voice caused Brock, Misty, and Yellow to relax a little as the stress and anxiety of what happened to their friend were eating them alive these last few weeks. Ash, are you okay? Where are you? Are you okay? Is Pikachu okay? 
Yellow rattled off a series of questions before she started coughing. Misty patted Yellow's back as Brock said, Yellow, I don't think Ash could understand what you were saying. Yellow looked down with a blush of embarrassment before Misty said, Don't worry about us, Ash. We are doing fine. We are still in Vermilion City for your butt to get over here. Misty, please mind your language. Misty rolled her eyes as she knew Brock was overusing this gentleman persona after some girl in the Pokemon Center said she liked chivalrous men. Suddenly the trio felt that their friend was a little too quiet. Ash, is something wrong? Brock asked with worry laced in his voice. Can I ask why did you decide to journey with me? Wouldn't it be better to journey by yourself? Austin's voice called out to the trio from the black screen. What brought this on? Brock asked curiously while internally he was worried about what brought such feelings up in his friend. Let's be honest with ourselves, we are holding each other back. I want to be a Pokemon master, Misty wants to be a water type master, Brock wants to be a breeder, and Yellow is just going with the flow. Unlike the others, Yellow noticed that Austin was speaking unusually as if he was reading something off a script. What's this about, Ketchum? Misty raised her voice in anger. Typical Misty, always prone to anger. Maybe that's why you're known for being the ugly duckling of the Sensational Sisters. Yellow covered her mouth in shock while Brock's face hardened. Misty's face changed from disbelief into absolute fury as she screamed at the top of her lungs, Ketchum, how dare you? Tell me, where you are right now and I'll show you who's the ugly duckling. Austin seemed to ignore Misty's outrage as he said, Brock, your dream is to become a breeder. Why are you wasting your time with us? Brock was confused at his friend's words. Just what had happened for Ash to act this way? Why don't you try traveling alone maybe then some girls would show interest in a creep like you? Austin's words seemed to get under Brock's skin but he didn't express his anger like Misty. I have been thinking ever since the SS. Anne. Gary, Harrison, and Paul why are they so powerful then I realized something they don't have anyone holding them back. W, what are you saying? Yellow managed to speak up. Isn't it obvious? I am saying that I want to travel alone without any one of you losers holding me back. You bastard. Misty screamed out before Austin said this, let's go our separate ways. I don't want to see any of your faces especially you, Yellow. At the end of the statement, Austin raised his voice before his call cut off leaving behind a furious Misty, an irritated but puzzled Brock, and Yellow who had tears flowing down her face. Yellow. Misty said in the softest tone she could muster but it had little to no effect as Yellow ran out of the room with tears in her eyes. Yellow, don't listen to him. Misty screamed out before running after the crying Yellow. She had a few tears in her eyes. Even though she didn't show it, to Misty their group was like a second family to her and the words of a friend that she truly respected from the bottom of her heart cut deep through her. Brock was left alone in the room as he looked at the screen. Ash was always completely fine even after all of those losses yet he wants to travel alone just because he feels like we are holding him back. Brock thought to himself as even though his friend's words made a lot of sense, those words didn't feel like they were coming from him rather they felt forced as if he was pushing them away by exploiting the insecurities that trigger them the most. Why are you doing this, Ash? Boom. The glass cup shattered on the wall as Austin lashed out in anger at the desk in front of him. He was angry at himself for saying those things to his friends. Unlike Earth where he had a few people, he could call friends. Maybe he was just too boring. Even then the few people he called friends weren't someone he was truly close to. Brock, Misty, and Yellow were the first people who he could truly call his friends, and now, he was pushing them away for their safety. Pika, Pi. Hearing his partner's concerned voice, Austin turned as he sat in the chair. Was I an asshole enough? Austin said sardonically as Pikachu nodded. Chuckling a little. Austin rubbed Pikachu's head while he rubbed away a few tears he shed. Even if they hated him, this was for the best. Pikachu, was I in the right to push them away? Pikachu patted his trainer's arm as he knew why his trainer did that. They were going up against Team Rocket. If anything happened to Brock, Yellow, and Misty they wouldn't be able to forgive themselves. Even if they hated this decision, they had to do it. Pika, Pi. Pika, Pikachu. Pikachu replied while doing his best to recreate a scene from a movie they saw in the SS. And which caused them to get late during the tournament. Austin chuckled as he said, Yeah, I know Bubby. I know. Let's go out for a walk, I can't stand in this smelly room where ketchup has been eaten on ice cream. Pika. Oh make paragraph. It is the domestication of Oddish, 
more than any other plant, which marks the difference between a hunter-gatherer society and an agricultural one. The body is edible, but seldom eaten, as doing so kills the Pokémon and it is uneconomical to do so when they could continue to grow leaves. The leaves, on the other hand, are rich in nutrients and the staple of many agrarian people's diets. Once cut off, they grow back in about a year. Typically, they are harvested every fall. The most challenging part is to keep the Oddish from running off or rebelling, for pruning is an unpleasant and unwanted experience for the Pokémon. Greenhouses are expensive and were impossible to build before the discovery of glass, and although soil can be potted, leaving them indoors reduces the amount of solar energy they receive to unhealthy levels. Traditionally walls were used, high enough to prevent them from escaping, but through methods like stacking each other, vine whip chains, and using sleep powder or stun spore on the farmer, massive breakaways were common, although the majority of Oddish harvests were successful. The first governments were created as much for the need to round up escaped Oddish as for the need to control flood plains. Chapter 218, Chapter Number 216 A Ghostly Situation POV Change It was a beautiful night. The stars were bright. It was the most peaceful night on that day. Austin took a stroll through the town he was staying at with Pikachu on his shoulders. He needed some fresh air after everything that he said to his friends. Not that many people were around though as if everyone else went to bed. How come no one is out on a beautiful and peaceful night out like this, Austin asked. Pika, Pi. Pikachu just shrugged as Austin said, maybe they thought it was too scary to stay up past their bedtime. Pikachu's ears dropped at his trainer's terrible sense of humor. Austin just sighed as time went on, they both enjoyed the beauty and peace surrounding them. I needed this. Austin thought before something attracted his attention. The news was being broadcasted on television on display. Austin stopped as he saw the Team Rocket logo on display. Officers had to intervene after a seemingly peaceful protest escalated to an aggressive conflict between protesters from the naturalist movement and a small group of civilians. The movement, self-denominated the Acolytes of Mew, is a group of ideologists known for their radical views against the current state of Pokémon, calling out the man-made intervention and modifications as blasphemous. According to them, Pokémon should remain the creatures they were always known as and not the overdeveloped. In other news, a crime was committed last Sunday night inside the grounds of the Gladiatories Arena, located on the east part of Saffron City. Francisco Drake, a Lucha Libra Pokémon player of the newly emerging sport Pokken, was found dead having presented severe head trauma. Paramedics were called as soon as a spectator discovered the body lying on the floor of the building's parking lot but unfortunately were not able to do anything as the individual had already passed away. Drake was a member of a prestigious family line of athletes, who have called for justice against this act and demanded for the perpetrator be found. Authorities cordoned off the site this morning and the investigation suspects the involvement of Team Rocket. Austin frowned at the news but for some reason, he felt as if he was being watched. Suddenly out of the blue, a small drizzle began to occur causing Austin to look up in confusion. I am sure there were no rain clouds when I came in. Ting. Wordertle broke out of his poke ball as he began to enjoy the rain which was slowly turning into a downpour. The rain was coming down in torrents and forming puddles on the ground and lightning moved through the air, lighting up the landscape for a moment, as everyone searched for shelter. Meanwhile, Wordertle was having the time of his life in the rain. Austin hoped to reach his inn faster, but it looked as though that would have to wait, the wind was so strong that it was nearly impossible to walk against and the rain was stinging their faces except for Wordertle making it hard to see more than a few feet in front of us. Austin tried to enter the TV store but it was closed. Then why is the TV running? Austin thought furiously before Pikachu shouted out. Following Pikachu's finger, a large and crumbling mansion with paint flaking off the walls and several wild Zubats fluttering in and out of a broken window. What with the storm and everything, it was so eerie that it bore a strong resemblance to the set of a horror film. Okay, that's just screaming it's a bad idea to go in there. Maybe a mad scientist lives there, Austin suggested. And he's going to capture us and use us in some evil experiment. Pika, Pi. Pikachu glared at his trainer for trying to scare him while Wordertle spat out the rainwater he tried drinking. Why is it so bitter? We are only staying at the porch until the storm dies down. Pikachu nodded as, after everything that happened in Lavender Town, he was done with anything creepy. Austin, Pikachu, and Wordertle stood bored as it rained cats and dogs. Austin and Pikachu were playing I Spy when Wardertle suddenly turned with something tapped his shoulders. Suddenly a hand of darkness outstretched from the ground and snatched up Wardertle's glasses before fleeing. Wardertle followed after into the creepy mansion. 
Pikachu and Austin stared at one another before releasing a sigh. Of course, this was going to happen. The door creaked on its rusty hinges as Austin pushed it open, sounding as though it was complaining to itself about being disturbed after a long and pleasant sleep. It was dark inside, so dark that they could hardly make out the silhouettes of the others, and there was a gloomy air about the place as if some unspeakable horror had occurred within these walls. Maybe whatever that was had been the reason this house had stood abandoned for however long it had been, Austin speculated as he steeled himself and stepped over the threshold with Pikachu hiding inside the backpack. Real brave buddy. Pika, Pikachu, Pikachu called out from the backpack. Austin could feel a light switch on the wall and flicked it in the hope of giving themselves some light. But nothing happened, the chandelier whose outline was visible on the ceiling continued to hang there unilluminated. The electric's off, Austin told Pikachu. Austin released Charm Leon from his poke ball as his tail lit up part of the room allowing them to see at least some of their surroundings, which appeared to consist of an old parlor of the sort once found in relatively wealthy households. A large fireplace and mantelpiece dominated the wall immediately in front of them, the chairs were made of red velvet with high backs and craved wooden armrests and an arcanine stood tall and proud in the corner. But there was something odd about it, it hadn't moved a muscle and, when we got closer, we immediately saw why. It's stuffed said Austin as used the light provided by his Pokedex as his torch on the Arcanine and revealed its glassy lifeless eyes. Beside me, Charm Leon shuddered at the sight of the Pokemon frozen into a position that made it look as though it would come to life at any moment, but I was quick to try and reassure him. It won't hurt you, Austin told him it's just a dead Arcanine and dead things can't do you any harm. Well, why didn't its trainer bury it? Austin thought while keeping a wary distance from the Arcanine. Who in their right mind would want to come within touching distance of such a thing? But Austin also had an idea what the unknown trainer's motives had been. I expect whoever its trainer was couldn't bear to be parted from it, Austin suggested. All the same, I don't think we'll be spending the night here. Let's find Wordertle before he hurts himself. Pikachu and Charm Leon nodded hurriedly. Austin held his makeshift torch in front of him as he led the way up the creaky old stairs, which squeaked loudly as we stepped on them. None of them had any idea what they would find in the upstairs rooms, but Austin hoped that they would find Wordertle as fast as they could. Wordertle. Pika. Char. Austin was distracted by his thoughts before Pikachu grabbed him by the shoulder. Austin whipped around intending to scold Pikachu for startling him. But the words died on his lips when he saw the terrified expression on his face. Pikachu, he whispered nervously as he raised his paw towards his ear. Hear what? Austin asked cupping his hand around his ear. I don't hear anything. Okay, this is official. I have the worst luck ever. First Lavender Tower and now this. Muna, Clefable, and Ninjask emerged from their ball in a flash of light and stood beside me protectively. Charm Leon, Muna, Pikachu, Clefable, and Ninjask, five Pokemon assembled beside Austin, all of them alert for the slightest hint of trouble. We could only hope that they would be enough for whatever was lurking here. This was exactly the sort of place where ghost Pokemon liked to hang out. As if even thinking about ghost Pokemon had tempted fate, the sound of mocking laughter issued forth again, and, this time, we all heard it. Haunt haunt haunt, came the eerie whispering laugh of a ghost Pokemon from somewhere nearby, although none of us could tell where. That was the problem with ghost types, they were notoriously tricky to spot and were inclined to play mischievous tricks on unwary trainers. The sound spooked Pikachu before he hid behind Austin's leg and the other Pokémon seemed rather nervy as well. Before the floor suddenly split out a pie splattered on everyone's faces. Kikikikik. From the shadows, the shiny alpha haunter they battled in Lavender Tower emerged with Wordertle laughing on Haunter's back. Austin couldn't help but break out laughing in disbelief at the situation they were in. An hour later. After surviving Haunter's prank, Austin made his way back to the inn only to receive a call from Agatha. Your father's, Pokémon. Austin swallowed trying to digest what he had just learned. Your father. Ethan Ainsworth, Agatha pronounced. My father had left to reseal that monster you fought in Lavender Tower, and then never came home again. Austin cast a sideways glance at the door. Haunter dissipated inside the shadows lining the corridors while Pikachu was on edge since he had become a victim of Haunter's pranks. Elite 4. It's just Agatha. Agatha, what is Haunter doing here? Shouldn't he be with you? She. Pardon. Haunter is a she. Sorry, shouldn't she be with you? The ghost tower is not just home to Haunter's first master, but also home for her kin. I, 
understand. He tried. You don't. Agatha accused sharply, staring at him from the screen with her sharp hawk-like eyes. On closer look, one of her eyes seemed dead, cold a prosthetic at best to maintain her facial outlook. Her face softened soon after. And for your good, I hope you never do. Austin didn't know what to make of that statement. You still haven't answered my question. Agatha shrugged. She wants to be your Pokemon. It is not my decision. It is hers. She stared at him with a curious expression as she gazed upon Austin who had a surprised look in his eyes. Austin called out, Haunter, is this true? Haunter emerged from his shadow before placing an egg in Austin's hand. Austin looked at the egg in confusion before looking up which scared him to his core as he looked at the terrifying look on Haunter's face. Haunter burst out laughing at Austin's fear. Get used to this because raising ghost-type Pokemon is harder than handling children. See can I say, no. Austin said but Haunter smirked as she grabbed a poke ball from Austin's belt. Ah. Austin screamed as he tried to cover himself since Haunter had ripped his pants off. Ting. The sounds of a poke ball shaking caused Austin to look at the ground which had his torn pants with a poke ball shaking before it stopped. Good luck, Agatha said. Oh make paragraph. The vile musk that Gloom is infamous for is not the only scent the grass slash poison Pokemon is capable of producing. Much in the same way it can choose to spray sleep powder or stun spore, a Gloom can also activate various scents, most notably a sweet one like a Hopips which draws Pokemon near. The way this scent is used varies from Gloom to Gloom, and some say depends more on the trainer than the Pokemon. Some Gloom, if their trainer endures their smell and treats them with kindness, will release this sweet scent in their trainer's presence. Other, more mean-spirited or mistreated ones will use it to draw people close, then switch odors to its noxious smell and release fumes which often require hospitalization of all those who inhale them. Interestingly, while the noxious smell is distilled into a perfume, the sweet one is more commonly used by athletes as a deodorant. After a few hours when bottled, all that remains of the sweet fumes are its abilities to block other smells and attract wild Pokemon. Chapter Number 217 The Kingdom of Rhoda Part 1 Vermilion City Pokemon Center. Knocking on the door, Misty couldn't help but ask as her voice broke. Yellow, please come out. I am fine, Misty. A whisper called out to Misty causing her to sigh. If you say so. Inside the room, a red-eyed yellow sat besides the door with the bed sheets covering her. Odd. Dish the oddish whispered to Yellow to just smiled before her smile went away as she remembered Austin's words. Suddenly sensing something, Yellow stood up causing Dish to fall to the ground. Turning towards the window, Yellow took a deep breath as she sensed an extremely familiar presence in Vermilion City. A few centuries ago. The Kingdom of Rhoda. A once peaceful kingdom of the Kanto region is now the latest battlefield in the massive war engulfing the lands of Kanto, Johto, and Or. The Ornians were a warlike group from across the seas to the east, made up of various small tribes of warriors. When the Ornians learned of the Kanto and Johto regions across the seas, they began a brutal invasion, decimating most of Kanto in their push inland. By the time they made it beyond MT Moon, the Jodians had finally mobilized a defense, moving north from MT Silver to engage the invading armies. Unfortunately, this put the peaceful kingdom of Rhoda directly in the middle of the two rival armies. While Rhoda was far from defenseless, the bulk of the Orion's Horde and the Indigo League armies outnumbered the small standing army Rhoda could field, even with their legendary Aura Guardians. Must find Sir Aaron was the singular thought running through the mind of one of those very same Aura Guardians as he ran through the foggy mountains near the Tree of Beginning, the massive rock formation that dominated Rhoda, desperately searching for the crystals that were indigenous to the area. He was much shorter than most people assumed of an Aura Guardian, barely four feet tall, covered in black and blue fur on his limbs with a cream-colored torso. Protruding from the back of his hands and his chest were silver spikes, and his head was decidedly jackal-like with a pair of large ears, red eyes, and four small appendages hanging from the back of his head. His powerful legs carried him across the rough terrain as the sounds of impending battle echoed through the canyons and cliffs, occasionally leaping from rock to rock. Turning back down the path he came from, he closed his eyes and began focusing, the appendages on his head beginning to rise slightly. Aura is with me, he thought as his vision was replaced with a rather ghostly landscape, focusing his aura to the west, moving through canyons and hills eventually coming to overlook a massive valley filled with humans and Pokémon of every shape, from Charizard to Steelix, Agron to Skarmory. The Jodian Army. Grunting, he opened his eyes to scan his surroundings before focusing on the east with his aura. 
On the far side of the mountain marched Nido King, Nido Queen, Onyx, Tyranitar, Blastwaz, and countless other types of Pokémon, along with their human allies. Seeing that both armies were nearly within fighting distance, he growled slightly as he returned to his body. Just as he was about to continue his journey, he heard something on the wing flying towards him. Glancing up to scan the foggy skies, he spotted the silhouette of a massive red and white flying type Pokémon flying over his head, above the cliffs towards the Tree of Beginning. Before he could even think about what it meant, however, a large hound-like Pokémon bounded down the same cliff at him, causing him to backflip away. The pale horns on his head stood out from his black body and red armor. Hound Duom. Wonderful. He thought as he turned tail and continued climbing the rough territory, sensing as the Hound Duom gave chase along with a second and third at his back. Climbing to the top of the small mesa, he finally spotted what he was searching for, a small collection of blue crystals protruding from the ground. Skidding to a stop in front of them, he knelt and placed his paw on the surface of the crystal, causing it to begin lightly glowing blue. Hear me. Sir Aaron. Meanwhile, back at Cameron Palace, the capital of Rhoda, its beautiful leader, Queen Rin stared out into the foggy forests between the palace and the tree of beginning from one of the balconies. Her otherwise noble features were marred with worry and nervousness about the impending conflict in Rhoda. Long golden hair fell to nearly her knees, and her light blue and white dress complemented it perfectly. To her right, standing half a head taller than her was one of her oldest companions, Sir Aaron Erlone head of the Aura Guardians of Rhoda. Dressed in his typical garb, a simple pair of dark grey pants and shirt, his long blue vest, dark blue cloak, and signature hat, he was a handsome figure, sporting his perpetually messy dark blue hair and sapphire eyes. To the outside world, the kingdom of Rhoda seemed defenseless with King Abel leading the Rotan army to defend the city, Aaron was placed in charge of security for the palace. Left with only a token force of guards and a few Aura Guardians, Aaron was just as worried as Rin was staring out into the veil of fog and mist that held over the valley between Cameron Palace and the Tree of Beginning. Where is Lucario, he thought to himself. He had sent his apprentice into the mountains to scout hours ago and was growing more worried by the moment. I taught him everything I could, so why hasn't he sent a word yet? As if on cue, he heard a light tone behind him, causing him to turn. Spotting the light glow from the crystal formation on the balcony, he hurried over towards it, staff in hand causing his queen to turn and watch as he did so. Kneeling and placing his hand upon the formation, he was able to sense Lucario, roughly halfway up the mountain. Sir Aaron, please. He heard in his mind. What's the matter, Lucario? He asked aloud in a worried tone. The two armies are about to clash, master, and our kingdom is caught between them. Once the fighting starts, we will all be destroyed. Hearing this caused Rin to turn back towards the mountain a look of despair taking hold. When the armies reach this palace, our kingdom will fall. Hearing growls behind him, Lucario flipped away from the crystal to see the three Houndoom leap onto the mesa, glaring at him with their dark red eyes. Darting forward between them, Lucario managed to barely dodge a flamethrower attack from one before charging back towards the edge he came up from, leaping off. Dodging another flamethrower as he landed, he tried to climb the opposite cliff wall, hoping to gain some ground. Unfortunately, one of the Houndoom saw this and attacked the cliff he was clinging to with an iron tail attack, blasting part of the cliff apart with explosive force. Dust and debris were hurled into his eyes as a result, causing him to flip away and attempt to clean his eyes, to no avail. Hearing another growl, he leaped up, barely missing another flamethrower that tore through the space he just inhabited. Landing on his feet uneasily, he utilized his aura abilities and saw all three Houndoom in front of him, cornering him into the box canyon, each growling and preparing a flamethrower. Time seemed to slow as his ingrained instincts and training kicked in, leaping high into the air as the attacks hit. As he fell, he prepared attacks of his own, a pair of blue aura spheres, one in each hand. He landed between two of the dark and fire types, unleashing one into each of their heads, before raising his arms above his head and forming a third sphere, firing it at the ground in front of the third one. As he sensed the final houndoom fall, the appendages on the back of his head returned to their normal place of hanging. I will not flee the palace when the armies attack. My fate will be the same as the rest of my kingdom, she said simply, causing mild annoyance in her companion. Aaron's mind raced, thinking of how he could convince Rin to leave. But your highness, there will be no survivors. Even as he said it, he hung his head, realizing it would be futile. Omake paragraph. Typically, Pokemon used in war are large and powerful beasts. 
Although grass Pokémon have a long history of military usage, techniques like Stun Spore can be devastating with the wind at one's back, typically the grass Pokémon used were those like Venusaur, sturdy beasts who could take a hit. In the early 20th century, an innovative young general came up with the idea of using vile plume gas to break the stalemate in the trenches of the Great Pokémon War. When its sleep powder and stun spore are combined with gunpowder and its allergy-causing pollen, a devastating poison gas was created which burned off the faces of the opposition and turned the tide in the war. That general would go on to become a great conqueror, winning the election from the prestige of his invention. He was bequeathed among his territory ownership of the gym in Celadon City, which is in the hands of his great-granddaughter Erica to this day. The weapon was reverse-engineered after a few years of dramatic opposition by the nations of the world. The next decade saw many wars, but also many soldiers returning with the unbearable pain and injuries of vile plume gas, some said death was kinder. It was to ban this substance that the first international laws of war were developed, although they have since been vastly expanded beyond the original ban on vile plume. Chapter number 218 The Kingdom of Rhoda Part 2 Sir Aaron had known Rin for the past 20 years, and he knew she would sooner die than abandon her people. She was very much like her father in that respect. Aaron had no desire to abandon his people either, but he realized that this war would likely be the end of Rhoda. He thought of the countless people he had protected in the kingdom over the years. He thought of his people. He thought of his family. His pregnant wife, his son Riley, and his coming child. The only thing that can save us now is a miracle. Wait, that's it, he thought. Glancing back to the sky for a moment, he scanned the fog. Hmm. Raising his staff into the air, a cry from a giant tan bird, a pidgeot, was heard as the massive bird swooped by the balcony. And Queen Rin watched in shock as her bodyguard leapt off the balcony onto the bird's back and began heading away from the palace towards the tree of beginning. He can't be abandoning us. She thought in disbelief. As Pidgeot raced over the forests of Rhoda, Aaron's mind raced. My love, Riley. Please forgive me. What I go to do, I do for you. Sparing a glance down to his right, he saw the majority of the Jodian army, armored in red, marching around the base of the mountain to their right, and the forest to their left. To his left, he saw another army, the Oars Horde, barely making out their pale green armor in the fog. But what alarmed him were the three Skarmori breaking off towards Pidgeot and himself. Aaron could simply hold on for dear life as the three tore by, Pidgeot expertly dodging them as he continued towards his goal, the Tree of Beginning. Unfortunately, this meant its attention was elsewhere, allowing one of the Oars Skarmori to fire off a powerful flash cannon attack at the Pokémon's back nearly hurling Sir Aaron off its back in the process. Pidgeot managed to regain control briefly, returning to his original course, but the Skarmori wasn't finished yet, not wishing to have any Rotans or Jodians retreat from their conquest. Coming in quickly with a strong steel wing attack, Pidgeot was struck hard and was sent plummeting toward the rough mountainside. It struggled to regain control as it rapidly approached the ground. Aaron briefly wondered if his quest to save Rhoda would be cut short if Rhoda was destined to fall into this unwanted conflict. Pushing those thoughts to the back of his mind, he focused on the mountainside, as Pidgeot managed to give a final burst of energy to stave off a direct crash. Leaping off, the Aura Guardian decided he was close enough, hoping that the decreased weight would allow Pidgeot to land safely. Pidgeot, however, continued its unsteady course directly into a series of bushes nearby with a cry. Aaron stood and was about to continue on his way when he felt a familiar aura approaching quickly. Sprinting up the mountainside at breakneck speeds was his near-constant companion and apprentice, Lucario. Sir Aaron. He heard in his mind, realizing Lucario was close enough to use telepathy. I knew you'd come. He said as he reached the bottom of the mesa Aaron was standing on. What bothered the human, however, was the fact that Lucario had yet to open his eyes since arriving, appearing to only be using his aura to navigate. Lucario, what happened to your eyes? He asked the blue jackal. Don't worry about me, Master, was his only response. The final word though, Master, had struck a nerve with Aaron, causing him to turn away. Don't call me that. I'm no longer your master. I have abandoned the queen and the kingdom. I'll never return. Lucario froze in disbelief, shock pinning him in place. But. That's impossible. Aaron took off running, towards his original goal, the tree of beginning. Lucario finally managed to regain his motor skills and took off after his companion and master. Master, wait. He called as he ran up the slopes after him. Hearing Lucario following him, 
Aaron turned and hurled his staff into the ground, landing just in front of the Pokémon causing him to stop. Suddenly the staff began to glow bright blue and white. Clenching his teeth, Lucario stared up, eyes still closed at the other Aura Guardian. Sir Aaron! He cried out. The staff continued to glow brighter as a blue beam shot into the Pokémon's chest, causing him to also turn the color and begins to fade from sight. He felt as if he was drawn into the fist-sized crystal at the top of the staff, his vision shifting as the fractal shape of the crystal began distorting it. He was pulled further away from the surface. Why, Master? Why? Rin stared out from the ramparts of Cameron Palace towards the faint outline of the tree, feeling as if her whole world were falling apart. On the wind, she heard a strange note begin to pick up, a low, mournful wail barely on the edge of hearing. That wail. It's coming from the tree of beginning. It's crying, she realized. The fog began to break, and in the massive valley between the palace and the tree of beginning, she saw the two armies break upon each other. Why did he leave us, she thought to herself. Did he truly abandon everything he's ever known due to fear? Hearing the cry of a Pidgeot, her heart leaped as she scanned the skies, hoping that Aaron had returned. As the massive bird Pokémon landed upon the railing of the balcony, Rin's heart fell again as she noticed two things, the lack of Aaron upon Pidgeot's back, and his staff being held in Pidgeot's beak. He's had this for years. She thought, glancing sadly at the short staff. Roughly two-thirds her height, it consisted of a wooden shaft, a series of black steel rings, one circular that expanded from the shaft, and a large half-sphere that connected around the top of the first ring, similar to an equator. In the center of this was a large crystal from the Tree of Beginning, expertly cut into a 26-sided rhombicubactahedron. Completing the design was a pair of large, teardrop-shaped weights where the two rings connected, reminiscent of the appendages on Lucario's head. She remembered when he built it, years back when he still dreamed of completing his Aura Guardian training. He was so excited when he showed her and Abel the crystal that Delia had cut for him. Back when the four of them were all just friends. Back before he found Lucario, still a young Rylu. Taking the staff from Pidgeot, he returned to the skies as quickly as he came, leaving Rin with the staff and her thoughts. She saw her reflection in the light blue crystal surface, and questions with no answers appeared. Aaron. Just as she was about to give up hope and resign herself and her kingdom to its fate, she took one last look at the Tree of Beginning. And right before she accepted that all was lost, the Tree of Beginning lit up with a strange bluish-green light. As the tree continued to glow, the crystal formations began spouting the same green light into the air in powerful shafts, burning away the fog. She looked around rapidly in wonderment as the crystals that the palace was built around began to glow and release shafts of light. Could this be what Aaron went to do, she thought to herself. Maybe he didn't abandon us after all. As the light continued to grow, a massive green energy pulse worked its way from the tree of beginning, covering the valley in waves of green energy. Below, the entire battlefield froze, looking up at the shining peak. Silence spread across the land, from the peak to Cameron Palace. Humans and Pokémon alike stood in awe as the morning fog melted away from the valley and forests. He did it, she thought to herself as she felt her eyes grow misty. He did it. He saved us. As tears began to fall, she realized that Sir Aaron had gone to the Tree of Beginning to ask Mew to help her kingdom and people. She looked down on the field and saw that the battle was over, with people and Pokémon alike laying down their arms. And she silently hoped that he had managed to survive to see the miracle he'd brought his country. A few centuries after the War of Rhoda occurred, in the Kanto region, another situation had piled up as night had fallen over the Vermilion City. Knock. Knock. Misty knocked on Yellow's room a few times. It had been eight hours since she last talked to Yellow. Bringing a tray of food up to her room, Misty considered her a prehoc to talk to her friend. While she didn't know the pain of having her heart broken by someone she loved, she was still going to be there for her friend. To support and comfort her. After a few knock concern and a sense of dread, began to build up in Misty's mind. What's wrong, Misty? Brock asked as he rubbed his neck that Zubat had abused with leech life when he tried to hit on Nurse Joy. Brock, Yellow isn't opening. Maybe she is asleep. Come on, Brock you know she is a light sleeper. Hearing the concern in Misty's voice, Brock said, I am going to get Nurse Joy to open this door. She must have a spare key. Oh make paragraph. The term parasite referring to animals, Pokémon, plants and diseases that live off the nutrients of a host is derived from the Pokémon paras. As most parasites are microscopic, 
or at the very least internal and much smaller than the host, it is commonly believed by children and the undereducated that the mushrooms on Para's back soak up nutrients from the Paras. In reality, the reverse is true, they are not called mushroomites after all. Para's mushrooms are not true mushrooms, but a plant which has evolved to look like a fungus to protect themselves from predators. They can be found on their own in varying quantities, sometimes even in abundance, but there are no paras without mushrooms on their back. Paras attach these plants to their backs, leaching chlorophyll from the sun, as they are too slow and weak to find food on their own. This relationship is not, however, a wholly one-sided affair. When planted on a para's back, mushrooms are known to grow larger and spread their seeds further than when left in the ground. In truth, the term parasite is a complete misnomer, albeit one which remains in the language through established use and the lack of an alternative. Chapter number 219 to Rota. Kanto Region, Vermilion City. Pokemon Center. Creek. The door of one of the rooms slammed out as Misty and Brock alongside an annoyed yet somewhat worried Nurse Joy came to find themselves in an empty room. Whoosh. Feeling the chill of the night air, Misty turned towards the open window where she saw Doduo's feather. Oh no Misty thought as she touched the feather. Brock meanwhile picked up a note left behind by Yellow. Gazing down, Misty saw someone working in the Pokemon Center greenhouse. Hey! Did you see a little blonde girl jump off with a Doduo from this place? Hearing Misty's words Logan nodded causing Misty to ask, Did you see where she went? Logan turned and pointed south. Logan's directions caused Misty to freeze as she realized the only thing that lies south of Vermilion City, the Vermilion Airport. Brock, I think I know where Yellow went. Misty said while turning to Brock who handed her Yellow's note. And I think I know why she left. Misty blinked a few times as she read Yellow's note which read. I know you guys are not going to like this but I am going to find Ash and drag him back here until he explains why he said all those things. Misty almost dropped the note as she turned to Brock who had a grave look on his face. When was the last time you spoke to Yellow? Gulp, four and a half hours ago. Kanto Region. Vermilion Airport. Austin's POV. You can get out now, I have other places to be, the cab driver spoke quickly and had an annoyed tone in his voice. I got out of the cab, and my foot was almost run over by the taxi driver speeding away. Asshole, I muttered under my breath, and I proceeded to walk into Vermilion International Airport. I completely avoided going through baggage checking. I already had my ticket and was only carrying carry-on baggage. I went straight to TSA and had my backpack checked for any suspicious materials which had a sleeping Pikachu inside it. I had no problems getting through security, as I never packed anything that would put others in harm's well if you don't count the Pokemon I have. I headed to Gate 14, Terminal B of Dia. While sitting down in my empty seat I felt Pikachu wake up. I checked over my boarding pass. It had my name in bolded letters and my flight number on it. To think there would be a day when I would pay for my flight. I thought I had business class seats, as I didn't want to waste money to pay for first class. I smiled as I stared at the picture of Rhoda on the bottom right side of the ticket. Soon enough, the intercom lit up for the passengers to board the plane. Business class passengers, military personnel and children under the age of four years old are now welcome to board the plane. That was my cue, I stood up from my seat and headed to the desk where the flight attendants would take my ticket, and allow me to board the plane. Sir. Do you plan to board the plane today? Or are you planning on holding up the line? An impatient voice snapped me out of my thoughts. I looked at the flight attendant to who I was about to hand my ticket and shook my head, I'm sorry, I have a lot on my mind right now. Here's my ticket. As we all do, sir, but none of us plan on holding up the line as you did, the flight attendant rolled her eyes. Have a nice flight. I must have chosen the wrong day to fly out to Rota, everyone is acting as if the world hates them. I walked down the long hallway and boarded flight 218 to the Kingdom of Rhoda. I sat down in a seat next to a window and began to review what I was about to do. I'm sure that I want to do this, even if I have no choice. This is for the greater good and even if it's not, I will still benefit greatly from this trip. I sat down in 18F, I had the window seat so I wouldn't be disturbed by anyone, or so I thought. A woman and her kid walked down right next to me. The kid held an intense stare with me before turning to his mother. Mommy, I want the window seat. Hearing the voice, Austin turns to see a child intensely staring at him. The mother gave me an apologetic look, then looked down at her child. I'm sorry, Johnny, you don't always get what you want. The child started to cry because he didn't get his way. 
he had a gut feeling that the child would continue this behavior if he didn't give his window seat to him. Let the kid have the window seat, I'm fine being in the aisle seat. Pika, Pi. Come on, Pikachu won't be so stubborn to let the kid have the seat. Pika, Pi. I'll buy you ketchup and ice cream when we land. That seemed to convince Pikachu who nodded as I got up out of my seat and shimmied past the child and his mother. Just like that, the kid stopped crying and smiled victoriously. He moved to the window seat, and his mother moved to the middle. Thank you. I don't know what your name is, but thank you. It's Ash Ketchum and it's no problem. Austin suddenly realized that he had subconsciously told the woman in front of him that he was Ash Ketchum without any kind of hesitation. Maybe it was because he was so used to being called Ash but even then it still terrified him. Are you going for the Guardian of Aura tournament? Is it still being conducted? No, I just curiously asked since the tournament had ended a few months before. When will the tournament be again? I think it is annually conducted. Oh. Looks like I am going with plan B. Austin thought with a smile as Pikachu shifted his position to get more comfortable while he read the magazine in his hands. Austin felt uncomfortable as he pulled out the life orb from his pockets. Haunter had given this to his last along with a toothpaste-filled dumpling that he had puked out. I should give this to Caesar. Austin thought as he looked at the life orb. Sir, is this your seat? An air hostess asked Austin who explained his situation to her. Sir, we have a patient on board that has diabetes insipidus and he requested to be moved closer to the bathroom. If you don't have a problem, would you please change your seats with him? Austin looked at Pikachu who didn't have a problem with it before replying. Austin and the middle-aged man quickly changed seats. The hostess was kind enough to escort Austin to his new seat. Austin froze as he gazed at the person sitting next to his new seat. Well, fuck. Left jab, block high, right uppercut, block mid, snap kick right, dodge back. Inside the training fields of Cameron Palace, two combatants fought against each other using only their bare hands and feet, aura, and instinct. The taller of the two had messy dark blue hair in a similar style to his younger brother, a solid build, and wore a uniform very reminiscent of his father, minus the boots, gloves, and hat at the moment. Riley, Aura Guardian, and Knight of Rhoda. And while he was taller and had a good 30 pounds on his sparring partner, no one else in Rhoda had any intention of going toe to paw with his sparring partner. His opponent was shorter than him by a good two heads, but what he lacked in height, he made up for it in speed and strength. Blue fur covered most of his arms, thighs, and tail, while shorter black fur covered his lower legs and front paws. Longer, cream-colored fur protected his torso. The spikes protruding from the back of his front paws and his chest, along with his red eyes and jackal-like head added to his intimidating nature. Not many people would willingly spar with a Pokemon, let alone a fighting-slash-steel type, but Lucario and Riley had been doing so for years, ever since Riley began his training to become a Knight of Rota as his talents for Aura were discovered by the Council. He was about to continue when he heard clapping, turning his attention to the young blonde woman in a pink dress walking across the training field. An excellent showing as always. Riley, Lucario. With a pleasant smile, Princess Eileen came to stand in front of the duo. I apologize for watching your training. My mother asked me to find you, and... Well, whenever I see you two sparring, it's just such a beautifully choreographed show. Like a dance, so I, uh, didn't want to interrupt, she finished, turning slightly pink, smiling sheepishly. Lucario smirked and Riley chuckled lightly. Except for dancing. If you miss a step someone steps on your toe. In sparring, if you miss a step you get a broken nose. So, what does Queen Rin require of us? Having grown up alongside the princess, he was one of the few people who could easily speak to her as an equal. Most other people in the kingdom just knew of the regal princess Eileen and her aura guardian Sir Riley. Very few ever saw them arguing about toys, or who won their latest bet growing up, or laughing over what one of their friends did. They both lost their fathers during the War of Cipher, and growing up together meant that titles weren't considered much, being their mothers had been such good friends for years. Still smiling, although her face had returned to its normal color, Eileen continued. She'd like to speak with you both later today. Representatives from the region of Sinnoh arrived earlier, so I can only assume it has something to do with them. Riley and Lucario both nodded. All right, we'll be up to the throne room after I grab a bath. Can't exactly greet dignitaries when I smell like a grimer, can I? Riley asked with a smirk, inciting a light giggle from Eileen and an eye roll and smirk from Lucario. 
Omega Paragraph In battle, Parasect uses their spores to put their opponents to sleep. This is a fairly powerful technique, but not a perfect one, most Pokemon are light sleepers, and the excitement of a battle and pain of enemy attacks will awaken even a Snorlax. Humans are not so immune to Parasect's spores. Although the modern era has seen better sleep aids refined, insomniacs around the world have traditionally used Pokemon in this capacity. And while sleep powder is common among all grass and bug Pokemon, it is not especially useful, at times it does nothing, and typically these powders offer only enough sleep for a long nap. Parasect spore is far more effective, and the problem with it typically falls on the other end, the especially deep sleep it produces usually involves oversleeping for an hour or two. At times, people have been known to miss entire days or even fall into years-long comas after inhaling too many spores. Despite these risks, Parasect spores were still dominant even in the cities of Kanto until this generation, and many older men and women continue to swear by them to this day. Chapter number 220 The Tree of Life Sino Region, Herd Herd or the Hiswian Institute of Research and Development was one of the most prestigious institutions in the entire world. After defeating the Elite Four and Ace Trainers, Cynthia had gotten enough free time to go back to her studies so she could get her Ph.D. Ever since she was little her obsession with research was unprecedented so her grandma took it into her hands to begin her homeschooling. On the battlefield she was champion Cynthia so with the help of her precious cloaking stone she was able to continue her studies while not being bothered at all. I'd like to draw your attention to this cave painting. Cynthia looked up from her notebook and was startled in surprise. She recognized the image on the projector screen it was from the ruins behind her house, the painting her grandmother had shown her when she was a girl. Three lights, each slightly elongated to suggest the shape of a creature, are arranged in a triangle around a larger light. You may have seen this before the original is in Celestic Town, but it's a fairly popular piece to reproduce for museums, the professor went on. His mouth quirked a very slight smirk before he asked, Can anyone tell me what it represents? Cynthia's hand shot up immediately. She faithfully recounted her grandmother's explanation, The three lights represent the Trinity. The professor's smirk grew to a full grin. Yes, that's the popular interpretation. The three lights represent Uxie, Mespri, and Azelf, the lake spirits commonly worshipped today. He waved an arm languidly. If you look this picture up on the internet or visit Celestic Town yourself, that's what it'll say, early depiction of the Trinity. So. The class jumped at the professor's sudden rise in volume. He leaned back against the wall and looked up at the projector screen with exaggerated curiosity. Can someone tell me? He gestured to the points of the triangle and looked back at the class with a wry smirk. Where's his elf in this picture? The room went silent for a full second. One student half raised her hand, hesitantly, but the professor ignored her to bellow, you can't tell. They're all just blobs, right? So, how do we know this is depicting the Trinity? Well actually, we don't. His expression suddenly turned serious, and he stamped his hands on his desk for emphasis. This is the most important thing you are going to learn in this class, the professor intoned. If you take away nothing else, remember this, interpretation is shaped by pre-existing beliefs. The Lake Trinity is what we're familiar with, so we interpret everything through that lens. We see three blobby things in a painting from a thousand years ago and assume that of course, they must be the three things we care about now. But we have nothing to back that up. The professor clicked ahead a slide. The number three comes up a lot in mythology. Nearly every region has a mythic trinity of some kind. A Cantonian would look at this and say, clearly this is our trinity, Moltres, Artie Kuno, and Zapdos. A Jotunin would say, are you crazy? That's Entei, Suakun, and Ray Kao different. A few students laughed, and the professor joined them. Yes, you see now how silly it is to make assumptions. Kanto and Johto are still arguing to this day over their respective trinities that are different forms of the same creatures, no better demonstrated than with Suakun and Artie Kuno clearly summer and winter forms of the same Pokemon. But the professor raised a finger and smiled condescendingly. Do you think that might have something to do with the fact Kanto and Johto have almost no Pokemon that take multiple forms? After a moment, he continued, something blindingly obvious can be misinterpreted or missed entirely because a particular culture insists on viewing it through an inaccurate lens. No one in Kanto and Johto today disputes the fact that Pokemon are capable of different forms but they don't reconsider assumptions inherited from a time when no one knew that. He clicked to the next slide, which contained a smaller crop of the painting and a large number of three. Why don't we put the question to you, now? 
Can you think of other threes? I wonder what Austin is doing right now. Last time he told me he was going to Rhoda to meet a friend. Cynthia thought before smiling as her attention was brought back to the professor. It was a sunny afternoon in the kingdom of Rhoda as the plane landed at the airport. Austin walked down through the airport while adjusting his yellow overcoat which caused Pikachu to grab onto his black turtle neck. Pikachu suddenly jumped onto the suitcase to use it as a ride while looking at his trainer in concern. Looking back, Pikachu gazed at Yellow who was intensely staring at the back of Austin's head. People stared at Austin weirdly as he brushed his hair aside which seemed to have grown longer. Then again you don't normally see a ten-year-old smoking. Sir, you shouldn't smoke. One of the airport staff said. Oh, is this a non-smoking area? No. Then there is no problem. Austin replied as he left the dumbfounded airport staff member. Ash, that's rude and Uncle Wilton says smoking is bad for you, Yellow said while Austin chose to ignore her. The Tree of Beginning was Rhoda's important artifact in the whole kingdom. Some people think that it's a very tall typical tree. Others believe that it's not an ordinary tree. Well, they're right. It's made out of crystals. Yes, crystals. All of the crystals feed upon sunlight. No one knows why. Austin entered the in-room which didn't have as much surveillance as a Pokemon center. It wasn't anything special but the inner decor reminded him of the medieval European rooms shown in the movies. Pika, Pi. Yeah, yeah I remember. Let's go get your disgusting dish. Pika. Outside of Austin's room, a small yellow Piku stared at Austin with confusion visible on her face. Piku jumped down in midair she transformed into a Pidgey before flying away while thinking. What is Arceus's chosen doing here? Mew thought while glancing back. Hmm, looks like he's not awakened yet but who dared to destroy the aura paths of the chosen one? Pikachu glanced out the window as he felt that someone was just watching them. Come on, buddy. Let's try out the local cuisines. Pika, pie. Knock. Knock. Austin went to check who was at the door before stopping. Ash, can I stay with you? Yellow asked as she fidget while holding onto her staff hat. So I spent all my money to get that ticket and I left my wallet in Vermilion. I don't want to call Misty and Brock. Sigh. Creek. Kingdom of Rhoda, L.E. Polydor. L.E. Polydor, a famous restaurant in the Kingdom of Rhoda, was built about 200 years ago by the famous Chief Gordon of Galur. Austin read through the pamphlet while a few people stared at them. Pikachu and everyone were enjoying their meals while Austin placed the pamphlet down before continuing where he left off. Yellow was constantly glancing at Austin with a blush on her face since this was like a date that she had watched in the movies. Coupled with the fact that Austin's had gotten even cooler in Yellow's eyes. One of the waiters asked her colleague. Shouldn't that young trainer have a limit of six Pokemon with him? Yeah, but I heard from Steven that they had someone high-ranking from the Pokemon League. Oh, that explains why Steven was so frightened but how can someone so young be a high-ranking member? Maybe he's just naturally dwarf. Yeah, that explains it. For I second I thought that a ten-year-old was smoking in front of me. Then is the girl with him, his daughter or something? Maybe but shouldn't we say something to him? Nah, didn't you hear what Steven said that we shouldn't bother him? Must be some high-class trainer if Steven is so willing to kiss his ass. Austin meanwhile was so focused on the book on the Tree of Life that he didn't realize that people were looking at him and his Pokemon who while weirded out by the stare chose to follow their trainer's example in not caring. Yellow meanwhile was lost in her daydreaming to care. The Tree of Life is the most sacred place to the people of Rhoda. Normal people aren't allowed to get close to this holy site unless the queen herself allows it. Legend says the chosen Ashura of the sacred flames of God will come to unite the tree of life and unite the world. As Austin read this, his mind flashed to the legend spoken about in the second Pokemon movie. Suddenly a waiter came with a plate consisting of two small steak medallions with a scallion sauce and a few roasted vegetables. Austin's and Yellow's mouths watered at the dish in front of anything else. Anything else, sir? No, thank you. Austin and Yellow replied at the same time. Oh make paragraph. Fuchsia City has never followed a foreign policy of true neutrality, such a thing would interfere with the profits of the dominant Koga clan of ninjas. Despite this, its rulers have sought to stay out of direct conflicts, preferring assassination to war and abandoning alliances when they placed their home city in danger. Even where its foreign policy is more activist, however, few would attack such a city. Fuchsia is a compound of armed ninjas disguised as a small provincial town, with connections to the powerful Pokemon of the Safari Zone. 
And yet when war did come to Fuchsia a horrific war that took the lives of 30% of the last generation across the Pokemon world it was not the powerful Pokemon that saved them, but the Venonat, a Pokemon regarded at the time as a household pest. When the invisible airship fleet approached as every child of Fuchsia knows, but as precious few do elsewhere the Venonat's powerful compound eyes made the fleet no less visible to them than a flock of Charizard. They scattered around the city, alerted trainers through elaborate gestures, and pointed with their antennae to the invisible enemy. One volley of attacks ninja and Pokemon alike and the stealth fighters which were not downed instantly scattered in panic. Never again would Fuchsia City be attacked in the war, both sides realized that it could not be taken, even by surprise. The Venonat, for their part, became the city's symbol, so beloved that none would ever lack food within its wooden walls. The gym leader at the time demoted a mook from his lineup in favor of a Venonat and gained in popularity what he lost in strength, as for strength, it soon evolved anyway. Chapter number 221 Legendary Confrontation Kingdom of Rhoda, in room. That was amazing. Where are we going next? Yellow asked innocently as she played with Tenti. Yellow, what are you doing here? Well, I am visiting my parents. Parents? Austin thought while narrowing his eyes at Yellow. So where are we exactly? Yellow started sweating at her friend's question as her eyes moved from place to place before fixing on the small glass Pikachu statue. W, we are at the Orange Archipelago. Seeing Austin's stoic face, Yellow raised her hands into thumbs. Austin meanwhile pinched the bridge of his eyebrows before sighing. She is really bad at lying. Kanto Region, Celadon City. Green had a big grin as she sat on a tree branch, her jigglypuff next to her while she was drinking some soda. That hits the spot. She said with a satisfied sigh. It's been a tough few weeks for her, ever since she met that boy with the Pikachu on the SS. And and after Team Rocket's attack, she was almost captured by the authorities when they began searching everyone's identities. Thank Mew that Ash's friends were able to vouch for her. Just thinking about that made her frown yet there was a small smile hidden within. She remembered how she first met him and how her pride as a thief was damaged from being pickpocketed by somebody who wasn't a thief. She knew he wasn't a thief because while she lost 1,000 poke dollars from the transaction, he did pay for the fake items, but she wasn't used to being the one ripped off. Just having a picture of a legendary is worth millions, but a picture of a Johto legendary in Kanto? Priceless. She had sold it for $7 million to some researcher known as Bill. I suppose I should thank you, Ash but you felt me up so I guess we are even, Green said remembering him with a warm smile while Jiggly looked up at her. This will make my goal easier. Puff. Jiggly asked making Green look down. Oh, it's nothing Jiggly, just thinking out loud. Green dismissed the concern with a smile. Gee. Jiggly didn't look too convinced before Green looked to see another sucker just waiting to be ripped off. Quickly making a plan of how to do this, Green got ready by sending another Pokemon out. Showtime Diddy. Kingdom of Rhoda. A torrent of falling stars was galloping through the starry sky. Celestial bodies intertwining in an ephemeral dance. Austin along with Pikachu on Pidgeot's back did their hardest to brand it into their memories. However, such idyllic beauty was too much for their minds or eyes to fully register, as they could only gaze upon the spectacle before them, mouth agape, and failing to put words on the alluring and enchanting meteor shower. Haunter smiled with nostalgia from behind Austin as she remembered all the times she saw such a beautiful dance in the sky during Ethan Ainsworth's travels. Clefable held Mana within his hands as they floated with the help of gravity alongside their trainer who held the dark crystal device. Enveloped by dark type energy, Austin and the others were practically invisible as they flew in the night toward the sacred place of the kingdom of Rhoda. Many believed the tree of life or tree of beginning was an ancient prehistoric plant but it is a rock formation that appears to be a gigantic tree. The tree of beginning or tree of life is a living organism made up of crystals that have a symbiotic connection with a mew that lives within it. The Tree of Beginning forms a pristine ecosystem of many kinds of ancient Pokémon thought to be extinct. It has a circulatory system of sorts that distributes nutrients to the crystals throughout its body. It also has a complex antibody system that takes the form of fossil Pokémon that attack humans and machines within it, as well as guardians in the form of the legendary Titans. Austin ordered Pidgeot to land on the hill as the surrounding mist parted revealing a jaw-dropping environment. Azure crystals decorated the land in a beauty that was difficult to describe in words. Austin gulped as his heart began to beat faster and faster. He was truly at the tree of beginning. Ting. Austin threw out all his pokeballs as everyone appeared in a flash of light. Many looked in awe at the divine environment all around them. Cough. 
Austin's cough broke everyone out of their days as they began to use power-up moves. Austin knew that the legendary titans protected this place and if he wants to get his hands on the Time Flower then he will have to confront them. Up in the air, Mew frowned as she gazed upon Austin and his Pokémon whose aura began to change as everyone began to use power-up moves. This shift in aura was felt by everyone in the entire Tree of Beginning. Beneath the earth, beasts lay dormant. Sealed away centuries prior, this manifestation of stone, ice and steel quiesced before the tides of history and technology. The titans eroded not, however. Its master and creator allowed no flaws in such an enviable design. But, separated from use and purpose, it stood in this deserted cavity. At first, hours passed. Then days. Weeks. Months. Years. Decades. Centuries. These beasts absorbed the eternal silence, surrounded in darkness. Waiting for the moment to fulfill their duty. Un un un. Un un. Squadrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
giving him the appearance of nobility from the Sino region. His purple hair was cut at shoulder length and fell in waves around his neck. At his side was a yellow and brown humanoid-shaped Pokémon with a skeletal appearance, a large mustache, a large head, and a spoon in each hand. Lucian and his ally Kazam, Sinoa's tactical geniuses. While Rota was famous for their Aura Guardians, peerless warriors capable of wielding the abilities of Aura, Sinoa was famous for their tacticians, and trainers capable of using advanced strategies in single battles or massive wars. Able to succeed with weaker Pokémon by using clever traps and combinations, Pokémon tacticians were dangerous opponents to go against. And Lucian was well known even as far out as Rota, his reputation as a master tactician preceding him. As he and his companion bowed and prepared to leave, Queen Rin spoke up. Feel free to explore the palace during your time here. The gardens are particularly relaxing this time of year. Answering with a gracious smile, Lucian and Alakazam thanked her again for her hospitality before heading back toward their room. You're putting much on your assumption that these Aura Guardians will help us in our request. What if they decline? Alakazam asked his friend telepathically as he hovered alongside him down the hall. Sighing, Lucian answered, It doesn't matter, the Berlitz house is slowly losing its influence in the land of Sinnoh and we need to ally with the Kingdom of Rhoda or the Pokemon League will become bolder and bolder when influencing the decisions of the royal house. Especially now with that Cynthia brat as the champion. And if it leads to a civil war then the House of Berlitz is finished he finished privately to himself as he knew that the Pokemon League's influence was overriding the influences of the noble families and in a matter of a few years the Pokemon League will become the dominant superpower of the world. Sighing again and rubbing his head, he and Alakazam had made it to the hall where their suite was located. And as he drew closer to a said suite, he began hearing sounds of, something. Probably night's training, or the cook complaining about something, he thought to himself, dismissing it. Suddenly Alakazam's eyes glowed as he erected a psychic barrier all around him and his trainer. Lucian's eyes widened as he looked up to see the giant mushroom cloud near the Tree of Life. Alakazam. Alakazam's spoons glowed with psychic energy as the duo was teleported to the Queen's room which was filled with knights. The Pokémon growled at Lucian but Riley was quick to stop them. Your Majesty. Yes, I know Sir Lucian. Someone has dared to attack the Tree of Life. We just sent out the knights immediately. One of the ministers shouted out as many of them were of the same viewpoint. The Tree of Life is the sacred place to the Kingdom of Rhoda. That we must do, Sir Riley gather your finest men and take them to the Tree of Life. Sir Arthur, take your men to protect the people. Yes, Your Majesty. The knights shouted out as Lucian stepped up to say, Your Majesty if it isn't a problem with you. I would like to offer my services in apprehending the criminals. Many people in the room glared at Lucian. How dare some outsider ask to visit the Holy Land? Your services will be appreciated, Sir Lucian. The people in the room were shocked by the Queen's decisions but no one dared to object. Let's go, Riley said to Lucian who nodded as Alakazam's eyes glowed with psychic energy before they disappeared in a flash of light. Omake Paragraph Although now far better known as an arcade standby, the pastime of whacking Diglett over the head has a much longer history. Diglett is a remarkably quick Pokémon, prone to surfacing their heads and lowering them at an extremely fast rate. Because of this, children since ancient times have used long sticks to hit them as they surface as a test of their reflexes, competing among one another to see who could hit the most in a set time frame, typically playing until all the diglet were knocked out. The arena trap ability possessed by this Pokémon made the, often terrified or injured, diglet unwittingly force them to stay until one of them was knocked out. Soon after their invention, pokeballs were added to the ends of the mallets, and the Wacky Diglett game became a popular and dangerous method for young people near Diglett Cave to catch themselves a starting Pokémon, the Diglett often whacked back. As the world entered a less harsh age, the game began to die out. Pokeballs attached to mallets continued to be a common way of catching wild Diglett, but the test of reflexes against a whole horde was virtually extinct. The introduction of foam and rubber to Kanto saw a brief revival of the game's fortunes, but the modern era also saw a population decline in the area as people moved from the outskirts of the cave to Viridian and Vermilion cities, along with a greater amount of options for entertainment. Indeed, the Diglett game had almost died out entirely again, until an enterprising old inventor nostalgic for a lost childhood game turned it into an arcade hit as popular as Pokemon Pinball. Today, Diglett again must fear being whacked, as legions of arcade goers have ventured to their cave to try out the real thing. Chapter number 223 vs The Legendary Titans Tree of Life Boom
A giant dust cloud covered the land in a veil as something red shot out of the dust cloud. In the path of the red projectile, stood a large golem-like Pokémon made of brown and orange rocks and it had a pattern of seven orange dots on its face that resembles a capital letter H. It has long arms with jutting shoulders and club-like hands without fingers. There is a line of orange rocky spines running down its back and its legs are short in comparison to its body. Caesar outstretched his claw into a bullet punch. In response, Regirock raised its arm which glowed with orange light. Caesar's bullet punch met with Regirock's move superpower. Boom! The sound of an explosion echoed through the land as the ground beneath Caesar's feet was reduced to a crater. Even after using Swords Dance over twenty times, Caesar barely managed to match the power of the legendary titan whose yellow dots glowed. Caesar's eyes showed the pain it was going through as cracks formed on its metallic armor. If Caesar was alone then he would have been killed by the legendary titan but luckily he wasn't alone. Caesar's body glowed with a green aura as he used every last bit of energy he had going through his chaotic body to use U-turn and bullet punch at the same time. The sound of a gunshot echoed through the land as Regirock was pushed back while Caesar returned to his poke ball. Regirock's yellow dots flickered right before Bulbasaur's solar beam engulfed him. A dust covered the area Regirock was standing on right before Wardertal's surf came in. RWRR. Charm Leon growled as his body erupted in a crimson aura. Psychic energy wrapped around his mind as Mana helped Charm Leon to not lose his mind to chaotic draconic energy. Charm Leon used Dragon Rush in conjunction with Outrage as the draconic energy surrounding his body formed into a giant crimson dragon head. Charm Leon rushed towards the large legendary steel-type Pokémon whose body was spherical and grey while the middle of its face has the appearance of being exposed as it shows black skin and is surrounded by raised metal. Registeel's lower half is disc-like in shape and has two cylindrical legs without toes. Its face consists of seven red dots in a hexagonal formation and it has black arms with three fingers each that are connected to its upper half by grey hemispheres. The backs of its hands have three red triangles pointing away from the fingers. Regis Teal puts its arms together and creates a silver ball of energy as the Steel Titan fired flash cannon toward the incoming dragon. In response, Butterfree who had been powered by 20 quiver dances, and Shed Ninja who had been powered by 20 sword dances both fired a white beam of energy at the Regis Teal. The combined solar beam of Shed Ninja and Butterfree was enough to stop Regis Teal's flash cannon as Charmeleon's outrage dragon rush engulfed Regis Teal. The dust quickly settled revealing Charmeleon using Regis Teal's face as a platform. Charm Leon smirked at Regis Teal before saying, What was that thing my human likes to say? To infinity and beyond. Charm Leon's legs bulged as he used all his strength to launch himself up in the air causing Regis Teal to tip over. Firo. Firo glared at Regis Teal as he clawed the air in front of him revealing a bright blue portal. Mirror move, bitch. Firo shouted out as a flash cannon blasted out from the mirror move portal. Butterfree and Charm Leon sweat dropped at Firo's joy as he cursed out the legendary titan meanwhile Shed Ninja ominously stared forward which caused Butterfree to back away a little. Guys, set up plan B Austin's voice telepathically called out via Muna. Crack. Boom. The once rocky terrain had turned into a frozen wasteland as Pikachu blasted through a giant beam of ice. Pika, Pika. Black clouds with white lightning wrapped around Pikachu's body like the armor as he drilled through Regis' blizzard with Volt Tackle. Pikachu's stormy volt tackle had one target which was a large, blue Pokemon composed of solid Antarctic ice. Its body was comprised of angular crystal-like shapes and its face has an unusual pattern consisting of seven yellow dots in A-plus formation. It had four spikes on its back and its two legs are conical and it balances its entire body on its points. There are three fingers on each of its pentagonal arms. The floating titan of ice raised its arm as it gathered energy into a yellow-orange orb. Suddenly from above Regis. A floating Krabby shot out with an Aqua Jet. Krabby's Aqua Jet was engulfed by the gravitational energy of Clefable who held himself up in the air alongside Muna and Austin who had a grim look in their eyes. Caesar's condition had caused Austin's heart to ache in pain for putting his buddy through such pain. Regis's hyper beam was interrupted by Krabby's Aqua Jet was about to hit Regis's body but in a split second, Regis stopped its hyper beam as it raised its arm in the arm before firing an ice beam that looked like a blizzard in terms of appearance. Krabby's Aquajet began to freeze as Krabby's Ice Aquajet hit Regis who stopped the entire Aquajet which was pure brute strength. Austin's jaw dropped as he saw Regis holding the entire pillar of Ice Aquajet with one arm while the other fired Blizzard at Pikachu. Boom! A white streak began to diffract from the Ice Aquajet as chunks of ice blasted out revealing Krabby's body evolving into a bigger Pokemon with a strong shell covering the outside of its body, featuring a red upper half and a light tan lower half. Its upper half was topped with six tall, 
thin spikes that resemble a crown. Its light tan arms are also connected to its upper body. Its lower half doubles as its jaw with six fangs overlapping its upper body. Its two outer fangs are much larger than the inner four and are roughly half as tall as Kingler's entire body. Its hips visibly protrude from its lower body and connect to its four long, thin legs. Each leg has a single, claw-like foot. Kingler's main features are its orange pincers. Kingler's left arm glowed white. Just as Regis was about to stop Kingler's hammer arm, Pidgeot shot an aerial wing at Regis hitting it across its face. Kingler's hammer arm pushed the legendary Titan of Ice further down as Pikachu's Stormy Volt tackle engulfed it. Omake Paragraph Some say that four Don Fan atop a Tortera are the pillars on which the world rests. In reality, it is the Dugtrio which have the best claim to this title. Dugtrio, like Diglett, has long been believed to be rodents, based on their small height, faces, and claws, the latter revealed only for certain attacks. At times, they appear to defy the laws of physics, even when released indoors or in midair, they materialize on the ground, a small head poking out of the surface. Ancient philosophers have speculated on what was beneath the surface, but digging only met with ferocious hostility and earthquakes, so no such information could be confirmed. Recent geological advances have revealed Dugtrio to be a Pokémon so enormous it dwarfs Wailard, one whose rounded pillar-shaped body reaches into the Earth's mantle, and those seen above the surface are a tiny fraction of the species whole. They are as common meters below the surface as Rattata on land or Zubat in caves. It is only their narrow width that prevents massive earthquakes every time one is caught. When too many are captured, earthquakes do occur, and when angered or in battle, Dugtrio often create their small quake, one typically too weak to topple buildings. Together, they have frequently used this enormous, earthquake-causing size as a weapon. Cities that dug too carelessly and deep for mineral wealth, without any concern for Pokémon or environmental damage, have often found themselves buried in the very ground they sought to dig up, trapped forever for the sin of angering the Dugtrio. Chapter number 224 The Staff of Aaron Up in the air, Austin stared gravely at his team as they struggled against the legendary Titans. Even after using so many power-up moves, they could barely contend with the Titans. Which made Austin wonder if these Titans were so powerful then how powerful were the more dangerous legendary Pokémons. Shaking his head out of his thoughts, Austin asked, How much more time is it going to take Haunter? She says she is going as fast as possible. Tell her to hurry up or we are all going to be six feet under. Sorry, I am worried for everyone. I understand but you have to be patient. Breath in. Breath out. Oh, no. Is something wrong Mana? I can feel that some people are coming towards us. Well, shit. Tell Clefable and Pidgeot to get ready. Austin's telepathic message was conveyed to Pidgeot and Clefable who immediately took action. Clefable's body glowed pink as he shrank down with Minimize while Pidgeot let out a thunderous call that alerted everyone. Haunter, found it. Muna telepathically shouted out as Austin nodded with a giant smirk on his face. Muna's eyes glowed with a green aura as the stone held within Austin's hand began to distort before Muna's move item swap teleport the position of the two objects. Austin gulped as he gazed upon the bluish-pink crystalline cocoon-like flower in his hands. The Time Flower Clefable and Muna looked at the Time Flower with interest but quickly shot down that interest as Austin put the flower in his backpack. Bulbasaur, Wardertle, and the others quickly returned to their Pokeballs while Pikachu hopped onto Pidgeot's back. Butterfree used Baton Pass while transferring all of its power to Clefable. Clefable repeatedly hits his stomach with his hands as white ripples were created with each hit, maximizing his attack power in exchange for half of his health. Clefable's eyes glowed with a psychic aura as he released stored power onto the legendary titans who were charging up Hyper Beam. The Hyper Beam of the legendary titans clashed against the wave of psychic energy that caused an orb of white to form in the middle of the sky that exploded out in a flash of light that covered the entire sky in an orange hue. Leaving the Tree of Beginnings with a sonic boom was Austin on the back of Pidgeot with Clefable's gravity keeping everyone safe. Austin glanced at his pocket as he rubbed the head of the minimized Clefable. Couldn't have done it without you, buddy. Glancing out of the walls of Cameron Castle, Queen Rin and Princess Eileen gasped as they saw the beautiful night sky covered in an orange hue. The people of Rhoda looked at the night sky. Some took this as a sign of the apocalypse approaching. Some considered it as a signal from the gods and some even considered it to be the sign of the birth of a new aura guardian. But one thing was for certain, the people of Rhoda were confused. Boom. Boom. Something fast, extremely fast moved through the sky of Rhoda as winds blasted through the entire city. 
The thunderous sound caused many people to hide in fear while many scrambled away in fear. The senior aura guardians of Cameron Castle were on high alert and perceived something flying towards them at high speeds. The high towers of Cameron Castle were blasted away by crescents of air as everyone was alerted to the northern side of the castle. Cameron Castle Your Majesty and Princess Eileen, please retreat to the safe room. The aura guardians will immediately handle the situation. One of the older knights called out as he felt the aura of a Pidgeot. It was fast, extremely fast. As some of the guards and servants escorted the queen and princess out of the room. Someone go get the Sinonian princess, she is in the great hallway Princess Eileen commanded as a few guards bowed and ran out of the room. It took a few minutes for the guards to get to the great hallway but what they came across shocked them to their core. A giant hole had been blasted through the wall while the Sinonian princess was left unconscious alongside a ponita. This can't be. One of the guards shouted out as he pointed upwards to the giant painting of the great aura guardian Aaron. Everyone knew that beneath the painting lay the aura guardian's staff which was now gone as if it had vanished into thin air. Cameron Castle, Northern Side The elder aura guardian had made it to the northern side as he gazed upon the hundreds of Pokemon writhing on the floor alongside his men. The aura is with me. The elder aura guardian outstretched his aura senses to find the location of the assailant only to find no one. The assailant that had attacked the northern side was gone. Just what was his slash her purpose for this attack? Tree of Beginning Up in the air, Lucian and Alakazam frowned as they examined the place. Did you find anything? Lucian asked his tea. Starter. Not much but one thing is for sure, whoever came to this place certainly knocks how to cover their tracks. Can't you track the Pokemon who released his abundant amount of psychic energy? Can't do Lucian. The psychic trail immediately cuts off after a few meters away. Shouldn't that be impossible? It should be impossible but somehow someone did just that. Riley and his team outstretched their aura senses to cover the land all around them. When they came here. All they found was a battlefield filled with trenches, ice, and flames. The land had been changed forever by the brief skirmish that had happened. Sir Riley, should we let that outsider onto his sacred land? You have heard the Queen's orders. Now isn't the time to be thinking about anything else other than finding out, who dared to destroy this sacred land. Riley shouted out as he outstretched his aura sensing more and more only for it to pick up the attention of something. Riley found himself in the presence of the legendary titans whose majestic aura warped images into Riley's mind as he found himself in three places at the same time. A giant sandstorm with Regis rock walking out of it. A giant snowstorm with Regis floating through it. A giant steel temple with Regis teal standing at its doors. To these legendary titans, Riley was nothing but an insect that wasn't much danger to the tree of life. Riley meanwhile bowed to the titans in fear. Omake paragraph. When Meowth and its payday attack were first discovered, it prompted a flurry of speculation so great it threatened to collapse the world's economy. The idea that a Pokemon, even a rare one, could produce coins identical to those minted by governments from silver and gold mined at great expense was enough to trigger a period of lost savings and desperate purchases and massive inflation. Wealthy business interests and governments battled over Meowth's habitat, seeking a Pokemon worth more than its weight in gold. They were fighting for nothing. Payday indeed produces money, but it is a small amount, not a world-breaking one. Meowth is a high-maintenance Pokemon with large appetites but was this the only issue, Meowth Gold would still be a profitable enterprise on PAR with Farming Multank. Those who attempted this enterprise soon found a far more damning issue, Kleptomania. Meowth produce coins but they are also drawn to them. Shiny and round objects have been known to attract them from miles away for them to steal and add to their hoard. Few of these stashes have ever been found by trainers, and they typically steal far more than they create, and from their trainers before their neighbors. Most Meowth farmers went bankrupt, while a few learned to keep their Pokemon on a leash and watch its front paws and hide their own money for good measure. These lessons have been passed down to every Meowth trainer today, and most who use them can break even based on the battling income they provide but the very idea of investing in Meowth remains a synonym for self-destructive foolishness to this day. Chapter number 225 Lucario Kingdom of Rhoda Deep within the mountains surrounding the city of Rhoda, a cave was being heavily protected by a group of Pokémon. Outside the cave, Clefable healed Caesar with the move Life Do while Pikachu gagged at the smell of the healing cream Austin had rubbed on Caesar's wounds. Firo sneered at Caesar to which the pincer Pokémon glared back. Pidgeot hit Firo's head with her wing. P.I.D. Firo glared at Pidgeot before angrily screaming out. Firo. Bulbasaur outstretched his vines to separate the glaring avian duo. 
while Charm Leon and Kingler stared blankly at Wordertle and Ninjask who were having a dance competition. Shed Ninja floated creepily as it stared at the mountains blankly. Ignoring the banter between his Pokémon, Austin gazed upon the staff that was roughly two-thirds his height, it consisted of a wooden shaft, a series of black steel rings, one circular that expanded from the shaft, and a large half-sphere that connected around the top of the first ring, similar to an equator. In the center of this was a large crystal from the Tree of Life, expertly cut into a 26-sided rhombicubactahedron. Completing the design was a pair of large, teardrop-shaped weights where the two rings connected, reminiscent of the appendages on Lucario's head. As soon as Austin grasped the staff, the small cave they stood in began glowing bright blue. Everyone rushed towards their trainer as they saw the staff shaking so violently. The light was so blindingly white it seared their eyes. Austin turned the staff away from them, even though he was certain it wasn't going to erupt. His paranoia when it came to the safety of his Pokémon kicked out the logical part of Austin's mind. Get away! Austin shouted absent-mindedly. I will stop you. And then it did explode, but not in the way Austin expected. He was thrown backward as Caesar was quick to catch him while a beam of energy shot out of the end of the staff. It coalesced into an upright Canaday shape, almost mistakably humanoid saves for the ears and tail. Then with a blink, the white light shimmered away, leaving a black and blue furred Pokémon kneeling in front of them all. It lurched up with eyes still squeezed tightly shut. Sir Aaron. It whirled on the spot, its voice echoing startlingly through the minds of everyone present. Austin wondered how it whirled about, it had to be blind even though he was certain Lucario wasn't blind in the movies. Austin backed away a little especially since he didn't like how the air seemed to shiver around Lucario's paws. I found you. Wait. Austin cried out, only just rolling out of the way before the Pokémon pounced upon him. The ground beneath cracked as Caesar blocked Lucario's attack. Fighting through the pain, Caesar launched Lucario back a little who seemed to get more furious due to the intervention. Your goons won't stop me. Echoed more bodiless words. You will not win this, Sir Aaron. You've grown soft in your complacency. I will end your treachery. I will end you. Gulp, sorry about this in advance. Austin said as he snapped his fingers before a giant cloud of chemicals was released by both Bulbasaur and Butterfree. Lucario ignored chemical warfare as he lunged toward Austin. Shed Ninja. Screech. Lucario jumped a little as he heard the scream before he saw Shed Ninja who simply stared back at him. Move or you'll get hurt. Lucario barked out asked, pointing back the way they had come. Shed Ninja simply stared at him. Do you think you can survive? Lucario asked, guessing now as he sensed that all those previous Pokémon and Sir Aaron were all just standing there. Why? Shed Ninja meanwhile simply stared at Lucario. Is it all right? Lucario wondered as he glanced at Shed Ninja before lunging forward. I will deal with you later after I deal with Aaron. Suddenly Lucario felt a sense of vertigo as he stumbled a little. Electricity discharged from Lucario's fur as he stumbled back. The shadows behind Lucario shot out in the form of ethereal black tendrils that held Lucario in place, alongside psychic and gravitational forces that held the aura Pokémon in place. Seeing Lucario snarl, Haunter just smiled. Lucario decided that he didn't like that smile as Haunter shoved a, BDSM, gag into Lucario's muzzle. Austin walked out of the cloud of lethal chemicals with Clefable's gravity protecting everyone. Austin looked at Lucario blankly before glancing at Haunter. Never trust a man who can dance. Austin's words confused Haunter and the others who were discussing something amongst themselves. What are you guys? Pidgeot. And gals talking about. We were wondering how you know all of this. Muna's telepathic words caused Austin to stop and think while everyone awaited curiously for the answer meanwhile Lucario glared at Austin as if he had killed someone close to him. I just read a lot of books. Austin and his Pokémon stared back at one another. Every one of Austin's Pokémon looked at him as if he had told the biggest lie to their face. What? I read sometimes. When? When I have free time. When? Didn't I just say when I have free time? Seriously, when? Okay, let's continue this conversation after we handle Lucario. Pika. Everyone cried out in agreement as they turned to Lucario who was still glaring back at him. Haunter, can you please remove that gag from Lucario's mouth? Keek keek. Snarl. As soon as the gag was removed, Lucario snarled out in fury but Haunter just threw the gag at his head. Well, we could have met in better circumstances but let's get this straight. I am not Sir Aaron. 
I was carelessly summoned from my staff by Sir Aaron. A moment of weakness, perhaps. Where did he flee to? Tell me quickly and I will trouble you no further. Sir Aaron is dead, Austin said as he went on one knee. He delivered the words with no hint of relish, but no pity either. Just cold and empty, so they couldn't be argued against. He died centuries ago, protecting the kingdom from the Great War. If anyone summoned you, it was me. Lucario's eyes narrowed. That's not possible. Nothing is impossible, the word itself says I'm possible. Austin said as he brought out the time flower. Fasten your seat belts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Omake paragraph. The ancestors of the Persians were enormous beasts with long saber teeth, related to Ray Cow and Mew. They were not normal type Pokemon, but psychics whose power emanated from an enormous red jewel on their foreheads and could shoot thunderbolts from their giant whiskers. Like most of the Pokemon world's megafauna, a mixture of climate change and overhunting wiped them out, and only their smaller, weaker descendants are alive today. Modern Persian jewels are usually a vestigial body part, akin to a human's tailbone or an empoleon's wings. However, there is a limited atavism found in Persian throughout the ages, they do not regrow their old fangs or size, but they learn electric attacks without special training and powerful psychic attacks which cause their jewels to grow a deep crimson hue. They are also expert ventriloquists, able to move their mouths to telepathy to the point where virtually all trainers mistake it for human speech. There are only two atavistic, psychic Persian confirmed to be alive today. This is not an unusually low number, such Persian are extremely rare. One of them is kept as a pet by Sabrina of Saffron City, and the other is believed to be in the possession of Team Rocket. Chapter number 226 Descendant POV Change Kingdom of Rhoda, Cameron's Castle Located at the back of the castle, situated between two thick buildings and watched over by the many towers of the castle, was a large open arena with seating located around it. The original purpose of this area was a meeting place for the townspeople and the royalty that resided in the castle. It was here where decisions ranged from small everyday things like whether to expand a road a little further, to important historical events such as whether a particular king or queen was worthy of their title and position. This open area was now a Pokemon battlefield, used in the kingdom's yearly Guardian of Aura festival competition. However, it still kept the monarch box where the current royalty would watch the proceedings from. However, even with all its similarities to an average medieval town and castle, there was one thing that set this town apart from all others. The crystals. Scattered all over the town and accompanying the castle were large blue crystal formations that sparkled in the sun, taking the town from beautiful the breathtakingly magnificent. These crystals were one of the most well-known features of the town and attracted many tourists to admire their beauty. Finally, off the back of the castle, just outside the royal chambers and throne room, was a balcony that gave a great view of the land towards the north, the opposite direction from the town. The balcony had a few of the crystal structures scattered to one side. On this balcony stood a beautiful young woman wearing a light pink dress that perfectly contrasted her lovely golden hair and the crown that rested there, as she stared out the beautiful landscape surrounding the castle. She stood with impeccable grace and seemed to extrude not just a calming aura, but one of complete control and unquestionable authority that showed a sense of maturity far beyond her age. She glanced back at the bed where she saw an unconscious Riley. After he went to the Tree of Life, he had been in the presence of the great guardians that had left the head of the aura guardians in a coma. The entire castle was engulfed by a sense of anxiety as they wondered if the assailant had other plans for the kingdom of Rhoda. Princess Eileen sighed in worry for her mother and friend's health. Meanwhile, in the Tree of Life, the Queen and a group of Aura Guardians were performing a ritual to appease the anger of the Guardians of the Tree of Life. Gazing upon the pointless ritual that the humans had created, Mew bounced on the clouds up in the sky. Suddenly stopping, Mew began to open a letter she had found in the Tree of Life left behind by the Chosen One's haunter. In the mountains, everyone watched as a hidden part of history came to life right in front of them, courtesy of a time flower. The scenery of the tree's core was almost completely the same as it was in the present, and sitting right next to Austin was someone who looked very much like him. He was completely identical apart from his clothing and his eyes, which were blue, in stark contrast to Austin's deep brown. His gloves lay on the ground beside him. Sir Aaron, breathed Lucario as he gazed upon his mentor. Sir Aaron did not hear him however, as this was only a memory. Instead, he stared off into the distance, his blue eyes glimmering as he sat, deep in thought. His trance was interrupted as an arc of lightning traversed through his body, bringing with it a grunt of pain. He turned his gaze back to the wall and began to speak. Lucario, forgive me. 
M, Master, Lucario, now sitting on the ground like Austin and Sir Aaron, responded with his telepathy, even though the one he wanted to most could not hear him. Sir Aaron then continued. Please understand, I had to seal you inside the staff. I knew if I didn't you'd follow me here and suffer the same fate. I only wish, that you could have known the real story. Lucario, with tears in his eyes, responded once again. I understand. One day you'll be released in a more peaceful time. Sir Aaron smiled, what will it be like? I wonder if... He was interrupted by another stream of lightning coursing through him. After a moment he regained himself and continued. I have, no regrets. My journey, has been good. I served a beautiful queen, and, you and I shared many adventures. He leaned back and sighed, a happy and contented smile on his face, despite the amount of pain he must have been going through. Those memories will always be with me. Master, if only you could hear me, I want to tell you how much you mean to me. Lucario started to shake, such was the extent of his sadness. Lucario, farewell. The aura Pokemon's head jolted upright, his eyes wide. But Sir Aaron continued, you were more to me than just my student. You were, my closest friend. I feel the same. The tears continued to well. But, before I go, I have one final piece of advice, a, final request, even if you never hear it. Anything. The Knight of Cameron's gaze became more focused. Don't give up just because I am, no longer there. Keep on going, and live your life to the full. Continue your work, as an Aura Guardian, and help others in need. There are few Aura Guardians in the world, so continue your work, but also try to find more with, the potential of Aura, and train them. Do your part in the world, and enjoy it. Then. Sir Aaron smiled blissfully. Then, it could be, one day, we will see each other again. A single tear flowed down Sir Aaron's cheek, and he closed his eyes one final time. I hope so, my friend. And with that final goodbye, the vision provided by the time flower ended, leaving Lucario with his tears finally running down his face. Aaron my friend, goodbye. Austin and everyone stared at the crying Lucario in silence as they gave the aura Pokemon time to process what he had heard. A few minutes later, Clefable smiled and patted Lucario's back as he healed up the aura Pokemon who gazed upon Austin. Looks like I have an apology to give. It's not a problem, Lucario. Even then I apologize. Each person has their aura. It's as distinct as a fingerprint. So if you have a similar wave signature to Sir Aaron, enough to confuse an aura user like me, then you must. Austin smiled as he saw Lucario awkwardly trying to explain his actions so he decided to mess with him. What? Are you saying? I'm like Sir Aaron's reincarnation or something. No, if your wave is the same then you must be, Sir Aaron's descendant. Austin looked at Lucario in confusion before his mind fully registered Lucario's words. You're Sir Aaron's descendant, Lucario repeated. His direct descendant. Omake paragraph. For all mankind's inventions volcano monitoring, satellite tracking of hurricanes, and the like there remains no better predictor of natural disasters than the intensity of a Seduk's headache. Although perpetually confused and in pain, Seduk possesses a telepathic bond with the earth itself. When the world cries out in pain and upheaval, this link activates, causing its headaches to grow ever worse and its telekinesis to often become uncontrollable. Although some inexperienced trainers cannot discern the difference between this and the Pokémon's normal erratic behavior, wise men have learned to run for cover whenever a Seduk cries out in pain. Unfortunately for those in some hot spots, these cries happen regardless of the nature of the disaster in question. It is not unheard of for people to run for cover on a Seduk's warning fearing a hurricane, only to be crushed by that very cover in a freak earthquake. It is this issue, more than any others, which has taught man about the need to invent better ways to predict disasters, so far, they have largely failed. Furthermore, many trainers have begun feeding headache medication to their Seduk, which although making them far more effective in battle, provided their strategy does not involve psychic attacks, means there is not nearly as often a Seduk around capable of giving warnings. Two years ago, a group of Seduk began to block the way to Mount Coronet. Although occasionally dispersed by the usage of certain potions, they always return within days. The Sinnoh League has begun preparations for a massive evacuation, but independent analyses still predict massive casualties should Coronet finally erupt. Chapter Number 227 Sinocephalus Austin frowned as he registered Lucario's words. What did that mean? 
Lucario narrowed his eyes. I admit, I was disorientated and attacked without provocation. You looked exactly like Sir Aaron. Lucario looked at him now, sizing up the young man in front of him. His gaze lingered on the faded Indigo League logo emblazoned across his chest and then at the sneakers tied to his feet. You don't know. Austin self-consciously folded his arms across his chest. Yeah, well, this, he gestured in front of himself with a sarcastic flourish. Is what I look like normally. Absurd. You're dressed like a pauper. Lucario raised an eyebrow the boy's way. Are you a pauper? Austin didn't want to admit that he had no idea what a pauper even was. Note to self, get a dictionary. With that thought, he carried on as if it were. Yeah, well, fashion's kind of moved on since your period, Grandpa. Lucario flinched. But he didn't let the stinging remark linger in his thoughts. Look, Austin began once he felt he had arrested the aura Pokemon's attention. I wanted to ask for some help. For what descendant of Aaron? You can call me Austin. Very well, I'll do just that descendant of Aaron. Are you bad with names? I am not, Austin. It's Austin. As you can guess, this isn't your era. How many years could have gone? The War of Rhoda was 500 years ago. 500, why, years? In a moment of horror, Austin went to fetch the fallen staff. He snatched it back up from where it had clattered down the floor and jogged back over to the two. He held the staff out to Lucario, and the Pokemon lurched back in alarm. You were inside this, Austin said. It must have been keeping you alive all these years. Lucario looked up and down the hated staff before resting his eyes on the young man in front of him. So my era is gone, my friends are dead, my family is dead. The kingdom is fought for is dead. Tears flowed down Lucario's eyes as went to his knees. The shock of knowing that everyone that he cared for was gone, had overwhelmed the aura Pokemon. Austin patted Lucario's back as he whispered, I know how it feels, just let it all out. As if offended by Austin's words, Lucario lashed out by slapping away Austin's hand. How would you know what I feel? Lucario's words of anger were heard by everyone yet they looked on as Lucario's eyes turned from one of fury to one of sympathy. Who did you lose? Lucario asked as his voice broke halfway. I lost a friend who was just like a family to me and... Austin took a deep breath. He had lost his perfectly fine life. He didn't know what was happening to his body in his world. He didn't know why this happened but his life and the ash of this world's life had been ruined by whatever caused this. How did you get over it? Lucario gazed upon Austin as he took a deep breath while saying with a smile that was so forced that most of the Pokemon all around them cringed in discomfort. I didn't. Even to this day. I feel like it was just a nightmare and I will wake up soon but as soon as I wake up I find myself back in this hell of a reality. Austin said as he took out a cigarette before using Charmeleon's tail flame as a lighter. Woo. Foo. Pikachu plunged his nose with his paws as he saw his trainer puff a cigarette before passing it on to Lucario who tried to do the same. Cough. Cough. But Lucario was reduced to a fit of coughs as he said, Just what in Mew's name did you give me? It's an acquired taste. Austin replied as he lit up another cigarette using Charmeleon's tail flame who was glaring at him while protecting his tail. Come on Charmeleon, your flame makes it taste better. Charmeleon meanwhile scratched his head as he wondered if he should proud of it or not. So Lucario, I wanted to ask you something. What is it, Auster? It's Austin. My apologies, Austin. Will you teach me, the art of aura? I can but I don't know if you can wield the power of aura. Hearing Lucario's words, Austin nodded as his shadow parted revealing an apple pie thrown at him. Austin quickly dodged the pie thrown at him before landing on the side that had a pair of curiously ornate gloves. They were inlaid with gold and a strange opal-like crystal. THPPTPHTPHTPHPH Wordertle, Pikachu, Kingler, Haunter, and Ninjask chuckled as they heard the fart sound while Pidgeot, Caesar, and Charmeleon were trying their best to not laugh. Clefable and Feral looked at one another since it wasn't all that funny to them. Shed Ninja stared on with no shift in its position as it gazed upon the world of the living from its husk-like shell of an existence. Very mature. Austin said in an annoyed tone as he pulled the Aura Guardian gloves from the whoopee cushion. So you are like a jester, Lucario asked. A little red from embarrassment, Austin cleared his throat as he wore the gloves. So as I was saying the Aura is with me. With a chant said, Austin closed his eyes as he outstretched his hands. 
his mind flashed to all the moments his aura spiked and as he remembered the feeling the oval crystal on the gloves glowed with crimson light. Lucario's eyes widened at the spike of aura. Oh! Austin opened his eyes due to Lucario's words as he saw all his Pokémon cheering for him. Thanks. And now Lucario, are you going to teach me, Aura? It would be an honor to train a descendant of Sir Aaron, let us get to Cameron Castle and we will begin our training immediately. Ah, is it necessary to go to Cameron Castle for the training? Of course, I am a sworn knight to the Order of Rhoda. Is there a problem with training at Cameron Castle? There is no problem but shouldn't your terms of service have ended after you were presumed dead? No, a knight will always protect the castle and the kingdom. Fuck. Austin cursed in his thoughts before saying, Lucario, how about we go to Kanto and you teach me about Aura since Rhoda has enjoyed peace for a long time and the region of Kanto is currently in grave danger. That is most unfortunate but I must still protect Rhoda. How about? Young one, you offer terms but I ask for none. Why don't you train in Rhoda and I could convince the king to let me and other knights of the kingdom help you in your endeavor? Austin clicked his tongue at Lucario's stubbornness before resorting to a tactic that he genuinely disliked with every core of his being. Lucario, it has been over 500 years since you last saw the royalty of Rhoda. Can you guarantee that the king would be so benevolent to us that he would risk the safety of the kingdom for some other region? Lucario, remember the friend I mentioned that died? Lucario nodded as he heard Austin's words. The danger that Kanto faces is from the same organization that killed my friend. This organization steals and experiments on Pokémon. These people have been murdered for their profit. Anyone who comes in their way gets killed. You can ask anyone here about how we accidentally stumbled upon their operation. We defended ourselves against their attack and it resulted in us losing a family member. I came here to seek out help from someone who can give me the ability to stop these monsters from hurting others. Lucario. Look me in the eyes and say that you are certain that the royalty of Rhoda would help me in this time of need. Why would they do that? Tell me, Lucario, why would they help, some unknown boy with a Lucario who claims to be the prized pupil of Sir Aaron? They would rather lock us up than help us and I am not going to stand here risking the life of my family just because of a hunch you have. Some guardian you turned out to be, Sir Aaron made a mistake when he entrusted you to carry on his will, to train the next generation. Austin's words cut deep into Lucario's heart as he thought about the words deeply. Lucario looked up to see Austin's back as he was walking away. W wait. Hearing Lucario's words, Austin stopped before smirking. Next time I meet Jake, I am going to thank him for teaching me how to gaslight someone. What do you want now? Going to preach some other things. No, Rhoda is currently at peace but Kanto is not. An aura guardian must protect the weak. What are you trying to say? I, Sinocephalus, would like to offer my teachings to the next generation, descendant of Aaron. Austin's eyes widened as he heard Lucario's true name. He didn't understand why Lucario would reveal his true name to him. It would be my honor to be your pupil. Minus zero. Omake paragraph. It is written in the holy scriptures that when Arceus gave names to all the Pokémon, he gave them names related to their form. For instance, Magmar's name comes from Magma and Bulbasaur is a Saurian Pokémon with a bulb on its back. In the case of Golduck, it has been argued that even Arceus makes mistakes, although Saduck is golden in color, Golduck is quite distinctly blue. Golduck is not gold, but they are athletic. Their large spiked head, quick running speed, long legs, and tail make them the perfect scorers in goal roll and related games such as soccer. Furthermore, like Bagon, they are exceptionally determined Pokémon who will always pursue their goals. It is for these reasons that theologians believe that it was not Arceus, but the mistaken man and that the Pokémon's name is properly spelled as Golduck. More skeptical minds consider this a weak apologia for an obvious mistake. Chapter number 228 Caesar and Firo POV change Cameron Castle Is he awake? A voice called out as Queen Rin the Six walked into the room gazing upon her daughter who was taking care of Riley. No, mother. Princess Eileen's voice broke as she looked down upon her friend. The other guardians had told them that Riley suddenly collapsed while using his aura. What did the doctors say? Riley seems to be medically fine but he just isn't waking up, Eileen replied to her old mother who just nodded. Mother, will Riley be alright? Don't worry child, I am sure Riley is just exhausted. While the queen was reassuring her daughter a couple of guards ran into the room. Your Majesty, we have found Sir Aaron's staff. That is wonderful news. But there seems to be a problem. 
The head guard gulped as he saw the queen's eyes narrow. Elaborate further. Yes, your majesty. We don't have all day now do we, say your words or I will have your tongue. Gulp, your majesty, the staff. Kingdom of Rhoda, Central Park. A crowd of people whispered to one another as they gazed upon the statue of Queen Rin the Great, the ruler of Rhoda during the time of war. That's funny. Roger, that's highly disrespectful. Who could have done such a thing? Who dares to do such a thing? People in the crowd commented as they gazed upon the guards trying to pull the staff of Sir Aaron out of the Queen's statue's butt. But people in the crowd were focusing on the message written on the giant white cloth attached to the staff of Sir Aaron. Harder Daddy Harder. The message, written in all red, ended with a portrait of Queen Rin doing the Ahego face. Minus zero. In. Austin walked down the hallway as he asked, Haunter, did you place the staff where I told you to? Austin's shadow warped into thumbs meanwhile Pikachu narrowed his eyes at Haunter. He could feel it in his gut, she did something. Austin opened the door to his room which was filled with darkness. With a little frown, Austin tried to find a switch but as he stepped forward but the sound of someone scrambling caused him to stop at the door. Click. A small lamp lit up the room revealing Yellow sitting on the couch like a mob boss while stroking Tenti, the tentacle. Austin blinked a few times as he awkwardly looked at Yellow who was trying to be intimidating. And where were you? Austin couldn't help but crack a smile at Yellow's adorable attempt at being intimidating. I am pretty sure, mob bosses don't have saliva dripping down their faces. Austin's comment caused Yellow to blush in embarrassment as she quickly rubbed the saliva off. She must have dozed off while waiting for him to return. Austin thought as he was impressed by Yellow's attempt at recreating a scene that they saw in the movies in the SS. And which had led him to wake up late for his surprise match against Misty. I am impressed. Thanks, Yellow replied as she rubbed the back of her head with a small blush on her face. Hey, don't try to change the subject. Tell me where you were. Yellow said before her heart began to speed up as she saw the frown on Austin's face. And why do I have to tell you where I go? Austin's words and tone caused Yellow to shake a little. B but aren't we friends? No, we aren't. I think I have made that abundantly clear in my call. Austin's words caused Yellow to look on in disbelief. Austin didn't say anything but walked forward to his bed before stopping as he pulled out an envelope from his pocket. Throwing the envelope towards Yellow, you said you didn't have any money. It contains the key to your room and enough money to buy you a ticket to Kanto. Why, UWA, want M me to L, leave. Yellow's voice called out to Austin who didn't even turn around. The message seemed to have gone through to Yellow who returned Tenti before walking out of the room with the envelope in hand. The silence of the room was broken by the small sobs of Yellow as she slammed the door shut. I did the right thing didn't I? Austin asked Pikachu who just nodded. Even if his friends hate him, at least they were safe. Pikachu was reminded of his trainer's words before he did that call. Looking up at the boy who was smoking away his grief, Pikachu just smiled. Maybe one day they will understand your actions. Nighttime. Muna looked on in interest as she saw Caesar and Firo playing a game of chess meanwhile everyone else was asleep. The duo was too prideful to admit their love for the game so they threaten. Ahem. Convinced her to never talk about this to anyone. Haunter meanwhile was on the roof spray painting those gloves under their trainer's commands. She was pretty sure, their trainer is going to regret it later that he gave Haunter those spray cans. Muna smirked as she looked at her sleeping trainer. Her worry was visible on her face as she expelled a dark purple dream mist from an oval spot in a darker shade of pink on her body. Her trainer's dreams were getting more and more violent, alarming, and dark. This worried her, her trainer needed help but who could she turn to when she didn't know if he wanted help in the first place? Muna was broken out of her thoughts as she felt a burst of dream aura. A little intrigued, Muna floated towards the location meanwhile Caesar smirked as he moved his knight. Firo's eyes showed a glint as he moved his bishop to checkmate Caesar. Caesar looked up from the board in surprise. How did you do that? What can I say I am just smart? Firo replied as he puffed out his chest. I want another game. Caesar's words caused Firo to scoff. I don't play with losers. Don't call me that. Caesar replied as he got up with the life orb hanging around his neck glowing. You want to go? Yeah, let's go another round this time I am white. Firo snorted while moving forward. Don't go crying to the human when you lose. Yellow's room. Muna gazed upon Yellow who was twisting and turning in her sleep. She could sense a weird psychic aura coming from Yellow. 
it was as if she was gazing upon two different individuals. Muna quickly went in to help her trainer's friend. Omake Paragraph Although quite far down the list of Pokémon which pose a danger to humans, Mankey as a species is unmatched in their aggressiveness and ferocity. They are both brave and brutish, they will pick fights whether their battles would be easy victories against weak and often unwilling foes or impossible struggles against legends. Their courage has won them many accolades, which they typically squander just as quickly by fighting just as ferociously against young children who wander into the tall grass. Because of this ferocity, they are typically considered to be dumb beasts, in reality, they are nothing of the sort. As far as non-psychic Pokémon go, Pokémon neurology has demonstrated convincingly that Mankey possesses brains nearly as developed and intelligent as humans. It is commonly thought that the combination of a self-aware brain and a body that can only run, punch, and repeat its name creates a great deal of frustration which drives Mankey to rage against everything in sight. There are, however, those who believe that Mankey's aggression does not stem solely from frustration and existential angst. After all, Mankey's closest living relative, apart from Primeape, is man, which is no stranger to assault, murder, and war. Chapter number 229 The Nameless Child Author note, do you remember when I asked you guys to read chapter 23, move combos because I added some extra paragraphs? This chapter is why I did that, get ready for an existential crisis and calling me a sadistic bastard in the comments. Thanks thumbs up sign. POV change. In the beginning of time, the god sculpted the first human from the earth with his own thousand hands. As he watched his creation come to life, he fell deeply in love with man and would often gaze upon his beloved with great joy. However, man did not return the god's love, instead, it fell in love with the world around it. Despite this, the god did not feel anger towards his creation, but rather, he was happy that man was happy. As the first human neared the end of its life, it asked the god of life and birth for a favor, to protect its children. In response, the god created a sanctuary around the first human's corpse, which over time transformed into the lush and vibrant Viridian forest. Those who passed through the forest and had brief encounters with the essence of the first human were granted a special power known as the Viridian Forest Curse. But what of those who were born in the sanctuary itself? This question remained a mystery, as it was considered an impossible feat to give birth in the dangerous Viridian Forest near the sanctuary. Despite this, many still journeyed through the forest in search of the mythical power that lay within. Viridian Forest, Unknown Bunker The Basement a place where no one's voice can reach and not a speck of sunlight enters. In a dimly lit room, a malnourished woman's cries drowned out the static of the old television. Ack! Blood decorated the floor in red as the malnourished woman gave birth. Ack! Ack! Groan! Amid the fear and madness, a girl was born. The woman's hands trembled as she gazed upon her crying child. Her hand snaked towards the baby's neck. Each inch as they moved closer and closer, the woman told herself. You don't have to live in this hell. But the touch of the baby's hand against her own caused the malnourished woman to stop. She couldn't do it. How could a mother kill her child? Humans, are born into the world. Each takes their path. And learns of the world. Mother, the vessel that makes the child feel loved. Father, the vessel that makes the child feel safe. Ego, shaped by society one lives in. Joy comes and goes like the wind. Sadness. A stop in the path of life that makes or breaks the gem of life. Dreams. Gives willful meaning to life. Despair. Takes color from life. Freedom, shows us the beauty of the world. Responsibility. Ties us to society. Beauty, a desire of all. Ugliness. An inevitability that we keep hidden. The end. The last stop of the path of life. The beginning, after every end there is a new beginning to life. And life was also given to this girl. Creek. As the door opened a monster with blood-red eyes glared back at the curious eyes of a young child. This was the young girl's life. The television always showed a loving family to the girl but her family was anything but loving. How did she survive this long? Merely because of luck or perhaps because the girl's father had a shred of humanity left or maybe it was because of those powers she had been born with. Legend has it that some were chosen by the Viridian Forest Spirit to wield great powers. Those that received these powers were known by the people of old as the Chosen Mew. While the people viewed such beings as gods, they viewed themselves as cursed people. This girl was also one of the Chosen. Maybe it was the result of this curse that she had survived. 
Her tears had long since dried up. Or. Maybe it was due to her curse that she could heal herself as her father took out her anger on her, and her pain tolerance grew. Whatever the reason, the girl wished for death over and over again. But she couldn't die. Even in this world of pain and anguish, the girl's life wasn't extinguished. While her malnourished mother tried to stop the beast from hurting her child. The girl's inner self ceased living. The girl stopped crying. Since birth, that's the only way she had been treated by others. She wasn't sad or resentful. That was all she knew. That was her life. All she knew was pain inflicted upon her by the beast she called father. Yes, that is all. Boil. Boil. Mom. The young girl said to her trembling mother. Instant noodles. The mother in response threw the bowl at the wall as the little girl blankly glanced at it. Why do I? Why do I have to? The malnourished woman kept asking herself as the young girl cleaned up the mess her mother had made. You have to eat well. The young girl replied. The malnourished woman tried to cry yet no tears seemed to come out. Or you'll be hungry. The young girl followed up as the room was filled with nothing but silence. Slurp. Chew. Chew. The young girl ate in silence in a room covered in mold connected to a foul-smelling bathroom. Bottles of alcohol roll around the floor. A blinking light bulb and an old television. Father, mother, and a girl who had lived for 60,240 hours. A 344 square foot room. This was the girl's world. Then one day an alien life entered the girl's world. Ratata. The door to the sink opened up revealing a ratata. A long time ago, someone told a story. There was a prisoner born inside a cave, the prisoner was tied up so that he could only see the cave's inner wall. Only the shadows projected from the entrance showed him a glimpse of the world like the little girl whose world was filled with nothing but violence inflicted on her or her mother by the beast she called a father. Then one day the prisoner escaped. As the girl followed the ratata up the pipes connecting to the sink. As the prisoner saw the world for the first time. 2510 days after she was born, she came face to face with the outside world. The girl was left mesmerized by the world as she touched the walls. Saw the light provided by the stars and the moon. Pidgeys flew in the night sky as she walked and walked and walked. The world was suddenly so big for her. Hey? Hi there, haven't seen you around here before. Be a dump. Be a dump. It was the first time, the girl had seen anyone else in real life other than her mother and father. Be a dump. Be a dump. Did you recently move here? The young girl's mind was filled with thoughts and thoughts as the close encounter with the third kind occurred. I should answer her. But how? With words? Can I call it moving? TV. He is tall. Cigarette. Using my voice? I don't know. I can see his pupils. Do I call him sir? The girl's mind was filled with overwhelming thoughts. Hey, are you okay? Uh. Yet, yeah, hey. Yet? Yeah. It's nice to meet you. What's your name? Uh, I don't know. Hey, you don't know but I can't keep calling you kid or people would think I kidnapped you, hmm, can I call you yellow, kid? For the first time in her life, the nameless child's eyes flickered with a smudge of happiness as she heard someone call her something. Maybe to the ears of the child, Wilton Amarillo's words were more than just words. It was a confirmation that she was someone. Oh make paragraph. The various martial arts disciplines and sports around the world are typically based on the techniques used by fighting type Pokemon. For instance, boxing is based on a Hitmanchan's movements and techniques, and wrestling on that of a Macamp. The vast majority of these martial arts are based around ideas of strict internal calm and discipline, some even going so far as to emulate the psychic attack meditation. The one notable exception to this was the Primeap fighting style. It was not designed for self-defense or sport, but for military use. As Primeap uses tools, so do Primeap fighters use weapons. Instead of learning to clear their thoughts, they were taught to recall every indignity they had ever suffered and turn all their sadness into anger, and in a battle to call up an uncontrollable rage. They would fight with unchallenged ferocity, always to the death, and pursue fleeing or even surrendered opponents over long distances with exceptional stamina before tearing them to pieces. I refer to this discipline in the past tense, for it is no more. Through their status as elite troops, the Primeap fighters amassed a great deal of power, but the way they fought made them far more feared than loved. The warlords of Kanto who employed them secretly sent a team of envoys to the emperor to request that their use be outlawed, and the emperor eagerly complied. 
Some bands lay down their arms, while others turned on their masters and resisted with the kind of courage that epics are written about. They were all wiped out to the last man. Some have attempted to resurrect the art in modern times, but none of the attempted successors have produced fighters worthy of the prime ape name. Chapter number 230 A Dark Past and A Promise POV Change I also exist in this impossibly huge system, for a brief moment before disappearing. A young yellow thought as she saw the beautiful night illuminated by the lights of the houses of Viridian City alongside Wilton Amarillo. All she knew was that this vast world and the night sky twinkling with the stars were new to her and made her feel something she had never felt before. It was nice meeting you, kid. Wilton Amarillo said as he waved goodbye to the young Yellow who turned to crawl back to the hell hole she called home. Yellow and her malnourished mother stared at one another as Yellow said, Mom, I went outside. I saw a ratata and other people. I saw houses, but nothing big like on TV. I ate candy. Slap. Thud. Yellow's innocent words were rewarded by a slap to the face as the malnourished woman screamed out. You, you abandoned me and went somewhere. The malnourished woman cried out as she hugged Yellow. Please don't abandon me, please. They. Woman begged Yellow who did nothing but stand around in a daze. Desire. I want to earn a lot of money. I want to have cool stuff. I want to be popular. I want to date them. I want to be acknowledged. I want to be healthy. I want to eat delicious food. I want to be loved. Such emotions are a natural part of human life but they were quite unfamiliar to the little girl. For the first time in her life, Yellow had a desire. I want to go outside. I want to go outside and see the world. For a few days, Yellow focused on the sound of her heartbeats. She could count the beat. She realized that when her mother fell asleep, she didn't wake up until her heartbeat at least 21,600 times. It took 1,000 beats for her mother to fall asleep. Yellow counted her heartbeats and ascended to the surface once more. 1,336. 1,337. Yellow didn't get lost as she replayed the memories of that day over and over again. Wherever she went, the paths were connected anyway. 2,146. Yellow found herself standing before Wilton Amarillo who just smiled. It's been so long, have you come to visit me? Wilton asked with a smile. 2147. 2147. I am counting my heartbeats. Now. The girl liked it here. The girl tried different flavors of candy. She saw people striving greatly to make a living. She saw a person who lost his way. She saw the beautiful Pokemon that roamed the sky and the land. She saw a life worth living. Months later. Yellow couldn't hear the sound of her heartbeat as she gazed upon the corpse of the Rattata that she had followed up to the surface. Kid, don't look. Wilton Amarillo said as he covered Yellow's eyes from the gore of Persian eating a Rattata. And the world kept spinning. Perhaps that's why. Yellow wondered as she gazed upon the room that was once her entire world destroyed by the delusions of her mother. If it wasn't for you. The malnourished woman screamed out as she strangled Yellow. Each second went by as Yellow didn't even try to put up a struggle. What was the point? Even if I die, the world would keep spinning. What is my name? Yellow asked as she gazed upon the woman she called mother. Tears fell in Yellow's eyes as she asked once again. What is my name? That seemed to snap the woman back to reality as she let go of Yellow who greedily sucked in the air. I, I am sorry. The mother said as she bawled her eyes out. Eat. The malnourished woman said as she placed the bowl of instant noodles in front of Yellow. Slurp. Is it yummy? Yeah, it is yummy. Good. Come on, let's sleep together. Did you have a good time outside? Yeah, at first I was following this ratata and then I met this uncle. Yellow talked about everything she saw outside. One by one, and fell asleep next to her mother. I see. A feeling of peace settled over Yellow that she never felt before as the girl slept while remembering a memory that she cherished very much. What are you doing? The young yellow asked Wilton. Oh, I am drawing a picture. Do you like to draw? No, I have never drawn a picture. Yet? Wanna have a go? But what should I draw? Anything that you find beautiful. Yellow gazed upon the scribbles on the paper that depicted a loving family. The next day. Yellow woke up to see the hung corpse of her mother dangling from the bathroom room. 
a gangster man once married a woman who worked in the illegal adult entertainment industry. Both broken and unloved thought they would find comfort with one another. It was a decent life for a few months but the hole in the woman's heart couldn't be filled. So she tried to find comfort with other men. When the man found out, he was unable to control his anger and possessiveness so he locked her up in this hell hole. Why? Yellow wondered as she looked upon her mother's hungry corpse. The corpse of the mother swung side to side as Yellow hugged her mother's legs. Why did this happen? She remembered when Wilton asked her if the drawing was from her family. No, but it is something cool and good. Do you wish you had a family like that? I think it is great if you had a family like that. One day you will. Creak. The door of the room opened revealing an injured man as he gazed in shock and horror at the sight of the corpse of his hungry wife being swayed back and forth while his child hugged her legs. Bang. Yellow's body crashed into the wall. SLZTH. The man's fury turned yellow. Why, even in this situation? He doesn't know anything beside violence. Yellow thought as her father's fist crashed into her face. Does inflicting pain on others relieve the suffering in his heart? Yellow wondered as reality bent for a second due to a crimson wave expanding out. Is it fun hitting people? Yellow wondered as she gazed upon her father's fist. I think he might kill me. Um, daddy, Yellow called out stopping the beast from attacking further. Can't you just love me? Yellow's words seemed to anger the beast more. Yellow's body reacted on instinct because even in this hell, a small ember of desire lived on. Yellow's eyes glowed a cyan color for a second as the pulmonary artery of the beast ruptured causing the man to drop to the ground. Yellow glanced at her dead father before looking at the door. What is this world? Where are we all headed? Yellow walked out of the room never glancing back. As the dream world's reality broke apart, Yellow glanced back to see a crimson-eyed Austin with a melancholic look in his eyes. Are you real? Yellow asked as her eyes showed no spark. Shards of memories floated all around the duo. I never knew. Austin didn't know what to say. Who knew that Yellow had such a dark past? Neither did I, Yellow replied in a monotone voice. Austin flinched at the lifeless tone of Yellow. A shard floated in front of the duo showing a scene at a hospital. Mr. Wilton, Yellow's mind seems to have broken due to shock. Can't you do something about it? We can but... But what? The procedure would result in Yellow's memories being sealed away. What does that mean? The memories that caused Yellow's mind to break would be sealed by a psychic Pokemon and she would forget everything but the seal would take a great toll on Yellow's body as she would try to sleep after every activity. Doc, can it help Yellow? I assure you Mr. Wilton that this is the only way to help this child. Doc, if this can help then please make it happen. Austin didn't know what to feel as he gazed upon Yellow's memories. Why are you here? Shouldn't you be out there battling? Wasn't this why you abandoned Brock and Misty? Wasn't this why you abandoned me? Even if it was said in a monotone voice, Yellow's words stabbed Austin's heart. Austin put his head down in shame. What could he say at this point? He tried to push everyone away for their safety. He acted like an asshole so they would leave him and be safe. At the end of the day, it was just him running away from his anger of facing the people who were indirectly responsible for Radicate's death. If they had listened to him then maybe Radicate would have been alive. People try to blame others in their anger. Austin had done the same and as the realization settled in his mind, he could only feel one thing. Disgust. Disgust at himself for blaming others when he knew that they couldn't help it, how would they know what is going to happen when he knew that the ship was going to get attacked? Why didn't he try to warn anyone? Why did he try to get Bill or maybe Professor Oak to help? Why didn't he do anything? Yellow moved forward towards the dazed Austin. Are you going to abandon me again? Yellow asked. Austin just looked up to Yellow. You could have been free with Misty and Brock yet you chose to follow me, why? You were the only person who gave me my freedom. Uncle Wilton was very protective over me and didn't want me to go out but you gave me a chance to break out of my cage and fly through the sky. I choose to follow you because I could feel it, the boy who helped me escape from my prison was hurt and I couldn't look away. Austin subconsciously smiled at Yellow's words. If you are going to give a speech at least put some emotions into it. Yellow in response just kicked Austin's shin. Try to read the atmosphere sometimes. Sorry, sorry. Austin chuckled a little as he saw the entire void begin to be engulfed by an ethereal light. I guess this is goodbye, Austin said as he knew that Yellow's psychic seal would seal away these memories from Yellow. I don't like goodbye, Yellow said in a monotone voice as her body was engulfed by the ethereal light. 
I can't say I don't disagree, Austin replied as he covered his eyes. Ash. Austin. What? Austin, call me Austin. Yellow suddenly grabbed Austin's collar. Don't forget me. I won't. Pinky promise. Yes, Pinky promise. Can you open your eyes? Austin peeked out at Yellow's request as he saw Yellow hugging him. Austin, please don't abandon me. Don't abandon me, you idiot. A little surprised by the monotone shout, Austin just replied. I won't. I promise. Omake paragraph. Without the domestication of Grolithe, some believe that mankind today would still be living in caves. It is a fire that allowed man to cook food and warm shelters, defend itself through flaming weapons and keep hostile Pokémon away eons before man invented the Pokeball and became master of nature itself. And it is Grolithe, a friend to humanity through all ages, which brought fire to man. Were fire alone the benefit accrued to mankind by the presence of this Pokémon, it would have been far more than enough. But it was not. Grolithe eat Rattata, Zubat, and other vectors of disease so common in the Pokémon world. They need little sleep, and while serving as playmates by day, spend the nights guarding the caves which nocturnal Pokémon threaten. They naturally sniff out and attack criminals, allowing to this day for the preservation of good government and checking the corruption of the police force. And most importantly, it was through their bonds with Grolithe that man learned the lessons of Pokémon training, which he would apply to more and more species until the world itself was his own. It is no small wonder that, among primitive peoples, Arcanine is far and away the most revered of the gods for it must have seemed like divine protection that a Pokemon like Grolithe was around to help man through its earliest, most trying age. Chapter number 231 Breaking the News Austin's POV As my eyes opened, the first thing I saw was a graffiti drunk buff middle aged man doing a kawi pose. My mind went blank thinking I was still in a dream. You are not in a dream. Hearing the telepathic voice of Muna, a sense of dread filled my heart. How much is this going to cost? A lot. Thank you for your input, Muna. No problem. Sigh, who did this? Do I even need to say it? Fuck, where is Haunter? Haunter has gone out but you should look at what she did to your underwear. What did she do? I thought as dread filled my stomach. Suddenly all the pairs of underwear I have floated above me. Each of the underwear had been dyed pink in an extremely accurate Pokemon drawing in extremely suggestive poses. I didn't know whether to cry or to laugh. Muna, burn them. Really? Yes, now burn them. If you say so but only on one condition. What? Can you wear them at least once? Austin was left speechless as he got up from the bed. I am going to get Charm Leon to burn them. Come on, just try them once. I'd rather burn in hell. Ignoring Muna's pouting, Austin gathered all his decorated suggestive underwear to burn. An hour later. But don't worry my Pokemon put out the fire, Austin said with a smile at the staff member who asked about the smell of smoke coming from his room. Thank you for that and I apologize for disturbing you on a morning. It is no problem, you were just doing your job. Austin said as he closed the door. Guys, cut in out. Austin said while gazing upon the crying Muna who was sitting on Caesar's head. Pidgeot and Clefable comforted the psychic type while Caesar read his rom-com novel. Wardertle licked his lips as Pikachu flipped the skillet he was using to fry a couple of mushrooms on an annoyed Charmeleon's tail flame. What am I going to do with you all? Austin asked himself as he sat on the bed while Kingler spat out mushrooms that were covered in garlic ketchup. Switching on the transceiver to make a call to Bill Montgomery, Austin activated the call function, he selected Bill's contact number, and after three rings, a flash of light appeared on the screen as Bill's weight. What the? Austin screamed, getting up from the bed and he yelled into the transceiver. On the screen was Bill with a black eye. What's wrong? To answer Bill's question, Austin just pointed at his eye. Oh, well your friend here is quite energetic. Bill's screen moved to show Lucario playing with a rumba. Lucario touched the rumba before jumping in the air as the rumba beeped. Cute. Austin thought before coughing into his hand. So mind telling me, why you sent Lucario to me even though you can legally carry 20 Pokemon with you? Austin chuckled dryly as he replied, let's just say I found him by chance. Bill narrowed his eyes at Austin who looked away. How could Austin tell Bill that he had gaslighted an Orem Master Lucario into becoming his master and Pokemon and to keep his white lies from being found out he had sent Lucario to Kanto? Fine I won't get into the nitty gritty of it but I have to say Ash you are my lucky star. Why? 
because now I have a Pokemon to talk to. Can't psychic types talk to Pokemon? They can if they have the telepathy ability and it is not easy to find such a Pokemon. Oh, Austin replied as he glanced at Muna. I should thank Cynthia next time I call her. Anyway, Bill I am going to transfer Lucario when I return to Kanto. Really? When are you coming back? Tomorrow. Really? Hearing Bill's disappointed tone, Austin frowned, what's wrong? It's nothing. You want to spend more time with Lucario? Yes, please, can I? You can. Bill's face was like that of a child receiving a new toy. But I have a few conditions. Anything, what do you want? So Bill, what can you tell me about the Safari Zone? In, 10, 30 a.m. Yellow pulled herself out of bed as she washed up. When she noted the time, her eyes widened as she had slept in, her Pokemon must be starving. Everyone, I am sorry. Yellow quickly went through her fanny pack where she found that all her Pokeballs had been opened. Bzzzz. Hearing the sounds of Kitty's wings, Yellow went to the small kitchen where she saw all her Pokemon eating. Finally awake sleepy head. Austin's voice shocked Yellow who remained frozen. A, Ash. Yet. What are you doing here? Feeding your Pokemon since you decided to sleep in. Yellow rubbed her head in embarrassment. Dottie placed Yellow's straw hat on her head. Thanks, Dottie. Yellow, I have some bad news. You might want to sit down. Sob. 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 Dottie, Tenty, Dish, Kitty, and Yellow all were bawling their eyes out as Austin broke down the news of Raticate's death. Free. Butterfree struggled to breathe as Kitty was hugging him while crying. Similarly, Dottie was being comforted by Pidgeot and Caesar, reluctantly. Dish and Tenty had Bulbasaur and Pikachu to comfort them respectively. Austin used 420th tissue to clean Yellow's face who had cried so much that she had fallen asleep from exhaustion. Glancing at the sleeping Yellow against his arm, Austin just smiled melancholically as he remembered the dark reason why Yellow always slept. If Muna hadn't confirmed that everything that he saw was real, he would have assumed that it was just a horrible nightmare. A few minutes later, a sad atmosphere formed in the kitchen as Yellow's Pokemon mourned the loss of their friend while Austin's Pokemon tried to cope with emotions that flared up when Raticate's death was brought up. Yellow. Why, Sniff, yet. I am going to hunt down Team Rocket. B, Sniff, but isn't that dangerous? It is and that is why I want you to promise me that you won't tell anyone about this. E, even Brock and Misty. Especially those two. Yellow nodded before hugging Austin who was surprised by the gesture. I am sorry. Sorry for what? Sorry that you had to deal with Raticate's loss all on your own. Don't worry, it wasn't your fault that Raticate died. It is Team Rocket's fault and they are going to pay for it. A, Ash, I want to help. Sigh, I knew this was coming. Let's have a battle. Omake paragraph. Typically, to speak of a legendary Pokemon is to speak of a unique Pokemon. There is one Zapdos, whether it rests in the power plant or races around Sinnoh. There are two Mew, but one is a clone so warped it's considered Mewtwo, a different Pokemon entirely. And yet, anyone with a Grolithe and a Firestone, which you can buy at the Celadone department store, can possess an Arcanine. These Arcanine, however, are pale copies of the original. While some legendary Pokemon have been captured by great trainers and only regained freedom after their deaths, Arcanine the real Arcanine has never been captured. It is a beast more like Groudon or Kyogre in size than Entei, capable of running across all Eurasia in the space of a couple of days, and its fire is hot enough to melt the onyx it steps on when racing around the world for fun. Its cult is among the largest and most faithful of all the world's legendary Pokémon. Arceus, although always acknowledged as creator, is too distant to attract much devotion, and most of the legends hole themselves up in caves like Hikikomori, completely withdrawn from the world or run away whenever encountered by man. Arcanine, however, seems as though it is everywhere performing miracles and setting the unholy aflame, and it always sticks around for its temples to pay its respects. Even its commonality makes it more popular, it is far easier to relate to a big, evolved Grolithe than some weird Thunderbird. More legends have sprung up about Arcanine than any other Pokémon, and it is with good reason that the Pokédex calls Articuno a freeze Pokémon, and only Arcanine a legendary. An. The original Arcanine doesn't exist, it is just a belief people have created to give Arcanine the title of legendary Pokemon. Chapter number 232 The Seawave City Accident 
POV change. Austin and a red-eyed yellow walked out of the inn only to stop as they saw everyone in the lobby standing there looking at the television screen intently. It should a live scene in Sea Wave City. The sound of the helicopter blades blared through the speakers as someone turned down the volume. The video was shot from a helicopter and a woman was trying to give commentary but she was barely audible. Sea Wave City was a big city with big skyscrapers sprouting from the street white beaches and fancy looking palm trees. Or Austin assumed that Sea Wave City would like that because right now it was a battlefield. I don't know what you call a group of Gyarados, a swarm. A school? Another appropriate name would be a bloodbath. Austin couldn't see how many Gyarados there were but from the helicopter, it looked like a can of worms had been released into the city. The entire shore of the city was flooded with murky, brown and slightly reddish water which allowed the Gyarados to swim through the streets, the water flooded at least a good mile into the city, drowning everything in its path. Most skyscrapers that were too close to the sea had collapsed, either by the waves that continuously slammed into them or by the hyper beams, the Gyarados were firing. Entire city blocks were leveled, and other parts were visibly buried into the ground by seismic attacks. Gyarados were very scary Pokemon on their own but with an entire swarm of them, they were a nightmare. Whirlpools and tsunamis rose from the sea and crashed into the parts of the city that were not destroyed yet. Among the destruction, there were small islands created by toppled skyscrapers and buildings that hadn't collapsed yet. The Gyarados were rampaging through the city but not without any resistance. People and Pokemon were fighting back, or at least they tried to. Pokemon trainers had gathered on the small islands and were firing ranged attacks at the hostile Gyarados with their Pokemon. Lances of light, lasers, and psychic waves met the Gyarados and caused a lot of them to go under. People flying on bird Pokemon circled to draw the Gyarados away from the vulnerable parts of the city, all the while they had to dodge the hyper beams that were thrown at them. Bigger water Pokemon moved people and other Pokemon around to safer areas, evacuating those in need of help. One would say it was amazing to see Pokemon and humans working together, but that would be a lie. Because the people and Pokemon who tried to stop the rampage were losing. No knight in shining armor magically wished the monsters away or a protagonist who changed the tide with heroism. The camera angle didn't provide Austin with a lot of details but the overall picture was grim. For every violent Gyarados, they managed to take down two more roses from the water to take their place. Strategy-wise the Gyarados should have been at a disadvantage because they were attacking from the sea. But the people and Pokemon defending the city were no match. They were scattered everywhere and the constant barrage of waves allowed the Gyarados to swim through the city and slither through the streets. There seemed to be no coherent plan on either side, the Gyarados were bent on causing havoc and the defenders were trying to take down as many Gyarados as they could. The situation in Sea Wave City was no joke or a children's show. The people and Pokemon who tried to fight back were dying, and not in a heroic way either. Tidal waves tore through the hasty defense lines people had managed to set up. The water was not clean seawater instead. It was filled with glass, cars, and big pieces of concrete that had been torn out from the buildings and turned seawater into a meat grinder for whoever got swallowed by it. Mangled bodies, both Pokemon and human, floated on the water, coloring it red. Austin immediately turned to shield yellow from the gore only to find her sound asleep. Some Pokemon survived the initial wave but that didn't mean they were safe yet. There were water Pokemon like Tentacruel and Slowpoke who tried to rescue the ones that had fallen into the water. Being in the water was risky, even for water Pokemon, the tidal waves constantly tried to slam them into other objects and buildings, turning them into a red splash on the wall. People and Pokemon in the sky weren't safe either. Friendly fire was off and people who tried to get close to the Gyarados in the water risked being hit by their allies. Buildings and huge skyscrapers collapsed around them and buried anyone unfortunate to be underneath them. And whenever a Pokemon or trainer fell into the water, they were consumed by it. Rain and thunder made flying hell and the weather could change at any second. The helicopter allowed Austin to see multiple city blocks that had different weather systems, one was entirely frozen in ice with a blizzard in the sky while not even a block away there was a sandstorm raising through the streets. I am a human after all and I cannot look away from a train wreck. Austin considered briefly. Pikachu was mostly unfazed by it, he watched the video with more morbid curiosity but he didn't seem to be afraid. Yeah he kept hugging Austin's neck but Austin suspected that the video was an excuse and not the reason. No matter how bad the situation in Sea Wave City seemed to be, situations like this were nothing out of the ordinary in the world of Pokemon. As if the cameraman had heard Austin's thoughts he changed the angle of the camera and panned out. This time it showed the battle closer to the seashore. It's still unknown who or what caused the Gyarados to become this angry, the reporter cried out, there has been no official response from the Johto League yet 
besides raising the threat level and the helicopter swayed and the woman screamed, underneath the helicopter, a huge tidal wave had formed and headed towards the city and in the process almost caught the helicopter out of the air. The helicopter stabilized and the woman tried to continue as if nothing had happened, but it's clear that the situation is grim. Talking about grim, the camera angle changed again and this time it focused on a much bigger Gyarados. It had the size of a small skyscraper and it swam through the shoreline as if it was a big earthworm, slithering around torn down buildings, or sometimes it swam straight through them, seemingly unheard by the falling debris. The Gyarados in question were times bigger than a normal ones and were glowing faintly red. The giant Gyarados was angry, that much was clear. It lashed out with its entire body, sending tidal waves everywhere and tearing through everything in its path. The Gyarados themselves also had a weird weather effect surrounding him, a red sky was above him and made it look the creature came from the depths of Tartarus. Impossible, Austin muttered, what a joke. Omake paragraph. The skin of a paluag is semi-transparent, especially in the white circle on its chest. Through detailed study, its internal organs are visible not just the spiral-shaped intestine, but if you look closely, even the brain and heart can be seen. This fact has made Paluag a staple of science classes for young children, as they could be used to study anatomy without forcing the children to dissect a Pokemon. In ancient times, it was from analyzing Paluag that the science of medicine began. Observing them in nature allowed people around the world to discern the functions of various body parts, along with the common mishaps they suffered. It was not a perfect knowledge Paluag are amphibians, only distantly related to humans but knowledge in this field grew by leaps and bounds and in the age of antiquity man through Paluag had already begun to understand that humans and Pokemon are related. Interestingly, it was only a few centuries ago that Chansey was effectively domesticated, and before this, it was Paluag that nurses kept on hand in Pokemon centers. As assistants, they were not nearly as helpful as Chansey. Their oily skin, hypnosis technique and water type made them worth having around, but their use sowed as much to tradition as to utility. Chapter number 233 vs Yellow the Gyarados opened its mouth and a huge laser tore through the skyline. Except it was blocked by a light barrier that appeared in its path and shot the laser back. This angered Gyarados even more. A constant barrage of attacks surrounded the giant creature and it was clear that the most firepower available to the defenders had been put into stopping the big Gyarados. People sitting on the backs of flying Pokemon swarmed around the creature, dragons and birds alike. Even a few ghost Pokemon floated in the air and tried to attack the Gyarados. The fact that it was huge made it easier to hit but on the flip side, it was surrounded by water which the giant used to block attacks and move around quickly. Gyarados was bit by the reflected hyper beam and went under and for a brief moment, it looked like it was down for good. Then it flew straight up, like a Venus flytrap it snapped an unfortunate Pokemon trainer who rode on a Skarmory and swallowed both of them. The people flying around it began attacking again. The camera swayed and panned in on a certain individual. It was a blue-haired woman riding on top of a Drago Knight, her hair bound in a ponytail and swaying in the wind. She and the Drago Knight flew around the Gyarados and targeted the eyes with long-range attacks. The Gyarados seemed to hate her more than the others because it lunged for the pair, its entire body flying out of the water as if it was made of paper instead of flesh and bones. She didn't hesitate and dropped straight down with her Drago Knight, narrowly avoiding the huge jaw, before pulling up and continuing their attack. News Update the female reporter shrieked from behind the camera. She was cut off by a loud bang. The camera panned out and again focused on the city as a whole. All the previous weather effects had disappeared and now all the clouds above the city were turning black and suddenly the city was covered in a thick, black blanket that blocked most of the sunlight. Lightning arced through the sky everywhere and the black clouds in the city began to swirl around each other in a tornado-like fashion. All the clouds and lightning seemed to connect above the giant serpent. Lightning coiled around it in the air and over the water, skipping over the surface but strangely not getting consumed by it. Austin thought that it was Gyarados doing but the giant itself was also surprised by this new development. The swirling tornado in the sky began to form into a wind funnel and all the water in the city began to swirl too as if the entire city had become the middle of a huge tornado. The clouds in the middle of the vortex parted and the light shone through, forming an almost angelic beam from the sky. In the middle of the beam, a large creature was revealed it descended from above the clouds and slowly hovered down to fly above the giant Pokemon. It was white and big, definitely big. The creature didn't look like anything I'd ever seen on my Earth, the closest thing would be a dinosaur. It folded its two big white wings outward, like an angel displaying her wings, and managed to keep hovering in the air. Lightning kept flashing through the air and rain disturbed the sight yet it was pretty clear who had arrived. 
Austin couldn't make out the expression but the body language revealed one thing, it was pissed. The electricity that had gathered from all over the city started to make its way toward the flying dragon and gathered around the white wings. What is that? Someone in the crows asked. Lugia, Austin whispered, his own eyes practically glued to the screen. Gyarados didn't like the newcomer and opened its mouth, a multicolored beam the size of a skyscraper shot out of its mouth towards the flying legendary. Lugia slammed its wings forward and all the electricity around it shot toward Gyarados. The electricity transformed into something comparable to a spear as it left Lugia's wings and headed toward the giant serpent. The hyper beam didn't even delay the attack, the spear ripped through it like it was made of paper, Gyarados didn't even have the chance to look surprised. The spear hit it in the head and flew straight through it with a loud crackling sound. It exploded into a red mist that could have been blood but Austin suspected it was something entirely different. The giant stopped moving and dropped dead in the water. A silence followed a figurative calm before the storm. The hostile, smaller Gyarados had stopped their rampage and stared at the sky. People and Pokémon alike were captivated by the looming legendary that hovered above the city. Lugia surveyed the flooded city underneath it without moving from the spot. Now the fighting had stopped the damage was visible. Parts of the city had frozen and were covered while other parts were on fire. The roads that weren't flooded had cracks in them visibly displaying parts of the city that had sunken into the ground due to seismic attacks. The parts that had been flooded looked like they were part of the sea with islands sticking out made of buildings and piled up rubbish. Lugia raised its head upwards towards the sky and let out a howl that roared over the city like a tidal wave of sound. The water in the city began to stir, though it wasn't the Gyarados doing this time. Everywhere water began to retreat to the original shoreline, taking cars and mangled bodies with it. The Gyarados who had been fighting were dragged into the water with whirlpools that began to form around them. They tried to flee the retreating tidal wave but failed. The tidal wave reached the height of Lugia and swept over the city and took everything with it, revealing the dry ruins of the city underneath it. Some buildings had come out unscratched, a gas station seemed to be intact. Other buildings, like a city mall, were completely torn apart. The tidal waves were harmful to the Gyarados but left the humans and Pokémon unharmed creating gaps wherever needed to keep them out of harm's way. The sea finally returned to the original shoreline and Lugia let out a second cry. The water in the sea began to twist and formed a whirlpool the size of a football field. Lugia dove forward and flew towards the whirlpool, ignoring the city underneath it. And then it was gone. The woman behind the camera managed to find her voice after a full ten seconds of silence. Ayan it seems that Lugia has left the scene. Lugia was the fourth legendary Austin had seen in action and his mind was still processing what he had just witnessed. He began to understand why some people in this world thought of them as gods. They weren't like the level 50 ones in the game that a 10-year-old could catch. True his sample size was small but from what he has gathered legendary Pokémon were truly godlike power-wise. It shouldn't have amazed him like that but it did and Lugia was only the tip of the legendary iceberg. Lugia hadn't even battled, only swatted aside the annoying fly that was Gyarados. And that was only Lugia, what about the other more powerful legendaries? Legendaries in this world were nothing like the ones in the games or anime. And one of them had brought me here in this world, supposedly. It was concerning if legendary Pokémon were this strong and my fate as Ash Ketchum was practically tied to them. What was fate's game plan? Austin woke Yellow as the duo made their way to an open battlefield attracting quite the attention. Austin and Yellow ignored the crowd forming as they pulled out their Pokémon. Go, Dottie. Austin paused for a second if he wanted to shout something cool before sending his Pokémon out. Austin considered it before concluding that it was too childish. In a flash of red, Butterfree appeared on the battlefield. Butterfree glanced at his opponent as he heard a snapping sound from his trainer which caused Butterfree's demeanor to shift showing that he wasn't joking around. Butterfree silently floated above the ground waiting in preparation. Dottie, use Aerial Ace. Dodrio charged forward leaving behind a cloud of dust in its wake. Butterfree didn't move from his spot before suddenly it used Quiver Dance. Dodie's body was like a bullet and before it could reach Butterfree, he found Butterfree's body turning around just as he was about it. Butterfree's Quiver Dance was coordinated masterfully with Dodie's aerial ace in such a way that Butterfree dodged it. The audience's jaw dropped at Butterfree's moves. Butterfree's body glowed with orange highlights as its eyes glowed with psychic energy. Butterfree's use of psychic made the ground beneath Dodie's feet glowed with a blue hue before the ground broke apart as pieces of the soil latched onto Dodie's feet. Dottie, get out of there, Yellow said in worry but Butterfree's psychic caused the soil to burst apart and clump onto Dodie's body. This was a move that Butterfree and Austin had been working on for some time. 
Austin had had Butterfree learn psychics from a trademark and then have him use psychically to solve a 3D puzzle before moving on to much harder practices. With all of this training, Butterfree had mastered the move that Austin had dubbed Quicksand. The dust settled revealing Dottie covered in head-to-toe lumps of soil. Yellow sensed that Dottie had been knocked out. Opening the poke ball, Yellow returned Dottie while she thought. When did Ash get so strong? Omake paragraph. Poliwhirl is a Pokemon commonly found in lakes and rivers where humans swim. Typically, the two coexist peacefully, humans occasionally collide with Poliwhirl because of their water-like color, the Poliwhirl shrugs it off and swims a little deeper next time. Occasionally, an unfortunate swimmer dives too deep into the water and gets lost in the swirl on a Poliwhirl's stomach. Although on land the spiral must deliberately rotate to hypnotize, and even then often fails to so much as put the opponent to sleep, with a background of murky water, and with it undulating as it does when a polywhirl swims the white and black circle gains a special potency. Swimmers are taught from a young age to close their eyes when they dive underwater to avoid the polywhirl swirl, but occasionally one of them forgets to do so or lacks the good sense to listen, catches sight of the swirl, and falls asleep instantly. Typically, they will drown before they wake up. Those who are rescued will unfailingly describe vivid and wonderful dreams, and will inevitably return to the water, over the desperate pleas of loved ones, to have those dreams once again. Chapter number 234 Yellow's Awakening POV Change Opening the poke ball, Yellow returned Dottie while she thought. When did Ash get so strong? Let's go, Tenti. Yellow called out as a tentacle appeared on the battlefield. Poison Sting The middle orb on Tenti's forehead glows purple and it fires multiple purple darts from it at Butterfree. Spin Cannon Austin calmly called out as Butterfree used the spinning motion of Quiver Dance to dodge Poison Sting. Butterfree's body radiated with a powerful aura before it fired an energy ball at Tenti. Dodge. Yellow called out but Butterfree's power-up energy ball was too fast for Tenti to dodge who took the direct brunt of the attack causing Tenti to fly out into Yellow's hands. Austin glanced at the audience before releasing Muna beside him. With the help of Muna, Austin established a psychic connection with Yellow. Yellow, do you hear me? Eh, hey, Ash? Yeah, it's me. Yellow, tell me do you still want to come with me even after seeing just how weak you are? Yellow's hands shook as she registered Austin's words. Sensing her trainer's distress, Kitty's poke ball shook. She touched Kitty's Pokemon as she sensed Kitty's intent. Looking up, Yellow looked at Austin who raised an eyebrow in response. Ash, I am going to show you that I am not a burden. Then show me. Yellow threw a poke ball out that split open revealing a giant bead rill that caused the audience to take a step back. Kitty and Butterfree stared each other down. Ariel slash Yellow called out as Kitty used Ariel Ace to disappear and appear in front of Butterfree as her stringers glowed with a white aura. Protocol 1 Austin called out as Butterfree's psychic enveloped his body. With an unnatural perpendicular turn, Butterfree dodged Kitty's slash. Yellow, I have the high ground. Austin thought with a smirk before calling out to Butterfree. Flash Orb Butterfree's body erupted in a bright light of flash blinding Kitty. B. Kitty screeched out in pain at being blinded as Butterfree gathered ghostly energy into an orb. Yellow's eyes widened as she saw Shadow Ball hit the blinded Kitty. Boom. The Alpha Beat Rill crashed into the ground. Yellow, I don't see evidence that you are not a burden. This is why I pushed you, Brock, and Misty, away. Every one of you would have tried to stop me because Team Rocket is dangerous. I am not going to stop because you guys are weak. Austin's words pierced through Yellow's heart as she closed her eyes. Her mind flashed to every moment she had on her journey. She loved it, she loved seeing the world with her friends but now when her friend was running toward danger, she could do nothing. She hated this feeling of helplessness. She hated this feeling of being a burden. She wasn't a burden. Yellow's eyes opened showing azure-colored eyes. Kitty's injuries began to heal as she pushed herself up. Kitty's body radiated an aura that resembled one of Cynthia's weaker Pokemon. Austin immediately recognized Yellow's ability to temporarily buff a Pokemon to the level of an Elite Four. Austin clicked his tongue as his eyes glowed red for a second. One of Kitty's stingers shot toward Butterfree like a bullet. Chemical Storm Austin screamed out as Butterfree started spinning with a white aura with the surrounding wind picking up and not long after a giant whirlwind formed on the battlefield. Kitty's fell stinger was returned with greater momentum. Kitty slashed the stinger apart before looking up as she saw the entire whirlwind covered in a multitude of colors. Kitty immediately jabbed her stingers into the ground to protect herself from being blown away. 
the audience looked on in anticipation as the chemical storm settled revealing a sleeping alpha beat real. Nightmare Entrapment Austin calmly said as Butterfree's used dream eater. Yellow watched with worry visible on her face as she saw a shadowy silhouette of Butterfree over Kitty. Kitty's body released orbs of light that were absorbed by Butterfree. The entire soil of the battlefield glowed with psychic energy just before clumps of soil rose into balls floating mid-air. Yellow's eyes glowed more as Kitty woke up but it was too late as all the balls of soul bombarded Kitty. Drill! Kitty screamed out in pain. Yellow's eyes flicked for a second as she outstretched her hand toward Kitty. She wanted this battle to stop but Kitty thought otherwise. Fighting back the pain, Kitty looked at Butterfree as an orb of orange forward in her mouth. Seeing the hyperbeam forming, Austin called out. Spiral impact. Kitty shot a hyperbeam at Butterfree whose body was covered by psychic energy. Butterfree flew towards Kitty at high speeds and with the help of a psychic he turned his body to perform a spiral motion around the hyperbeam. The audience's jaw dropped at the awe-inducing spectacle as a purple spiral formed around the beam of white light. Unlike in the games where the compound eyes raise the ability bearer's accuracy by 30%, in this world compound eyes gave the Pokemon extreme levels of spatial awareness. This allowed Butterfree to spiral around Hyperbeam as Butterfree landed with a Giga impact onto the trapped kitty. An explosion covered the entire battlefield. Austin clicked his tongue as he hated this anticipation. The smoke-covered battlefield parted revealing a struggling Beedrill and Butterfree trying to get up. Yellow and the audience looked on as they held their breath meanwhile Austin picked his nose. Pika. Pikachu scolded Austin for his nonchalant attitude. Come on, Pikachu you can't be serious. Austin replied as he said, Roost. Butterfree took a deep breath just as all the injuries covering his body healed meanwhile Kitty crashed into the ground knocked out. Yellow clenched her hands as she returned Kitty. With her head bowed down, a few tears escaped from her eyes. She didn't want to lose her friend as he walked along a path that could result in him losing his life. She didn't want to lose the one person who gave her what she always wanted. Freedom. As Yellow's mind was filled with many overwhelming and negative thoughts, she felt a hand brush against her head. Opening her eyes, Yellow saw Austin looking at her with a smile. Yellow de Viridian Grove, I am going to go on a suicidal journey of destroying the most powerful criminal organization in Kanto and Johto. Would you like to join me? Austin asked before saying, that sounded better in my head. Yellow just chuckled as she hugged Austin. Do you even need an answer? Austin jokingly answered, yes, yes I would like an answer. Yellow answered, then my answer is yes. Omake Paragraph Although Gyarados is the Pokémon that sailors tell frightful legends about encountering, far more sailors have lost their lives in battle to Polyrath. Polyrath possesses muscles nearly as powerful as Macamp and has enough strength to punch through all known types of sailing craft. They remain a danger to this day, as the advent of metal coating and thicker hulls have done little if anything to make this more difficult for their fists. Wild Polyrath is even rarer than Wild Gyarados, it is the trained one sailors must watch out for. Naval combat since the discovery of water stones has been fought below as well as above the surface of the water, as elite squadrons of Polyrath battle platoons of other water Pokemon, seeking to sink the ships which fire powerful cannons and carry soldiers to other battles. More ships are sunk by Polyrath than by other ships, and because of the ever-present danger produced by this Pokemon, navies in the Pokemon world typically rely on small, fast boats which can transport soldiers and supplies as quickly as possible. A large cruiser is a sitting seduck. In light of this, it is unsurprising that the submarine is also known as the mechanical polyrath. Militarily, real polyrath continue to be more valuable, and submarines have been slow to catch on. Chapter number 235 Bill and Austin After everything that had happened in Rhoda, Austin and Yellow booked a flight directly to Fuchsia City, Kanto as they didn't have much to do in the ancient kingdom. Fuchsia City, Pokemon Center Austin's POV Seismic waves of 5.4 on the scale of Groudon, struck this morning in the east part of Johto. There is major damage done to the landscape and it seems that the casualties among Pokemon and humans are relatively low. The earthquake's epicenter was luckily in a wild area and no. I tapped on the screen of my Pokedex and the radio switched to a different station. Nothing important is happening in Johto it seems, though it was interesting to see that people used Groudon as a magnitude scale instead of Richter as my world had. Does this mean they recorded a Groudon-related earthquake once and used that as a 10? Pika. Pikachu complained and pulled a hair lock. I raised an eyebrow, seriously? You want to hear about that? Caesar. Besides the duo, 
Caesar exclaimed and I sighed and switched back to Johto Star Radio, the most important news station according to them. The Poke Dex began playing the radio again and the people in the studio were discussing the aftermath of the earthquake. I tuned it out as Pikachu, Caesar, and Bulbasaur kept listening to it with Pikachu from atop my head. It had been a grave mistake to listen to the radio while these three were nearby because the moment I flipped open the Poke Dex they wanted to listen into, even though I only wanted to do a quick listen to see what was going on, they wanted to listen to it till the end. I guessed that they were starving for entertainment, considering the trio was now paying attention to three nerds talking about seismic waves and they genuinely seemed to like it. Guess I had to get them a book sometime in the future but Caesar already had a secret stash of rom-com novels which Caesar very convincingly threatened me to not tell anyone so looks like I have to put that on the shopping list, otherwise I wouldn't be able to do something useful. It was kind of funny though, the fact that I considered an earthquake unimportant news. In my old world it would be big news but living in this world has changed my view on a lot of subjects. Hey, Ash. Yellow, I told you to call me Austin from now on. Yellow placed her hands on her hips and said, If you are not going to use my secret undercover nickname then I am not going to use yours. Sigh, Yellow, I am not calling you Miss Clam Chowder. Then what about the other nicknames I suggested? Yellow asked as she suddenly ducked as Firo flew by. So as I was saying, you can call me by the other names. Which ones, Miss Choco Loco, the Sunday Surprise, or Miss Doom Supreme? Uh-huh, that makes me hungry. Austin face palmed himself at Yellow who was rubbing her stomach. Putting aside your horrible naming sense. Hey. Did you feed everyone? About that. What happened? It's your new Pokemon. Mana. No, that weird bug type that never talks. Ninjisk. No, the other one. Shed Ninja. That's the one, I can't for the love of me. Remember his name. Shed Ninja is not a male, Yellow. Then it's a she. No, it is genderless. What does that mean? It isn't a male or a female. I still don't get it, then what is Shed Ninja? Do I look like a scientist to you? Well, you always seem to know the answer to everything. Thank you. You are welcome but Shed Ninja doesn't seem to be eating. Hmm. Here, Shed Ninja, Austin said, pointing at his bowl. Breakfast. Shed Ninja stood there. See. What did I tell you, Yellow said in a tone that said that she was proud of herself. Eat your breakfast, Austin said as he ignored Yellow. Shed Ninja scuttled forward and began rapidly devouring the food. Austin and Yellow watched until it had eaten every last crumb and began gnawing on the bowl. That's enough, Shed Ninja. Austin stopped. Austin looked at Yellow. I don't know what to tell you, Yellow said, shrugging. Suddenly the Pokemon Center intercom spoke out. A call for Mr. Ketchum is coming. Mr. Ketchum if you are listening please come to the front desk. Well that must be Bill calling, I am going to the front desk. Yellow, can you look after everyone while I am gone? I can, Yellow said with determination in her eyes as Austin nodded before leaving. As Austin left the room, Yellow turned when she felt a tap on her shoulders. Hello. Yellow said as she saw a cake in front of her in the hands of one of her friend's new Pokemon, Haunter. Hello there Haunter, is there something I can help you with? Haunter innocently pushed the cake into Yellow's hands before disappearing, leaving behind a very confused Yellow. So are you alright Bill? Austin asked with concern as he saw Bill's black eye. Don't worry, Lucario was quite the handful. I accidentally sneaked up on him and this was the result. Well, I have to keep that in mind. And Bill did you get what I asked for? Well, for your concern it was really hard to get. It wasn't me who asked for more time with Lucario. Fair enough, but I have to ask what are you doing with all of these things? Bill asked curiously. Austin paused for a second before replying, the attack on SS. Anne taught me that I am weak so I am going to use this opportunity to make myself stronger before going back to the gym challenge. Well, that is great. Ash, you can plug in your poke decks and I will transfer all the data you asked for. Thanks, Bill. It's not you who should be thanking me but I Ash, thank you for giving me this great opportunity to talk to a Pokemon. Austin smiled as he plugged his Pokedex into the cable. So should I send in the duo? Yet. Yeah. The slots between the screen glowed with a bright light. The slots opened revealing two Pokeballs, an Ultra Ball and a normal Pokeball. The Luxury Ball is Lucario's Pokeball and the second one is the Pokemon you requested from me. 
that Pokemon has been domesticated from the time it was born so it may take a while for it to get the hang of battling. It doesn't matter how long it takes and Bill, thanks for everything. Well, I have to get back to my work and Ash. Yeah. Can you get me a few samples of Venonat's blood? Why? You remember that weird question you asked me if Venonat and Butterfree's evolution had some similarities? Not the exact question I asked but yet. Well, I am now skeptical about the research that was done on the topic and I wanted to do some experiments of my own. I'll get you the samples. How many do you need? A dozen will suffice. How will you get the samples from me? Ash, you don't know. Know what? That the same technology used to transport pokeballs can be used to transport small items. Really? Of course. Oh, yeah before I forget, I will transport the proper equipment you need for the job. Austin nodded as he saw a much bigger slot glow and open up revealing a white bag. If you need anything, just call me. Author note, guess what Austin's new Pokemon is? Omega Paragraph. Apart from the legendary beasts and a few other divinities, Abra is the only Pokemon that has truly learned the fear of man. While most Pokemon attack trainers and a few, like Chansey and Tauros, wait to determine if the trainer is hostile, Wild Abra responds to any encounter with a human by teleporting away. For generations, it was believed that this was because Abra can only use this technique, but recent observations from far off have revealed that they are also capable of using every technique known by a Kadabra of equivalent experience. It is simply that Abra never uses them in the wild, and once trained refuses to use other attacks until a trainer has proven his OR herself by sticking with it until it evolves. Abra is the youngest form of the super-intelligent Alakazam and possesses a remarkable talent for mind reading. Perhaps they fear human contact so much more than other Pokemon because they alone can truly see the wretched minds of mankind. Then again, perhaps this is only a childish, black and white understanding of human nature, Abra, after all, evolves into Kadabra. Chapter number 236 Lucario and Austin Austin looked at Lucario's Ultra Ball as it suddenly opened up. Austin had barely time to cry out before he found himself in a familiar chokehold. Let me go. Oh, it's you. Lucario released Austin, letting the human scramble away from him. Austin frantically brushed himself off, as if the Pokémon's touch still held some power over him. He glared at Lucario, pulling himself back to his feet with the help of the nearby cabinetry. God damn it, Austin hissed, smacking the newfound switch on his Pokedex to light up the dark room but it was unnecessary as the backup generator switched on showering the two of them with artificial light. Lucario stared wide-eyed up at the low lamps across the ceiling, but Austin ignored his innocent surprise. Is this how it's always gonna be between us? You shouldn't sneak up on me. I didn't sneak up on you. Oh, really then why did I open my eyes from that contraption into a dark room? I don't know. The lights suddenly went off when your poke ball opened. Austin curiously found that Lucario was standing as if transfixed. What's wrong? Austin asked. We aren't in Rota anymore. Yeah, we are in Kanto. Lucario's ears dropped down reminding Austin of a sad dog. What's wrong? It's nothing, I just wanted to look upon my home before coming to Kanto. I am sorry, I didn't know. Couldn't you have summoned me in Rota? Lucario curiously asked. Austin puckered his lips before saying his white lie, I couldn't since there wasn't any transport machine or PC in Rota. What's a transport machine? Like this. Austin pointed at the screen beside them. Nurse Joy opened the call room as she heard the sounds of something being torn apart. Nurse Joy saw Austin trying to light a cigarette while Lucario tore apart the screen. Nurse Joy was too dumbfounded to say anything. I'll pay for it. Sure to which sugar daddy should I contact? Nurse Joy sardonically said. How much is it? Austin asked with a helpless tone. 10, 000. Nurse Joy answered. Catch. Whoosh. Nurse Joy glanced at the item she had caught as her eyes widened. In her hand was a stack of 10,000 poke dollars. I am sure that is enough to cover the cost. Please close the door on your way out. Nurse Joy obliged as she closed the door while glancing at the stack of money in her hand. Are trainers these days this rich? Should I become a Pokemon trainer? Hearing the sounds of Lucario, Nurse Joy thought. On second thought. Maybe I shouldn't become a Pokemon trainer. Lucario paused to touch the Pokenav he had snatched from Austin, not able to make heads or tails of its odd design. Austin came up alongside him. 
Lucario eyed the tool with far less reverence before returning his attention to the Pokémon in front of him. So you don't remember, being in that crystal all this time. Small mercies, Lucario muttered, touching the cool plastic handle before pulling back with a start. It was quite unlike any material he had ever seen forged before. His eyes fell back upon the strange young man standing next to him. The future was still too foreign. I want to apologize for breaking that stranger transport machine. Sigh, don't worry, you were just curious. I already paid for the damages. Sir Austin, I promise you that I will return the money to you. It's not a problem, Lucario, you promised me that you will teach me the ways of Aura and you accepted to being my Pokémon and I am responsible for anything you do. Lucario frowned before asking, does that mean I am your servant? No, no, being my Pokémon means that you are my family. It's your choice. If you want you can destroy your Pokeball and leave any time you want. You are a kind man just like Sir Aaron. Master Austin, thank you for accepting me into your family. Austin's sweat dropped at Lucario's nightly words. Sure. Master Austin, may I ask how one earns money at this time? There are many ways but the highest way is through Pokemon battles. I didn't know there was a war going on in Kanto. There isn't, Austin replied with confusion visible on his face. Then how does one earn money through battle if there isn't a war? Lucario curiously asked as they climbed the stairs with Lucario and Austin ignoring the gazes of everyone who looked at them. I am confused. What was your question Lucario? Master Austin, if there isn't a war then what is the purpose of Pokemon battles? Suddenly it clicked in Austin's mind as he asked, Lucario, were Pokemon battles in war a means of earning in your time? Yes, is that not the case in the future? Nope. Then what is the purpose of battle if not for the safety of the land and people? Entertainment, I guess. Entertainment, entertainment. What barbaric times have I gone to? Battle in the name of entertainment Lucario replied as if he was offended by the very notion of Pokemon battles for entertainment. Well, we can't help it. Times change. Austin tried to calm Lucario down which seemed to work. I guess Master Austin is right. Lucario, why do you call me Master Austin? Because I have been accepted into your family. It is only right that I call you Master. You can call me Austin. I wouldn't dare. Austin chuckled at Lucario's words. Lucario, don't call me Master in front of other people or they'll think you into BDSM, Austin replied with a giggle. What? Nothing it was just a joke. Was I supposed to laugh? Lucario curiously asked causing Austin to blush in embarrassment as he realized his immature joke. Seeing Austin's embarrassment, Lucario tried to muster a laugh. Forget it, you're just making it more embarrassing, Austin replied. My apologies. Lucario curiously looked around the halls they were walking in. Lucario, can I ask you something? Yes. Why were your eyes closed when you were released from the staff? I was temporarily blinded before I was sealed. When I was released, I sensed your aura which was the same as that of Sir Aaron's which caused me to attack you. Mistakes happen I guess. So are your eyes okay? Thank you for your concern but the witch doctor was able to fix my eyes. Witch doctor? Do you mean Bill? Yes, Sir Bill was able to treat me back to health and he even gave me a delectable treat that I still can't forget. It was like the flavors of heavens were washing over my tongue. Uh, hi, Austin replied as he opened the door to his room which revealed a mess. Cake batter and cream cover most of the carpets. Caesar, Pikachu, and Bulbasaur were watching something on Yellow's poke decks while everyone else was running around trying to clean the mess. A cake-covered Yellow spoke up, Ash, I can explain. Lucario curiously asked Austin, is this some kind of greeting ritual in the future? Austin released a big sigh as he opened his cigarette pack only to find it empty. God damn it. Oh make paragraph. It is quite rare for any Pokemon not of the dark type to become seen as a symbol of evil but the usage of Kadabra during the war has made them more than deserving of that title. In battle, of course, they were no more good or evil than any other Pokémon, but their usage on prisoners of war is the sort of atrocity one would expect of Darkrai, not a psychic like Kadabra. It is no accident that the torture squads of the regime whose name is forbidden to be spoken had two lightning bolt SS on their uniforms. Officially, they stood for Soul Silver, the name of the paramilitary order but they were quite clearly based on the markings which appear on every Cadabra's stomach. Most of these trainers carried Cadabra, and they would enthusiastically take part in the abuse of prisoners of war and captured dissidents. After the war, 
most of those who were broken said that they could endure thumbscrews, the rack, and waterboarding, but not the agony of Cadabra's personalized psychic attacks. Chapter number 237 A Shy New Companion Lucario happily ate the chocolate in his hand as he saw Austin helping Yellow dry her hair. Let me guess, Haunter. Yet. Yeah. Yellow meekly replied as she was very embarrassed about the mess that was made. So who is he? Yellow curiously asked as she looked at Lucario. Well, he is one of the new members of my team. Oh, yet. Yeah. Austin realized something as he took a poke ball from his Pokemon before opening it. In a flash of light, a light purple or pink blob-like Pokemon with vestigial facial features. With an amorphous, but relatively consistent appearance including two small nubs on its head, a few soft lumps at its base, and two pseudopod-like protrusions in place of arms. The face consists of beady eyes and a simple mouth, almost pulled into a smile. As soon as Ditto saw Austin and Yellow looking at him, he froze up and transformed into a coffee mug. Yellow poked the coffee mug as it shivered. I think he is shy. Yellow said as Austin replied meanwhile Lucario was shocked to see Ditto. Never before had he seen such a creature with such an abysmally disgusting aura. To Lucario Ditto's aura was like that of someone who had their aura taken and ran it through a meat grinder several times. Pikachu and the others glanced at Ditto before going back to their own business. Yellow giggled as she kept poking the shivering coffee mug. Yellow, stop that. Sorry. Austin ignored the pouting Yellow as he saw with a smile. Nice to meet you Ditto. I am your new trainer. A face formed on the coffee mug that glanced at Austin's hand. Austin found Ditto's quivering face on the coffee mug to be quite adorable. Don't you want to come and meet your new family? Family. Ditto wondered as he glanced at everyone who was doing their own thing. Ditto's lips quivered as thoughts filled his head. What if everyone ignores me because I am too boring? Similar negative thoughts filled his head but Ditto didn't have enough time to process them as Lucario picked it up. What kind of creature are you? Lucario wondered out loud causing Ditto to shut his eyes and stop moving. Lucario, please put Ditto down you are scaring him. As you wish, Lucario replied as he put Ditto in his mug form down on the table before resuming his consumption of the greatest food in the world, chocolate. Well, let me introduce ourselves. I am Ash and she is Yellow. Austin said but was cut off by Yellow who finished the sentence. But you can call us, Austin and Miss Choco Loco. No, Yellow we are not using those names. Oh, are you also thinking of a new nickname? Yellow's eyes shined with sparkles. Sigh, Austin tried to take out a cigarette only to remember that he was all out. You know what, I am going to head to the store. Want anything? Austin asked the Yellow who was still poking Ditto in his mug form. No, I am good. Can I come along? Lucario asked with his paws covered in chocolate. Sure but first clean yourself up. Of course, I would clean myself up, do I look like a savage to you? Lucario replied with a huff as he jumped towards the bathroom. Okay, Bulbasaur, can you please take care of Ditto while I am gone? Bulba. Thanks, buddy, I am going to get a star poke treat. Bulba. Bulbasaur smiled in happiness but Austin's words caused everyone but Shed Ninja to glance at him. Fine, I'll get everyone a poke treat. Unlike the other cities of Kanto, Fuchsia City seemed to be heavily influenced by Japanese culture. All of the buildings were in the classic Japanese style. Aside from being home to the Poison Type Gym and one of the Battle Chateau's locations, Fuchsia City also had many attractions and festivals. Fuchsia City is one of the cleanest cities in all of Kanto because of the legislation passed 70 years ago in which it was stated that rather than cars and roadways here, Fuchsia City promotes the use of more bicycles or walking for travel here hence why it is well known for its greenery and wildlife and the cleanliness of this city is the reason why residents and Pokemon enjoy a healthy lifestyle. Fuchsia City is well known for its wildlife preservation areas such as the Safari Zone, Austin read out loud. So they need to keep the place clean so it's healthy for all of the Pokemon here, Lucario stated. Right, Austin confirmed with a nod. Oh, I would love to go to a festival. Here Yellow commented as she clasped her hands together. The strange contraption says that there is the annual Pokemon Trainers Festival in two days at the city square. We can attend that one, Lucario spoke up as he looked over Austin's shoulder. Come on, Lucario that's rude. My apologies. Austin said as he glanced at Bulbasaur walking beside them. Bulbasaur had Ditto on his head in the form of a small hat which Yellow had gushed over. Ditto had formed a bond with Bulbasaur as Bulbasaur was patient enough to wait for the shy Pokemon to come out on his own unlike Wardertle, Muna, 
Clefable, and Ninjisk's extroverted nature had overwhelmed the little guy. Firo and Caesar didn't care that much for the new addition except for Lucario. Pikachu, Butterfree, and Charm Leon had tried to approach Ditto but had given up after an hour of sitting in front of a stationary mug. Pidgeot and Kingler didn't even try after seeing everyone fail and Shed Ninja was well Shed Ninja. After this, no one would be able to get some kind of relaxing day to themselves. Austin thought as he thought of all the plans he had for the future before replying. I think attending this festival will give everyone a nice break. Yay! Yellow cheered in happiness. Omake paragraph. It is one of prehistory's greatest oddities that it is man and not Alakazam who became the world's dominant species. It would seem to anyone that Alakazam was primed for dominance, their intelligence is so vast that human tests fail at measuring, and the opposable thumb is far inferior to telekinesis. And yet it is man which rules from Unova to Kanto, and Alakazam which are primarily found within poke balls. Otter still, Alakazam do not use their brains to command armies, manage economies, or any of the other myriad tasks that intelligent humans and supercomputers perform, perhaps their trainers fear that, given such authority, they would rebel. Or perhaps they find these tasks so simple and unappealing that they refuse them as an insult to their genius. These Pokémon have excellent brains for the recollection of memory, but little in the way of creativity, and they were not able to invent civilization. Alakazam has declined to answer, however, and humans lack the intelligence to comprehend their minds. It is currently believed that most Alakazam spend their days in unrelenting sorrow, so intelligent that nothing occupies their mind and this sorrow is one which dulls mental acuity. A powerful brain is more a hindrance than a help for those who spend all their time moping, a piece of wisdom that Alakazam know all too well. Chapter number 238 talks about Aura Part 1. It was now nighttime in Fuchsia City, and the group had taken to explore the sites for a little bit. As expected, it was very lively and riddled with Japanese culture. There were booths set up all in a line all across from each other selling an assortment of food and offering other activities. Austin and Lucario wasted no time in going straight for some of the delicious food while Yellow decided to look at different kimono outfits at a particular stall. I bet I would look really cute in this, Yellow commented while she looked a particular one over. Yellow blushed as she thought what Austin would think before her poke ball opened up and ten tackle popped out. Yellow smiled at it and knelt to be more eye-level with it. What is it, Tenti? She asked kindly. Cool, it replied while pointing at the kimono. You want me to try it on, too? Yellow asked, receiving a nod from the tentacle. Well, I guess so, Yellow said slowly as she took it off the hanger and went behind a folded curtain to change. Meanwhile, Austin and Lucario were staring at the various types of sushi in hunger. Austin immediately went to grab a piece of sushi with his hand, but it was soon slapped away by Lucario. Master Austin, you should know better. Use chopsticks to grab sushi instead of your hands, Lucario scolded slightly. Right. I guess I got carried away, Austin said sheepishly before getting a pear from a stack off to the side. Chuyu, Pikachu poked at Austin's shoulder once Austin began eating the sushi. Oh? You want some too, Pikachu? Austin asked the rodent receiving a nod in the affirmative. Austin handed a piece to Pikachu who promptly put it in its mouth. The rodent chewed and smiled at the great flavor, but something was wrong. Chaaaaa! Pikachu cried as it began running around in circles frantically. Sorry, buddy. I accidentally gave you the extra spicy kind, Austin said apologetically. Pikachu quit running and glared at Austin. Austin could tell by the look Pikachu was giving him that he would be in for a thunder shock later. This sushi is delicious. Here is some for you, Charm Leon. Austin smiled as he gave some to the hybrid Pokemon. Char. Charm Leon exclaimed in delight once it tasted the food but quickly tried to hit his happiness in a veil of indifference. Too cool for sushi, hey? Austin asked with a chuckle. To which Charm Leon just puffed out his chest. Chuckle. Austin smiled as he glanced at Bulbasaur giving Ditto some sushi who was shyly eyeing the Japanese cuisine. Tenta. Tenta, Tenti muttered as it wandered alongside Oddish over to the group. Oh hey, Austin greeted once they saw it. Why aren't you with Yellow? Oddish. Dish replied as it pointed to a folding curtain a short distance away. Soon, Yellow emerged from behind the curtain somewhat shyly wearing the kimono outfit. She also had her hair down out of the usual side ponytail. She then made her way over to Ash and Lucario, followed by Dottie. She did a slight pose for the group before asking their opinion. Hey. How do I look? She asked nervously. 
You look lovely, like a true princess, Lucario answered as he ate his sushi with chocolate he had melted on Charmeleon's tail. Pika, pie. Austin jumped and raised his thumbs as he pretended to chew his sushi. He knew he didn't want to add more fuel to the fire that was Yellow's crush. Dish, Oddish. Dish yelled as it turned red and fell over on its back. Uh, Dish. Yellow asked it. Ha ha ha. I think Oddish fainted due to how great you looked, Lucario told her. Yellow just blushed in embarrassment. Attention, everyone. Our traditional kimono dance this month will be performed by our very own Janine in five minutes. Please make your way over to the stage at the front, a male's voice said over the intercom. That sounds like fun. Yellow exclaimed. Once the group had made their way over to the outside stage, it was apparent there weren't any seats available to sit in. They managed to get in front of everyone and stood the closest to the stage so they had the best view. By the time the lights on the stage dimmed and the curtain rose. Behind the curtain was a young girl with shoulder-length dark purple hair. She wore a traditional black kimono outfit with matching black sandals. She stood in a pose where she had one fan in each hand. One was outstretched and the other one was covering her face. She then gracefully moved the fan away from her face to reveal brown eyes and a lovely smile before she began to dance. Austin's eyes narrowed as he saw the future gym leader of Fuchsia City and the daughter of the current gym leader, Koga. Lucario glanced at Austin who was on edge since his mind threw in the possibility of Koga being a part of Team Rocket. If that were the case, what should I do? Austin wondered as Janine continued the dance as everyone watched her movements. Her moves were so mysterious and intriguing, yet so beautiful. It was clear Janine must have undergone much practice to get the dance just right. She then began to move towards the group until she was just in front of Austin, causing him to tilt his head in confusion. She gave him an alluring smile and a wink before gracefully moving back towards the stage. Austin's face didn't change one bit at the gesture that Janine had given him. Yellow, meanwhile, turned red but looking at Austin's deadpan face calmed her down. The dance went on for a few more minutes before finally ending. Everyone applauded the superb job Janine had done. As she left the stage, she looked towards the group and gave another wink that Austin could have sworn was directed at him. With that, she disappeared behind the curtain. Austin stood transfixed for a moment, staring at the place where Janine had left before Lucario waved his palm in front of his face. Are you all right? Lucario called as he felt a spike in aura from him. Yeah, I am all right. Let's go, the night is still young. Let's enjoy this festival. Austin said he released everyone from their pokeballs. Under Bulbasaur's leadership, the group of Pokemon enjoyed themselves in the booths, burning away their trainer's wallet. Later in the night, Austin and Lucario sat on the side of the benches in comfortable silence. May I ask what had got you so tense? Lucario asked as ate his cotton candy. You know that girl who winked at me, I think she might be related to the evil organization I told you about. I beg to differ, that girl who made your maiden jealous had a pure aura to her. A little annoyed Austin replied, I'll take your word for it and yellow isn't my maiden, Lucario. Could have fooled me. Her aura is always filled with joy when she is with you and your aura also has spikes of happiness with you are with her. That's because we are friends. Hmm, maybe times have changed for friends to have such beautiful spikes in the aura around each other. Can you tell me more about aura? Lucario took a deep breath before saying, Ki, or Chi or Wave are the maybe different names humans have given it. Aura is the life force that fills up all the space inside a person or Pokemon's body. It makes up every living thing and each person has their own unique for lack of a better word, look. Is there a difference between aura and the soul? Austin asked as he wondered why his aura was similar to Sir Aaron's. In canon, Ash could use aura and he could have been related to Aaron but what about him? He wasn't Ash so why was his aura similar or did he have Ash's soul inside his body? Aura is the life energy that flows through the soul while the soul is something that could be called the being's whole existence. I don't follow, Austin said to which Lucario replied. Of course, you didn't. When did I start showing you the path to follow? Jokes aside, the best way to describe the difference is that if aura disappears then the person dies but if the soul disappears then the person is gone. Can you elaborate? A little annoyed Lucario said, when a person's aura disappears they have a chance to be reborn as something else but if a person's soul is gone then they are gone for good. There is no second chance, there is no new life it's just that, snap, the end. Austin's mind was filled with many thoughts. Can other Pokémon learn the art of aura? Yes and no, it depends on their aptitude and amount of aura. Since I can somewhat use aura, 
how much do I possess? Lucario burst out laughing at Austin's words. What? Sorry, sorry, I just found it hilarious that you said you can use aura. Human, you aren't using aura, you're just releasing your aura in bursts. Oh. Aura is heavily linked with your emotions, the more intense an emotion the greater the burst of the aura is. Yeah. You're right. Of course I am. Omega paragraph. Machip has long tossed around boulders with super strength and jumped over skyscrapers, but it is only with the advent of comics that they became seen as Pokemon that fight crime. In the old days, their ability to smash walls and windows and lift heavy objects made them the favorite of criminals, not young children and the police. All that changed three generations ago, when an art student Machip saved his life from an armed burglar in the crime-riddled metropolis of Saffron. The people longed for a hero, and if only he had the strength and speed of a Machip, perhaps he could be one. Of course, humans didn't have that power, Machip wasn't smart enough to use it effectively, and no man could get to every crime in the city fast enough. When he solved those problems through fiction, the Machip Man comics were born. The franchise has occasionally struggled but has survived multiple canon reboots and inspired many movies. Although Marvel Scales Ariados Man has occasionally provided competition, Machip Man, as the name is now written, remains a cultural icon, is the best known and most popular of the superpower genre it inspired, and has become surprisingly popular in Or and Unova, across the sea from its creator's native land. Chapter number 239 talks about Aura Part 2. Why do you think that the girl has any relation with the evil organization? Lucario asked as he licked his paws. Her father may or may not be a member of the organization, Austin answered while slapping away Lucario's paws. Please, don't use my cardigan to clean your paws. It is your fault for wearing a bathrobe. This isn't a bathrobe. Looks like a bathrobe, it feels like a bathrobe then it is a bathrobe. Austin didn't even try to answer back as he saw Bulbasaur walking to them. What is it, buddy? Bulba. Bulbasaur's vines outstretched a sleeping ditto towards them. Don't worry, I can take care of him. You have fun out there and please don't let Charm Leon and Wardertle destroy this place. I don't think the money from two sponsors and the Pokemon League associate position is going to cover it. Bulba. Bulbasaur saluted with his vines as he hopped like a frog back to his friends. Lucario asked while Austin was carefully placing Ditto on his lap. How can you be sure that the girl's father is part of it? I have a few friends that are currently helping me with battling against the organization and they informed me that there is a possibility that the girl's father is a part of it. Lucario nodded as sneakily used Austin's cardigan to clean his paws. You didn't answer my question, can any of my Pokemon learn Aura? I have to check, Lucario answered while happily eating another chocolate bar he manifested from somewhere. And when can we start with my training? About that. Is something wrong? No, I wanted to ask how you want to proceed with your Aura training. What do you mean? Remember I told you that everyone has a specific amount of Aura they are born with? It is not the case for Pokemon but it is the case for humans who can't increase their Aura amount. You never said anything like that. Oh, well now I told you about it. What does that have to do with my training? It matters when you are a human, you, my friend have an extremely large amount of aura. Is that good or bad? Austin asked while he tried not to wake Ditto up. Depends on how you look at it. If you want fast results then that is not possible since the more aura you have, the harder time you will have in gaining full control over it but in the future, your abilities would be stronger than someone with a lower amount of aura. Sigh, can't we do something like store aura in a different part of the body in small amounts and use the aura that way instead? Austin asked curiously but his question seemed to cause Lucario to stand up in shock. Lucario, are you alright? Austin asked in worry. No, I am fine. Wait here, I will be back soon. W, what? Austin asked but before he could question Lucario any further the aura Pokemon seemed to teleport away with just pure speed. Was it something I said? Ditto's POV. Warmth. I only felt it when I hatched from my egg but after that, I never experienced the warmth. Every day I would wake up in the cold storage unit I was kept. The glass door of the storage unit was my window to the world. I would see humans take out others similar to me and then inject them with some kind of liquid before taking them out of the room. I was never taken out because of my age and that was all I could ever see and all I could ever have known about the world. Then one day, the humans took me out. I was afraid to do anything. I was afraid of the unknown. But unlike the others, the humans used this spherical ball on me. 
why would a great researcher like Bill request a ditto? Who knows maybe he wants to expand the scope of breeding. These were the last words Ditto heard before he woke up in front of Austin and the others. What is this warmth, I feel? Excuse me. Hearing these loud words, I woke up to find myself in the arms of the human who called himself my trainer. Ditto, don't worry Bulbasaur is here. I saw my trainer say these words as he placed me down and the warmth I felt was gone. I scrambled as I saw my trainer's back. I outstretched my hand as he clasped his arm. This warmth. Feeling Ditto's stub against his arm Austin turned around to see Ditto shyly looking at him. Do you want to come with me? Ditto slowly nodded as Austin picked him up. Excuse me, would you like to buy a special Magi carp? Austin's eyes lit up as he recognized the man from the anime. The infamous Magi carp seller. Hmm, a Magi carp, isn't that the Pokemon known for its uselessness? Austin decided to play the ignorant customer card. Yes. Magi Carp is useless but if you buy a Magi Carp from a Pink Egg then it would evolve into a Mighty Gyarados. Pink Egg. The Con Man. Ahem. Salesman smirked as he unveiled his portable aquarium showing Austin a lone Piscine Pokemon with large, heavy pink scales. It had large, vacant eyes and pink lips. Its pectoral and tail fins are white. On its back is a stiff, three-peaked yellow fin, resembling a crown, there is an identical fin on its underside. Its long pale yellow barbels told Austin that it was a male. What shocked Austin was the discoloration of the Magi Carp. Shouldn't shiny Magi Carp be golden or is this Magi Carp from the Pinkin Island of the Orange Islands Archipelago or is this a new breed of shiny Pokemon? How about it, this legendary Pokemon will be a great addition to your team. How much? 500 poke dollars. Pfft, this is a scam. Austin turned around to leave but the salesman asked, then what do you think should be the appropriate price? 100 poke dollars. Very funny, sir but I can decrease the price to 400 for you. Austin replied, 200 poke dollars. Please, sir I have a family to feed. I can't do anything less but just for you, I will decrease the price to 300 poke dollars. Decrease your price to 250 and you have a deal. Well, I don't normally do this but just for you. The con man said with a strained smile as he took the money before throwing the pink magi carp at Austin before running away. Austin quickly caught the fish Pokemon as Ditto jumped up and hide behind Austin's shoulders. Austin chuckled as he felt Ditto peer over his shoulder to look at the magi carp who was remarkably calm, content, and not gasping or struggling at all, he wondered how many water Pokemon with gills breathed air. I don't have any Pokeballs with me right now. Is it okay for you to stay outside like this? Carp. I am going to take that as a yes. Carp. Omake paragraph. From the dawn of philosophy, men have struggled to make peace with the usage of Machoke as beasts of burden. Unlike Torchic, Oddish, and other farm Pokemon, Machoke is a fighting type not that different from our ancestors. Although known for their strength, they are fairly intelligent beasts. And while a Miltank can graze for most of its life, enduring nothing worse than milking before slaughter, Machoke works long hours breaking boulders in caves, pulling tractors, or other strenuous tasks, often with a Bulbasaur as overseer vine whipping them when they slow down. Pokemon rights activists have battled the poor treatment of Machoke for centuries but with little success. Unlike many Pokemon, and humans, which need breaks to ensure productivity, Machoke will work at full effectiveness until they collapse from exhaustion and typically return to the field or revive or Pokemon Center trip later. Furthermore, while the pain and monotony of their work do have an impact on them, Machoke is loyal Pokemon who would sooner endure abuse with a grim countenance than break the chains which symbolically bind them, symbolically, as humans have yet to invent chains strong enough to hold a Machoke. Occasionally, a Machoke does escape, but they rarely do anything to help their cause. Typically, at least in Kanto, these Machoke find their way to Team Rocket or other criminal organizations, who offer them a better trainer and the chance to test their muscles in combat as virtually all fighting Pokemon desire. Chapter number 240 The Ninja Janine It was the next day when Yellow and Austin made it to the Fuchsia City Gym. Ash, where is Lucario? Yellow asked curiously. I don't know. He went out last night and hasn't come back. Aren't you worried? No, I trust Lucario's ability to take care of himself, Austin said as he puffed out his cigarette. In times of stress, a cigarette always calms him down. Pikachu jumped from Austin's shoulder to Yellow's due to the smell of nicotine burning his nose. Pika, pie. Pikachu gagged as he pointed at the cigarette to which Austin just rubbed his head. 
Yellow blushed due to the proximity between her and Austin. Shouldn't we be looking for Team R? Yellow innocently asked as Austin was quick enough to stop her from completing the sentence. Not right now. Seeing the serious look on Austin's face, Yellow quickly nodded. Ah, why are we in the gym? I'll tell you later, Austin said as he looked around himself suspiciously. He was in a gym where trained ninjas lived, and here the walls had ears. Yellow pouted at Austin's words. Just like all of the other buildings in Fuchsia City, except for the Pokemon Center, the Fuchsia Gym was a reference to Japanese culture. It seemed all of the gyms the group had been to had their differences to make them unique. Pewter City's gym looked like a giant boulder. Cerulean City's gym looked like a giant aquarium. In the case of Fuchsia City's gym, it looked like an ancient Japanese castle. The duo opened the sliding doors and stepped in. The inside of the gym looked very much like the Vermilion Gym, just minus the hulking soldiers and a lot bigger. There was no sign of the gym leader or anyone else for that matter. Yellow figured a place this large would be overflowing with people, but it was quite the opposite. Hello. Yellow called as she stepped further into the building. Once again, there was no response. I guess we should try looking around, Austin suggested as he wondered if the gym was like the anime or games. Yellow nodded and continued to walk further into the gym until she bumped into something hard. Ooh, Yellow said as she rubbed her nose painfully. What's wrong, Austin asked but in his mind, he had already figured it out. This gym was like the games. Even with that discovery, Austin silently thanked whatever deity was out there since he didn't want to go to that Bobby Trap laid horror gym from the anime. There's something here that's blocking the way, but I don't see anything, Yellow told Austin in confusion. Hmm. Austin muttered as he brought off his fist and knocked on the hard substance before making his conclusion. It's an invisible wall. Why is there an invisible wall here? Furthermore, if there is one here, how are we supposed to look around? Yellow asked in exasperation. Austin pushed against a nearby wall, and to Yellow's great surprise, the wall flipped horizontally which sent her falling to the other side. Whoa. A trick wall, Yellow muttered as her eyes sparkled. It looked like this room was no different than the one before it. It was just another large, empty room. This place is really weird, Yellow said as they looked around the room. How are we even supposed to find the gym leader if there are invisible walls and trick doors all over the place? Austin meanwhile was on edge as he remembered the anime episode where this place was rigged by bobby traps, slanted walls and hordes of explosive Volturb. Yellow's question was soon answered, however. The group heard a cry of hi as a throwing star was thrown right past Yellow and Pikachu's faces. It embedded into the wall behind them, causing the two to freeze. Haunter Austin whispered as his shadow outstretched into the darkness. Let's end this cat and mouse game before it begins. Chuyu, Pikachu said nervously. Just then, another ninja star flew through the air. It once more sailed right past Yellow and Pikachu's faces. Hey! Who's throwing those? Yellow yelled across the room but saw no one. Yellow closed her eyes to sense who was throwing those. Kaye. A voice soon hollered across the room again. The duo then saw a figure be dragged from seemingly nowhere as Haunter's hand held the figure upside down. The figure was revealed to be a young girl with dark purple hair tied back in a spiky ponytail and brown eyes. There was something familiar about her. Upon a closer inspection, Yellow let out a gasp of surprise as she realized she was the girl who danced the previous night. Wait. You're that kimono girl. What are you doing here? Yellow exclaimed. I think a better question is what are you doing here? Janine replied smartly. Well Miss Wannabe Ninja, I am Ash Ketchum. I'm here to challenge the Fuchsia City Gym Leader for a soul badge Austin said as he snapped his fingers causing Haunter to let go of Janine who landed with a backflip midair. Pi Pikachu Pikachu and Yellow clapped at Janine's acrobatics. A soul badge, you say? Janine smiled slyly as a glint appeared in her eye. If that's the case, you will have to beat me to get it. You mean you're the gym leader of Fuchsia City? Austin exclaimed as Yellow and Pikachu put on surprised faces. Does that mean Koga is an elite four of the Johto League? Or is this situation similar to the anime where I defeat Janine and Koga pops up? That's right. Graceful as a Nine Tails, swift as a Rapidash, deadly as a Scyther. The Ninja Janine of Fuchsia City Gym. That's me. Janine finished with a pose. Well, Janine. I challenge you to a battle. Austin stated as he brought out a poke ball. I accept your challenge, Ash. Janine answered with a smile. 
It will be a three-on-three -three Pokemon match. Only you can make substitutions. If you win, the soul badge is yours. Sounds good to me. If you lose. Janine added with a smirk and winked, you have to go on a date with me. Wait, what? Omake paragraph. To the majority of Macamp, dodging or blocking an attack is the height of cowardice. All Macamp are champions, if only in their heads, and a champion will endure whatever attacks are thrown at it, to the point of running into an attack if it appears likely to miss. These Macamp expect the same honor from their opponents and have developed normally wild attacks like dynamic punch with pinpoint accuracy, at the expense of possessing any skill in dodging. Centuries ago, a hated Johto Emperor was overthrown, and the revolutionaries put him and his Pokémon to a pincer's guillotine. They fled in every direction, the Emperor was caught and executed, but some of his smaller Pokémon escaped into the crowd. His Macamp would do no such thing. Faced with a hopeless struggle, he punched the pincer in the face before his execution, so he could say he went down fighting, then stood unflinching as the pincer's giant, spiked horns ripped his head from his body. There is a minority of Macamp who do not believe evasive measures are cowardly and will dodge any attack they can. Surprisingly, these Macamp are not weaklings attempting to win at any cost, but equally ferocious fighters who follow a different code of battle. They are known far and wide for their guts. Chapter Number 241 The Ghostly Battle If you lose. Janine added with a smirk and winked, you have to go on a date with me. Pikachu and Yellow let out surprised gasps once more at that statement. Austin, on the other hand, looked neutral while Haunter giggled in the shadows. She said what? Is she serious? Yellow thought in panic as her face turned red. Um, I guess that would be okay if we hung out, Austin replied with a shrug as he carefully said those words in such a way that portrayed visible obliviousness while deep down he was freaking out. What did she ask me out? Was this ordered by Team Rocket? Is she going to drug me while on the date as I battle Team Rocket members ganging up on me? Under Austin's calm demeanor, his paranoia was running rampant. Ready when you are, Ash. Janine called. All right. Haunter. I choose you. Austin called as his shadow outstretched into the shape of an Egyptian cross, Ankh's cross. The shadows portrayed hands covering the cross as Haunter rose from the ground like a zombie rising from the grave. Haunter's entrance scared Yellow, Janine, and Pikachu while Austin was amused. Kikikikik. Haunter cried as it got into a battle position causing Janine to take a step back at the sheer size of the Alpha White Haunter. Are Haunters supposed to be that big? I shall choose my wheezing. Janine declared as she threw forward her poke ball. Seeing the wheezing floating in front of him, Austin rubbed his shoulder as he remembered his time in the SS. And. We shall begin our match, now. Janine announced but gulped when she saw the intense look in Austin's eyes. All right, you sucker claw Austin calmly said as Haunter grinned like a maniac before phasing into the ground in the form of a shadow. Flamethrower, wheezing. Janine countered. Janine's wheezing floated upward as it released waves of flames from both of its heads covering the entire battlefield. But suddenly wheezing was thrown to the wall as Haunter's combo of a sucker punch and shadow claw directly hit. Kakik. Haunter laughed as Weezing shot another flamethrower from his position. Haunter dodged the flamethrower but Weezing turned around and launched a gyro ball at Haunter. Haunter got smacked with the gyro ball right in the middle of the chest which knocked it to the floor. Keek keek. Haunter kept laughing even while getting hit. Use smog, Weezing. Janine called. Hypnotic curse. Haunter didn't bother countering the poisonous gases of course, she wasn't affected by the smog attack. What? Janine shouted as she was surprised that Haunter didn't get affected before remembering that Haunter was part poison type. Haunter released psychic waves from its eyes that caused Weezing to move back and forth in a daze before ultimately Weezing fell asleep. Janine cringed at her decision as Haunter released a sonic howl that caused ghostly runes to form all around them that latched onto Weezing. Having successfully landed the curse, Haunter giggled like a little girl. Use Thunderbolt, Janine yelled out hoping Weezing will wake up as Haunter launched a Dream Eater. Luckily for Janine, Weezing woke up and launched a Thunderbolt at Haunter who cancelled Dream Eater before releasing Nightshade at the Thunderbolt. The two attacks exploded in the middle leaving behind white smoke. Use smoke screen, Weezing. Janine called. Sleepwalker. Austin countered as Haunter used to rest to fall asleep. I thought you might do that, Janine smiled. Austin raised an eyebrow at Janine's bravado but didn't bother replying as he remembered Cynthia's words. Those that talk big on the battlefield are covering up their anxiety behind a false sense of valor. 
If you don't talk in battle, your opponent will always assume the worst. A battle isn't just between the Pokémon, it is also between the trainers. Being a ninja, I train in the many ways of stealth, and I teach my Pokémon this, also. I expected your haunter to do something like rest after the smokescreen was set up, since Weezing isn't affected by its attacks, I have concealed its location while haunter is in the open, Janine explained. Austin didn't bother replying to Janine as he calmly looked at the battlefield as Haunter used sleep talk which resulted in a tract being launched. The hearts entered the giant smoke cloud. Then, out of nowhere, a dark pulse burst from the smoke cloud from Haunter's right, striking her. Haunter endured the attack and managed to stay in the air. Finish with Giga Impact. Janine yelled once more. Lanternfish Austin calmly called out. The absolute silence was pretty unnerving. All there was on the battlefield was Haunter who seemed to be sleeping in a giant smoke cloud in front of it. After what felt like an eternity, Haunter felt a whoosh to its right as a split second later, Weezing emerged from the smoke cloud, charging straight for Haunter with a body surrounded by orange streaks. Purple energy then appeared from the top of the streaks and envelopes Weezing's body. A maniacal grin formed on Haunter's face as she opened her red eyes as used the move, Psychic. Waves of Psychics moved forward and smacked Weezing right in the middle of its larger face. The poison Pokémon went sailing backward like a baseball that had been hit by a home run hitter. It slammed into the wall hard. Weezing then sank to the ground, defeated. Your Haunter beat Weezing. Janine said in amazement. Yab. I knew Haunter wouldn't let me down Austin smiled as he gave a thumbs up to his ghost Pokémon. Haunter released a laugh happily in response. Kakik. Janine recalled her Weezing and smiled sadly at it. Thanks for a great job, Weezing. Take a good rest, she told it. She then looked at Austin. Your haunter did very well, but wait until you try my next Pokemon. Austin nodded with a smirk that was copied by haunter. Janine was just about to send out her next Pokemon when a new voice broke out into the room. End the battle at once. The voice ordered. Everyone in the room turned to where the voice had come from. The owner was revealed to be a middle-aged man with tall black hair ending in spikes. He wore a dark robe and had a calm yet the serious expression on his face. Upon seeing the man, Janine instantly looked guilty and looked down at the floor. I fucking called it. Austin thought as he gazed upon the man who would become a member of the Elite Four. Omake paragraph. It is unusual for a 100-foot tall bellsprout, known best for eating butterfree and here across hole, to become a symbol of peace and starve itself to death. It is equally unusual for a great conqueror to follow his example withdraw his armies from conquered lands, and build an enormous tower to symbolize hope for peace in the world. Violet City has been a very unusual place at some times in its history. The Bellsprout was a civic fixture, much in the way a skyscraper or a particularly storied tree might be today. It had lived for a hundred years, growing taller and taller, this rare phenomenon was suspected to be because of Everstone residue in the soil. It had defended the city from an off-led alliance on one occasion, and the general who led it and the other Pokémon in its defense soon made himself king. As a ruler, he gave the rival city of Alpha a brutal sack from which it never recovered and carved out an empire from Ecrutique to New Bark. He was also a man who could communicate with Pokémon. He noticed after returning from one campaign that the Bellsprout had stopped eating, and asked him why. They discussed philosophy, faith, and pacifism for hours, but the Bellsprout would not be swayed into killing to eat again. Later that night, the Bellsprout died. Both convinced and broken by the Pokémon's conviction, the king withdrew from his empire, declared the Bellsprout a god, and erected Sprout Tower in its honor. To this day, pacifist monks train and meditate there, often scrawny from a diet that does not allow them to eat Pokémon. Each one of them remembers this tale and pays reverence to the Bellsprout's spirit in many ways, among them by training Bellsprout of their own. Chapter Number 242 Drama Um, excuse me, sir but they are in the middle of a very important match. Ash is attempting to win a soul badge from the gym leader, Yellow said out loud. That is not the gym leader of Fuchsia City, the man stated, earning a gasp of surprise from Yellow. That is my daughter, Janine. Koga raised an eyebrow as he saw Austin's calm face. So you aren't the gym leader? Yellow asked the ninja girl. I apologize for tricking you, Ash. I was just so eager to have a real gym match with an opponent, Janine answered as she continued to look at the floor. Upon hearing this, Yellow instantly got an annoyed expression on her face and slid over to Janine. So you weren't the gym leader, yet you decided to raise the stakes by saying Ash had to go on a date with you if he lost. What were you planning on doing if he won, 
considering you aren't the gym leader. She asked in a sassy tone with her hands on her hips, Pikachu mimicking her motions. Hunter and Austin looked at one another before they took a step back. They were going to enjoy the drama. I didn't get that far because I wasn't planning on losing, Janine said as she twiddled her thumbs and avoided eye contact with Yellow. Yellow smiled triumphantly at being able to bring this ninja girl off of her pedestal until Janine said her next sentence. Hey. What are you supposed to be? Ash's girlfriend or something? Janine asked. Yellow instantly blushed and looked away. Ash isn't my boyfriend, she muttered sheepishly as she fiddled with her fingers. Janine smirked now that she found a weak spot. Then why are you so concerned that I want to go on a date with Ash? Yellow took a while to answer as she continued to look away. She turned towards Austin and saw him and Haunter eating popcorn while watching the two of them. Where did he get the popcorn? Yellow wondered before a cough from Janine caused her to turn back. This caused Yellow to turn even redder than she already was. I just care a lot about Ash so I care about who he goes on a date with, she said lamely. So you like him, don't you? Janine smiled deviously. N, no. Yellow silently whispered as her face turned bright tomato red. That's enough, Janine, the new man scolded as he went over to her. Janine turned and bowed to the man. I apologize, father, she said formally. Janine's father then turned to Austin who was still enjoying his popcorn alongside Haunter who had drizzled the hot sauce on her popcorn. Young man, the true gym leader of Fuchsia City whom you seek is me. My name is Koga. My daughter Janine is a gym leader in training. Ah, so you're the real gym leader, Austin said as he realized that the drama was over but on a side note, he never knew Yellow had such a feisty note. Maybe some of Misty's tendencies were rubbing off on Yellow. Indeed I am, Koga confirmed. In that case, I would like to challenge you to a gym battle so I can win a soul batch, Ash declared. I will accept your challenge, young man. I can see you are a very capable battler, Koga replied with a nod as he continued, but would you mind telling your friend to show himself? Austin and Yellow tilted their heads in confusion a flash of blue appeared beside Austin. Seeing Lucario beside him shocked Austin as Lucario grabbed his popcorn. I love the future. Lucario's voice only permeated to Austin who just rolled his eyes. Koga and Janine meanwhile were shocked by Lucario's appearance. What kind of Pokemon is that? Janine thought Koga's indifferent face didn't show how much he was shocked to see a Lucario with a young trainer like Austin. Janine, will you be the judge of the battle? Koga asked his daughter. Yes, father, Janine replied with a bow before hurrying away from Yellow to the other side of the room. Since you have already used one of your Pokemon against Janine, we shall have a two-on-two -two battle rather than three. Is that acceptable? Koga asked. That's fine with me. Austin calmly said as looked at the popcorn bag that Lucario handed. It was empty. Austin glared at Lucario who just smirked. Koga smirked once more. Pokemon are not merely about brute force. You shall see soon enough. Venomoth. I choose you. He said as he released his first Pokemon. A large purple moth-like Pokemon appeared from the poke ball. It had large eyes and scaly wings. Venomoth. It cried. A Venomoth, Yellow muttered as she scanned it with her poke decks. Venomoth, the moth Pokemon and the evolved form of Venonat. The dust-like scales covering its wings are color-coded to indicate which poison it has, said the poke decks. Austin took a poke ball before sending out a Pokemon that caused Janine to have sparkles in her eyes as she always dreamed of owning one. Ninja. Ninjask appeared on the battlefield as he did multiple backflips in the air. Just as he was about to hit the ground, Ninjask opened his wings and hovered. Ninjask pointed at Venonat with his claw before moving it back and forth as if he was saying come at me. Koga sweat dropped at the Ninjask's actions as he was the most expressive Ninjask he had ever seen. The match shall now begin. Janine declared. Omake paragraph. Weepin Bell Acid is a remarkably corrosive substance which dissolves many materials with such speed and effectiveness that it is used throughout the Pokemon world as an alternative to dynamite. Developed as a means of killing and digesting prey such as Rattata or Caterpie, it is capable of dissolving even onyx and other rocks. Weep and Bell leak acid from their eyes frequently, in a process that has evolved like a grow-lithe puppy's eyes to elicit sympathy from humans, and this acid frequently seeps deep into the Earth's crust. This acid has thankfully not been effectively weaponized, for no container has been found which can both hold the acid and not cause it to lose potency, save for the Weepin Bell themselves. And Weepin Bell is not an especially powerful Pokemon, 
they can only throw their acid a short distance, are easily knocked out, and humans and larger Pokémon require the continuous application of this acid to be killed in the first place. This is not to say that living creatures are immune. Although Weepin Bell themselves produce a neutralizing fluid, it is an imperfect one, and they produce less and less as they age. If they are unable to evolve soon enough into Victreeble, a Weepin Bell will die from its acid, being dissolved from the inside out. Chapter 246, Chapter Number 243 vs Koga POV Change The match shall now begin. Janine declared. Buzzer Ace. Austin yelled. Ninjask shot at high speeds toward Venomoth. Use double team, Venomoth. Koga ordered. The moth Pokemon immediately split into multiple images of itself and surrounded Ninjask who used the flaps of his wings to create a screeching noise. Venomoth's copies disappeared leaving behind only one which became the ninja Pokemon's target. Now use Psychic, Koga said calmly as he folded his hands in his sleeves. Protocol Alpha Venomoth shot a blast of Psychic Waves at Ninjisk's copies. As Psychic Waves tore through the copies, Koga found himself frowning when he saw the entire battlefield cleared of Ninjisk's. It was clear that Ninjisk had already switched around positions with its copies before. Venomoth could focus on where it went. Venomoth, use Quiver Dance. As Koga called out his next move, Austin shouted out, Now! The ground suddenly cracked open as Ninjisk shot out like a bullet. This was Protocol Alpha, use Double Team then hide underground with Dig. Use Power Up moves until Austin gives them the command to attack. Venomoth couldn't react as Ninjisk's head embedded itself into the abdomen. Venomoth was thrown backyards as the Poison Gym leader told Venomoth to go in for another psychic attack to throw itself back at Ninjisk. Venomoth split itself into multiple copies that flew all around Ninjisk. A normal Pokemon would be extremely confused by the tactic but Ninjisk carefully studied its opponent to see which one of the copies will move first. The second one from the right seemed to move a split second before the rest, and Ninjisk knew that was its target. It would make sure to keep its eyes on that one. Flash Scissors Austin called out as Ninjisk's body lit up like a lamp in the dark. Out of all the copies of Venomoth, only one had a shadow. While Venomoth was stunned by the sudden flash, Ninjisk shot out like a bullet toward Venomoth. Venomoth, use Psychic Trap. Psychic Trap. Turning midair Ninjisk dodged Psychic Waves. Venomoth reared his head back as Psychic Energy formed into a horn on his head as he executed Zen Headbutt. Ninjisk's claws glowed light blue and it swipes them in an X-like fashion, firing an X-shaped light blue mass of energy at the Venomoth's Zen Headbutt. Venomoth's Zen Headbutt clashed with Ninjisk's X-Scissors. The stalemate lasted for a few seconds as Ninjisk emerged as the victor. Use Psychic to dodge, Venomoth. Koga ordered but Ninjisk's speed was too much as his X-Scissor hit right at Venomoth's face. Venomoth, are you able to battle, still? Koga asked. Muth, it muttered weakly. I see, Koga replied before returning. Take a nice hard rest, friend. You battled well. Venomoth is unable to battle. The winner is Ninjisk. Janine announced. At Janine's words, Ninjisk turned to Austin who immediately released what Ninjisk wanted. Austin shook his head vigorously but Ninjisk hit him with puppy eyes. Fine. Ninjisk raised a claw in victory as he turned T the confused Koga and did a T pose. Everyone was even more confused as Ninjisk trusted his abdomen forward while bringing down his claws as Austin yelled out. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Austin was reduced to a blushing mess as he wanted to bury himself six feet under when everyone turned to him. Austin regretted showing Wardertle and Ninjisk his dance moves when he accidentally did Vector's dance which, for some reason Ninjisk liked. Quite the energetic duo. You might have been able to defeat Venomoth in battle, but you have yet to see my strongest Pokémon. It has recently evolved due to all the training we have been through. Are you prepared? Koga asked. We're ready. Austin confirmed. Pika Pie. Pikachu added from the side. Very well. Crabat. I choose you. Koga called as released his final Pokemon. A Crabat? What's that? Yellow wondered aloud. Crabat was revealed to be a dark purple, bat like Pokemon. It had two large wings at the top and its feet served as smaller wings. It had yellow eyes and its teeth were visible. Yellow immediately took out her Pokedex to scan the new Pokemon in curiosity. Crabat, the bat Pokemon and the evolved form of Galbat. It flies so swiftly and silently that no one can notice it even when nearby, the Pokedex reported. I wasn't aware a Galbat could evolve, Yellow muttered to herself. 
Crabat. Use Confuse Ray. Koga called. Dodge with Aerial Ace. Austin hollered. Ninja scabade but the Confuse Ray shot out of Crabat at such speed and such an angle that Ninjask wasn't able to dodge in time. Ninjask was enveloped in the light and it raised its claw in an attempt to block out the light. Once the ray died down, Ninjask had a dazed expression on its face with swirly eyes. It was confused. Indoor Austin called out. Use Mega Drain, Koga ordered calmly. Krabat's eyes began to glow as they stared straight at Ninjask in the eyes. Blue energy began to envelop Ninjask, and it began to yell in pain as its energy was depleted. Baton Pass, Austin called as Ninjask's body released orbs of light as it went back into its poke ball while Shed Ninja appeared on the battlefield. A wise decision, young man, Koga noted, a ghost Pokemon. An interesting choice, indeed. Shadow Ball. Shed Ninja screeched, making everyone but Austin jump, and then started forming a black orb in front of his halo before shooting it at Krabat. Dodge it, Krabat, Koga said. Krabat seemed to disappear into the air as it suddenly appeared in a different spot because it moved so fast. If Austin didn't know better, he would have thought Krabat had teleported. Fast. Austin thought in surprise. Use Confuse Ray, again, Krabat, Koga ordered. Confuse Ray. Austin called. Both Pokemon shot out a bright ray which collided in midair but due to Shed Ninja's stat buffs with Baton Pass. Shed Ninja's confused ray won out as it hit Krabat. Krabat's eyes spiraled in confusion. Willow Wisp. A ring of bluish flames circled Shed Ninja before hitting Krabat's body which had snapped out of confusion. Use Poison Fang. Koga yelled. Krabat immediately appeared in front of Shed Ninja due to its speed and bit down on the ghost Pokemon. Even though Shed Ninja was immune to the attack, Koga was betting on Austin letting his guard down when the effect of burn generated, the heat would affect Shed Ninja near it. Shadow Sneak Austin shouted as he saw through Koga's plan. Shed Ninja's body shot downward as it merged into the shadow before reappearing behind Krabat. Use Shadow Ball Austin called. Shed Ninja screamed once more forming a black glowing orb and struck Krabat at point-blank range. There was an explosion, and Krabat was sent flying backward but it wasn't down yet. Not bad, young man. I will make sure not to make the same mistake twice, though, Koga commented. Shadow Ball. Dodge it and use wing attack. Koga countered. Krabat easily dodged the Shadow Ball. The ghostly energy missed its target by a long shot. It again seemed to teleport because it was moving so fast. Shed Ninja was fast as well, but Krabat's speed was on a whole different level. Austin knew that Koga must have focused the training a lot on Krabat's speed for it to be this fast. Krabat appeared again in front of Shed Ninja and gave it a harsh slap with its wings, but its wings went through Shed Ninja. Use Double Team. Koga ordered next. Krabat split into several copies of itself. All of the copies then began to move throughout the room very quickly. It was easier to tell which Pokemon was the real one when Venomoth had used it because it was slower, but Krabat was so fast that Austin and Shed Ninja couldn't make heads or tails of which one was moving first. They were in a tough situation. Use Aerial Ace, said Koga. It appeared as if all of the Krabat were zooming towards Shed Ninja at an incredible speed as they closed in. Sneaky Mind Reader. Austin yelled as Shed Ninja's halo glowed white before Shed Ninja used Shadow Sneak to disappear into the shadows. Your skills don't match your badge level, if only I could battle you with my more powerful Pokemon, Koga said as he looked at Austin. Hyper Beam. Austin yelled out causing Koga to yell out. Endure. A beam of white light broke through the ground sniping Krabat in midair. Koga couldn't help but chuckle as he looked at his young opponent. Austin's strategy of using Mind Reader and Hyper Beam together impressed Koga. Mind Reader allowed Shed Ninja to not miss its next move which was followed by a powerful move like Hyper Beam which was stronger due to the earlier use of Baton Pass. Krabat struggled to get up and managed to not get knocked out with Endure but Koga was forgetting one thing. Fosi. A layer of flames washed over Krabat as the burn of Will-O-Wisp took effect as it fell to the ground and didn't get up. I can't believe it. Krabat was beaten, Janine said. Koga and Janine then went over to Austin before bowing to him. It is a testament to your skill, you have defeated both me and my daughter. This soul badge is rightfully yours, Koga said before presenting a pink heart-shaped badge to Austin. Omake Paragraph. It is commonly believed that deep in the jungles of CAEI and Orange, colonies of wild Victreebol can be found. In truth, the Victreebol are not wild, but domestic, farmed by indigenous people for their edible leaves and acid with which to tip their arrows. 
They guard their secret with great ferocity, killing most who encounter it, and it has only leaked to the outside world with the development of satellite photography. This leak created astonishment in the scientific community, as Vic Treble was long considered a textbook example of a Pokémon too large, ill-tempered and economically worthless to domesticate. This astonishment speaks far more to the prejudices of man than it does any particular trait of Vic Treble. Bellsprout have been regarded by most cultures as a weed, they are ugly plants, seldom beloved, producers of little value, and tend to invade areas where more valuable plants such as Oddish are grown. The monks of Sprout Tower honor them, but even they do not love Weep and Bell, whose acid has made them feared were not hated almost everywhere. And Vic Treble could be no more beloved than its predecessors. It is not Vic Treble who was too ill-tempered to domesticate, it is humanity who was too ill-tempered to domesticate them. Only when pushed back against the harshness of a Pokémon jungle, when losing the military edge which once let them raid nearby settlements and pushed up against starvation, did a people finally learn to tap their potential. Chapter 247, Chapter Number 244 Austin's Goal Congratulations on your win. These barbaric fights are somewhat entertaining. Lucario added as he communicated only with Austin via Aura. Thanks, Austin answered as he noticed Yellow's silence. Her straw hat was covering her eyes so Austin couldn't make out her expression. Yellow. Yellow quickly looked up before giving Ash a cheerful smile. You did wonderful, Ash. I'm so happy you got your next batch. Thanks, Austin said. Hey, Ash. Would it still be okay for us to hang out later? Janine asked. Janine. A true ninja does not say things like that, Koga scolded. Sorry, Janine muttered and bowed once more. Despite training to be a ninja and gym leader, she still possessed many childlike qualities. Austin noticed that Yellow's expression had darkened again once Janine mentioned the hangout. Looks like someone is jealous. Koga meanwhile coughed as he brought everyone's attention to him. Koga pulled out a black card with various Pokémon drawn on it in gold. I have to say, Ash, you are lucky to have come to my gym during this month since the Indigo League has decided to open the Safari Zone for any trainers that won the Soul Batch. But you have to promise not to disclose this info or the League may get involved and your license can be suspended. Koga stated as he handed over the card to Austin who couldn't help but smile. Guess my luck is finally turning around, Austin whispered to himself but everyone still heard it. Yellow patted Austin as she closed her eyes melancholically causing him to glance at her as the difference in their heights had caused Yellow to pat, not his back but something else. Yellow, stop patting my butt. Yellow's face erupted in a blush before she passed out. Thud. Koga and Janine sweat dropped as they saw the scene. Well, thank you for the amazing battle, and Janine I apologize but we are kind of in a hurry so I can't hang out, Austin said as he picked Yellow up bridal style before leaving. Janine was visibly sad as she saw Austin leaving. Patting his daughter's head, Koga said, maybe it is for the best. Janine glanced at her father before huffing. Come on, Dad I finally found someone who seems to be hiding something behind a mask. Janine, everyone is entitled to have their privacy. I know you get bored in this quiet town with all your training that you can't use, but testing out your skills on someone like him is dangerous. Really? Of course. Janine while you may see someone who is wearing a mask to hide, I see a dangerous man whose anger has been set towards revenge. Why do you think that? You still haven't learned the art of picking up body language secrets and emotions. Throughout the battle, he never once flinched at any of my moves and tactics yet his body moved when his Pokemon got hit. The look that flashed through his eyes wasn't the look of someone protective rather it was the same look that people who have been hurt by the world have when anything close to them gets slightly hurt. Fine. Father do you think he was holding back? Yes, I know it. He was hiding his skills to a varying degree. If that Lucario is a part of his main team then even I don't think I could win with my most powerful team. Janine looked at her father in shock. Her father was selected to be a part of the Elite Four and he had battled it out with Lance to gain the recognition of his abilities. If her father wasn't confident in defeating him, did that mean that Ash was a champion level trainer? Why, you must be joking right? No. While I don't know that boy's level, I am certain about one thing, Lucario is dangerous. Every time I gazed upon that Pokemon, I couldn't help but feel I am staring down the ace of the champion of Kanto himself. Even without taking Lucario into account, those two aren't individuals to mess with, whenever I see that girl, my mind flashes to complete darkness, as if I am staring at the abyss while that boy. That boy, I don't even know what to make of him. He gives off this alien-like aura 
it's a mistake to even consider that he is a human. Hearing her father's words, Janine felt chills down her spine. S, should we inform the League? Inform them about what, that I battled against children whom I sense to be extremely dangerous. Koga's words oozed off sarcasm as Janine asked. W, why did someone like that come here? I think his goal was to get access to the Safari Zone through us. I don't know how he had gained the information that one could only gain access to the Safari Zone through my gym. Koga exclaimed as Janine asked. What should we do about them? For now, just leave them alone. F, father but you said. I know what I said and that's why I am warning you to leave those two alone. It's better to not provoke the beadrill nest. But. That's an order, Janine. Stay away from them. Why, yes, father, Janine said with a bow as Koga looked at the sky as thought. Did I make the correct decision or should I have dealt with them? The Pokemon Center was a madhouse when Austin and the others got back. He wondered what could have caused such a commotion in such a short amount of time. It wasn't because there was a lot of injured Pokemon because Nurse Joy didn't appear especially busy. So what could the problem be? He was thankful they already had rooms reserved here from previous nights. Deciding to ask Nurse Joy, Austin went over to her. She was looking worriedly at all the people in the lobby but was not preoccupied. Austin knew he wasn't interrupting anything. Excuse me, Nurse Joy. What is with all of these reporters here so suddenly? Austin asked her. Nurse Joy sighed before giving her answer. There have been rumors of a Dratini sighted in the Safari Zone this week. It's been all over the news recently which attracted a lot of attention. Naturally, many trainers have come down to Fuchsia City to visit the Safari Zone and hopefully catch a Dratini but since catching in the Safari Zone is forbidden, they are leaving while the reporters are here to confirm the Dratini's existence. Some people don't believe the reports and think it is a big hoax. Some even think it was completely made up with no evidence and was used as a publicity stunt, Nurse Joy said. What do you think, Nurse Joy? Austin asked curiously. I think it's real. Kaiser is the warden of the Safari Zone, and he has been there for an extremely long time. There is a picture of him and Adratini inside of the entrance building that was taken almost 30 years ago. As far as I know, Dratini is still in the Safari Zone, Nurse Joy answered. Thank you for informing me. Can I get the keycard to use the PC room? Austin asked. Sure but don't break anything this time. Nurse Joy said with a forced smile that looked faker than Brock's ability to get a girl. Austin turned towards Lucario who whistled as he looked to the other side. Look at that beautiful piece of art, the wonders of modern technology. Lucario, that's a trash can. Nurse Joy sighed and handed over a keycard to Austin who handed over a yellow one to Lucario. Do you want me to conduct a checkup on your friend? Nurse Joy asked with worry. If that is fine with you. This is my job, so I have to be fine with it. Nurse Joy's reply reminded Austin of Nurse Joy on Birth Island. Lucario, can you go with Nurse Joy to have Yellow checked out while I go make a call? As you wish, I will have it done. Oh make paragraph. I awoke one morning to find myself stranded on a small ship in the middle of an ocean with a thousand red eyes. Thus begins one of the Pokemon world's most famous works of literature, the Saga of the Great Bloom. Put together a century ago by a great nihilist whose name was known only to his publisher, it is based on legends that were based on the history of the time of Kyogre and Groudon's great war to control the world. The protagonist, a man named Orange who is a fierce partisan of Groudon's cause, spends the first half of the saga trapped amid a tentacle pod that drifts slowly towards the shore. Carrier Pidgey sends letters to him and is always allowed to drop them off before being eaten by members of the Bloom, he is not allowed to warn the people of the impending attack. A great deal of attention is paid to his mental state, he is harassed by day by fear, worry, and guilt, and at night by horrific, otherworldly nightmares sent to him by Kyogre. The story is as much an exploration of man's unraveling in the face of a waking nightmare as of any actual war. In the second half, the tentacle Bloom sacks his hometown, but he escapes into friendly lines. It follows him through the war for some time, writing scenes more for action than for psychological exploration, fighting armies of water Pokemon, often the same tentacle who tormented him. It ends with him being left to die by an incompetent commander whose ruthless strategy utterly fails, and his country is washed away by the sea while the war continues without him. Chapter 248, Chapter Number 245 Church of Mew POV Change The rest was pretty much anticlimactic, you know. Austin almost chuckled. Lucario decided that he'd join me. Cynthia arched an eyebrow. 
the two were having a quick chat via the PC technology. Ever since she had departed from Sulphur Island, she had kept in regular contact with him, having called him thrice already in the next two weeks that followed. This was their fifth long-ranged conversation so far. You know, a Lucario in a trainer's team is a sign that they are good people. So, was I not a good guy in your eyes before? Austin asked sarcastically. With how good your villain laugh is, could have fooled me. Cynthia jabbed back. Wasn't my laugh a 6.9 slash 10 in your books? Austin asked with a raised eyebrow. Never said you would make a great villain, Cynthia answered back as she drank her hot cocoa. I beg to differ. Enough of the jokes, where are you now? I am in Fuchsia City and I got my soul badge. It's been a rather long couple of days to be exact. I thought you were in Rhoda, Cynthia observed coolly. I was a few days ago and I took a direct flight to Fuchsia City from Rhoda. Did you meet with your friends? Cynthia asked curiously. Kinda, we all decided to go our paths. I am currently traveling with Yellow. Oh, Cynthia said with a blank expression on her face. Anyways, did you get the souvenir I sent you? Yeah, but I was expecting more than a flash drive. Did you look into the flash drive? No. Come one, open it. You are surprised. Okay, Cynthia said as she was confused by Austin's excitement. Plugging the flash drive into her laptop. She opened the file to find it loaded with pictures and videos. Opening one of the videos, Cynthia saw a video of sparse wispy cirrus type clouds parting into the fair blue sky, the bright luminous sun slowly descended low over the horizon to stretch shadows long and cool in the historic and now lively city of Rhoda, a cultural center of beautiful and historic proportions. The city was a strange contradiction to itself, and yet that is what made it balance out well and lent to its charm. Old architectural structures such as old Gothic churches, and later buildings of neoclassical and art deco styles such as the Castle of Rhoda, the Rom. Rhodonian Athenaeum and the statue of Aaron coexisted beside more modern yet somewhat drabber and less impressive architecture, most being from the days of communist rule of much of eastern Kanto a few hundred years ago. Mixed among them were also more contemporary architecture such as the shopping center and the sky tower that was part of the Rhoda city center, all drawing tourists of every kind from around the world. Cynthia's breath was taken away as she looked at the smirking Austin. You shot this? Yep, Austin said with a pop in the end. How? Well, I strapped a camera I bought onto Firo's crown and had him fly over the city of Rhoda. No, that's not what I meant. Seeing Austin's confusion, Cynthia couldn't help but sigh. Sometimes this idiotic friend of hers was so quick and sometimes he was just so dense. How did you know how to do this? Well, I have taken a few classes in cinematography and photography. When? Before my journey. Austin said with a smile as he remembered how he had begged his parents to let him take the classes since he wanted to be a photographer at his brother's wedding. He had seen so many YouTube videos on the subject. After the wedding his brother and sister-in-law had his photos printed out and framed around their room so when he saw the camera on sale in Rhoda, he didn't hesitate to buy it. Pikachu and the others enjoyed posing for the camera especially Firo despite how much he denies it. Impressive work. Cynthia complimented her as she went through the photos showing so many places in Rhoda with Austin and Yellow. Cynthia's smile faltered as he looked at how close Yellow and Austin were in these photos. Her chest felt caged. What is your favorite? Oh, that has to be the photo of the Church of Mew. Church of Mew? Yeah, took me by surprise when I first saw it. Are there any churches of Arceus and Sinnoh? Austin, there are a lot of churches formed for legendary Pokémon as many believe perceive them as nothing short of deities and this culture remains in many parts of the world but who is this Arceus you speak of? The next day when Austin and the others arrived at the Safari Zone the following morning, there was already a long line of reporters waiting to get in. They were beginning to wish they visited the Safari Zone first so they wouldn't have to deal with all of these other people. This place is nuts, he 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 Austin commented as he looked around. If there is a Dratony, it certainly isn't going to show up with all of these people here, Yellow agreed. As the group looked around, they spotted Paul a short distance in front of them in line. Paul felt someone was watching him and turned around. Upon seeing the duo, he frowned before closing his eyes and turning back around with his hands in his pockets. It looked like he was just going to ignore them. Why is Paul here? Yellow asked to which Austin just shrugged his shoulders. Austin thought that Paul must have a ticket to legally catch Pokemon in the Safari Zone like them. After being in line for almost 20 minutes, they finally made it to the Safari Zone gate where there were several people in a ticket booth. 
It was clear they had extra workers today. Hello. How many tickets for you today? The man asked somewhat tiredly. Austin took out the black ticket and handed it over to the tired man whose eyes widened before nodding at the duo. Please go into the third gate to the left. The tired man said as Austin, Yellow, and Lucario just nodded. Some of the reporters and guests looked at Austin and Yellow curiously. Hey, why do they have to go through a different gate? Someone in the line shouted out as everyone turned to the tired man. They are from the league. The tired man lied back causing everyone to lose interest except Paul who looked at his black ticket embroidered with golden Pokemon. Omake Paragraph Kyogre is the god of the sea, a fearsome beast embodied in waves that devastate cities whenever they awaken. It lies dead but dreaming beneath the waters of Pseudopolis, and will rise again when the stars are right. Kyredos are fearsome in appearance, and indeed in battle, but they live in the deep oceans and seldom venture towards the surface, although when they do it of course is terrifying. But it is Tentacruel, not Kyogre or Gyarados or even Polyrath, which sailors fear the most. Part of this is a simple matter of biology, a Gyarados must pierce a ship to sink it, but a Tentacruel can simply use its 80 tentacles to drown an entire ship's crew. Their venom eats through wooden ships with astonishing speed, and their small center and quick movements make them a difficult target to hit. Rare is the ship that survives an attack from a mature one even today, and in the old days, it was even rarer. But most of it is that they will do it. Polyrath is rarely dangerous outside of human hands, but Tentacruel nurse an ancient grudge from their defeat in the War of Land and Sea, in reality it was a stalemate, even a slight victory, but wars can easily be mythologized, and view every sailor as an invading force on a victory lap. And there is also the fact that, of all the water Pokémon, it is only Tentacruel and those owned by Team Aqua who think the war should not have ended, and wish to start round two. Most of those in the sea correctly realize that man has sided with Groudon, and that man rules the world now, but now and then, giant tentacruel sack a coastal village, and the sea weeps for fear of retaliation. I have written two entries for this Pokemon. Below is another that relates to a particular panel in the Pokemon Adventures manga because it dealt with tentacruel bestiality. The standard anti-bestiality laws contain an exception for women, but not men, who have sex with tentacruel. Most people believe the laws were put there due to concerns about rape, Tentacruel is a large Pokemon who often has its way with women, including oftentimes their female trainers. However, Tentacruel is not the only Pokemon to engage in this behavior Houndoom and Mytaina do it commonly, and the largest Pokemon with proper appendages can be taught to do so by a sufficiently sadistic trainer and will continue even after being freed. This is a common misconception. Language elsewhere in the statute makes it clear that only willing intercourse with Pokemon is forbidden, so as not to punish the innocent. The roots of this exemption lie far deeper in our culture, from religious rituals in ancient times when virgins, or at least their virginity, were offered as sacrifices when the rare giant tentacruel menaced our cities, to ages where tentacruel sex became almost accepted, if never discussed, way to meet women's needs without risking pregnancy in a polygamous society and was punished far less severely than trysts with other humans. And in modern times, the pornography industry thrives on it, indeed. Censorship legislation has had the paradoxical effect of making this easier to produce than human-on-human -human porn. Modern, enlightened activists wish to ban this, either on decency or animal rights grounds, but they have made no progress. Like incest between cousins, tentacruel sex is one of those things many may find disgusting but has roots far too deep to ever truly go away. Chapter number 246 IVs slash Pokemon stats Author note, sorry for not uploading these past few days. I came down with severe flu and a fever of 103 degrees Celsius. POV change. Once Austin and the others were in the entrance building, they looked around at the large room before them. In corner of the room, a large picture of a young man holding a dratony in his arms was shown. That must be the picture Nurse Joy was talking about. Yellow exclaimed while Austin wondered if that crazy warden from the anime would greet them. Looks like the reputation of the Heralds of Gods still holds, Lucario said as he glanced at the portrait. Heralds of Gods? Are you talking about Dratony? Austin asked curiously with Yellow listening in. Yes, a group of Pokémon whose strength on the battlefield was legendary. People of my era called them the Heralds of Gods. Lucario said as he remembered his days on the battlefield. Well, we call these Pokémon pseudo-legendaries in the era, old man, Austin answered with a smirk as his words irritated Lucario. Ash, what are pseudo-legendaries? Yellow curiously asked. Austin thought about it for a moment as he couldn't give the game definition. Well, 
a pseudo-legendary Pokémon are a special group of Pokémon that have to meet special criteria. Dratini is one of those Pokémon. Oh, Yellow said before innocently asking, do you know what that criterion is? I don't, Austin answered back. Yellow puffed out and said, come on, tell me. You always know everything. Haha, <laughs> I don't always know everything, Yellow, Austin said but he couldn't stop himself from smiling. To think he was perceived in such high regard. Austin glanced at Lucario while he rubbed his nose. Lucario, I forgot to ask but where were you after the festival? Well, this old man was thinking about what you said and I think I have found a way for you to start your aura training. Awesome. Clang. The staff members of the Safari Zone walked into the room, their steps echoing off the walls. They were a diverse group, ranging from young Pokémon breeders to experienced veterinarians. Each of them carried a clipboard, ready to discuss the day's tasks and assignments. The staff members blinked a few times as they saw Austin and the others standing in the room. Excuse me, but are you perhaps lost? One of the staff members asked causing Austin and Yellow to be taken aback. Ah, uh, no. We were escorted here Austin answered as he showed the staff members his black ticket. Well, looks like you are one of the few lucky ones to get the chance to capture Pokemon from the Safari Zone. Did anyone explain the rules to you? No. Oh, then let's get started by taking your measurements. Pardon. Don't worry, it's just to get you guys into proper Safari Zone uniforms, as you know capture of any kind of Pokemon in the Safari Zone is prohibited so you will need to wear the Safari Zone uniforms to not attract any attention towards you. Got it. Can I have that ticket please? Sure. The staff director took Austin's ticket before examining it and then ripping the ticket into pieces. So, is the young lady your escort? Yeah, Austin answered as he straightened his shoulders to be measured. As you know the Safari Zone is an artificial home for Pokemon natives and non-native to the Kanto region. Things like the effect of introducing a new Pokemon species to Kanto's habitants are observed here hence you will find many non-native Kanto Pokemon and even with the black ticket, you are not able to capture the non-native Pokemon. Each Pokemon of the Safari Zone have been tagged and we will be alerted if you capture a non-native Kanto Pokemon and your license as a Pokemon trainer will be suspended for 5 years. Is that clear? Yes, but what if the capture is accidental? Austin asked. Cameras are situated all around the Safari Zone so we will look into the matter if the capture is accidental or not. Got it, so are there any other rules? Sadly yes, the Safari Zone has a variety of different habitats here, from grassy fields to dense forests, and each one is home to a unique selection of Pokemon to catch Pokemon in the Safari Zone, you'll need to use Safari Balls instead of regular Poke Balls. These balls are designed to be gentle and not harm the Pokemon so you can catch them without causing any harm once you enter the Safari Zone, you'll have a limited amount of time to explore and catch Pokemon approximately 3 hours with a catch limit of 6 Pokemon. I hope you have a great time exploring the Safari Zone, trainer. Good luck. So where do you think we should start, guys? Yellow asked Austin and Lucario looked around them, as far as the eye could see was a forest, a dense and lush expanse of towering trees, their leaves rustling gently in the breeze. The air was filled with the chirping of birds and the soft rustling of small animals moving through the underbrush. Sunlight filtered down through the canopy, dappling the forest floor with patches of light and shadow. Wild flowers and ferns sprouted from the rich, dark soil, adding pops of color to the green landscape. The forest was alive with the sounds of nature, from the gentle trickling of a nearby stream to the distant hoots of Hoot Hoot. It was a peaceful and serene place, a haven for wildlife and a place of great beauty. How in Muse Green Earth did humans create this? Lucario asked as Austin looked at his Pokedex while saying, says here that the entire Safari Zone was built by Dr. Woodrow Wilson alongside multiple ace trainers from the Pokemon League 20 years ago prior. Praise Mew, to think humans and Pokemon cooperating could be built something so beautiful, Lucario stated as he shed a tear. Yellow and Austin sweat dropped before Austin's backpack before Tister and Pikachu had popped out with a yawn. So, that's where Pikachu was. Yellow said before looking back at Austin. What should we do? Well, Lucario, remember the plan, Austin said as he threw a chocolate bar toward Lucario who happily caught it. You drive a hard bargain, Lucario said as he quickly ate the chocolate bar. Placing his palm on the ground, Lucario asked, which Pokemon will it be? Let's start with Chansey. Lucario nodded as he closed his eyes and began focusing, the appendages on his head beginning to rise slightly. Aura is with me he thought as his vision was replaced with a rather ghostly landscape, 
focusing his aura throughout the safari zone, moving through artificial forest and plains, eventually coming to overlook a massive meadow filled with Pokémon of every shape. Lucario opened his eyes as he looked towards Austin whose aura spiked. Lucario could sense hope in Austin's aura. Why? Then it clicked in Lucario's head. Austin's loss of his friend had made the human jaded and now with the chance, he had to capture a healer, of course, he would have hope. Hope that with the healer no one in his family would get hurt. There seems to be a problem. What is it? I have found the healer. So what's the problem? There seems to be only one in this entire area. No problem, let's go, Austin said. As everyone followed Lucario, they spot a giant grey rhinoceros Pokemon with a stone body. Hey, guys. Look. It's a Rahorn. Yellow said excitedly as she pointed to the rock rhinoceros Pokemon eating some grass nearby. I am going to capture it, Austin suddenly stated catching Yellow and the others off guard. Pika. Ash, aren't we going after Chansey? We are going to do this but I also wanted to capture a Rahorn. We don't have that many safari balls, are you sure you can capture it on the first try? Don't worry Yellow, I have a theory, you see. I bet if I can show this Rahorn how gentle and caring I am, I can coax it to come onto my team. I think it would be a lot more effective than throwing a safari ball at it. Sounds like a great way to die, Lucario asked with a raised eyebrow. Rahorn can get pretty aggressive. Don't worry, Lucario. My plan is as solid as it could be, Austin replied. If you say so but if you die, can I get your secret stash of chocolates, Lucario muttered. What are you talking about? Don't play dumb, that ghost has already revealed your secret. Lucario's words caused everyone to look at the shadow beneath Austin's feet that was giggling. Lucario, I think that was a joke. Austin's words caused Lucario's eyes to widen in shock as he stared on with his mouth hung open in disbelief as he took in the shocking revelation. Lucario felt a jolt of electricity run through his body as he struggled to process the information. His heart pounded in his chest, and his mind raced with a thousand different thoughts and emotions. He stumbled backward, Lucario's legs feeling weak and unsteady. The aura Pokémon clutched at his chest, trying to catch his breath and calm his racing heart. Slowly, the shock began to fade, replaced by a sense of confusion and uncertainty. Lucario didn't know what to think or feel, and he felt lost and unsure of what to do next. But one thing was clear, this was a moment that would change his life forever. Is he going to be all right? Yellow asked while poking the shocked Lucario. Don't worry, just feed him the chocolate bar from my backpack. Pikachu, you stay with Yellow. Pika, Pi. Don't worry, I am going to be fine. Austin answered as walked over to the Rahorn who was still eating and stood behind it. Everyone else waited for a safe distance behind a bush to see how it would play out meanwhile Lucario was happily eating his chocolate. Hey, Rahorn. How are you today? Austin asked it with a friendly smile. The Rahorn looked up from the grass it was eating and gave Austin a blank expression. Austin then sneakily diverted his attention to a scratch on the Rahorn's leg that he had noticed earlier. He could use this as an opportunity to get some brownie points in and convince Rahorn to join his team. Currently, his team wasn't strong enough to battle the entirety of Team Rocket especially not Giovanni. He had a few discussions with Professor Oak and Bill about Pokemon stats which were essentially a numeric analysis of a Pokemon's genetic potential. IVs or individual values were also a term that he had recognized from the two scientists but unlike the real world where IVs were used to determine competitive play. In this world, IVs are a term used to describe the genetic potential a person had or as Bill puts it, IVs are like the talents of Pokemon due to the environment that lives in. It could also depend on a Pokemon species, for example, many ace trainers use Nidoking because of its natural high occurring stats due to the tribal nature of the Pokemon species to battle it out for territorial dominance. Deter your Pokemon stats or IVs, it has greater potential to get stronger in a shorter amount of time but for long terms, IVs or Pokemon stats don't matter that much since a Pokemon can learn, grow and adapt to become much stronger over the years with dedicated training. Now with his goal of destroying Team Rocket, he needed Pokemon who could grow stronger in a much shorter amount of time. He had Bill send him a list of Pokemon with high naturally occurring IVs or stats. Austin gave Rahorn a sympathetic expression. I see that you've hurt your leg before. I could patch that up in a jiffy for you if you want. The Rahorn continued to stare at Austin, not saying anything. Taking its silence as a sign to go on, Austin reached into his backpack and pulled out a few Pokemon medical supplies. They consisted of a potion and some disinfectant. 
He then kneeled next to the Pokémon to get a better view of the scratch. Hold still, Austin ordered gently as he sprayed the disinfectant on the scratch. The Rahorn growled softly in pain but held fast. Brock then sprayed the potion on the wound and gave a smile to the Rahorn. There you go. You're all fixed up now. The Rahorn hadn't let its eyes off Austin the entire time. Is this kid crazy? It still watched as Austin went and put back the supplies in his backpack before pulling out a safari ball and holding it in front of him. You know, Rahorn? I bet we could make a great team together. What do you say? Will you come with me? Austin asked while giving the rock type a warm and inviting look. His methods and theories were flawless according to anime logic. This is how Ash always got his Pokémon. He formed a bond with them. The Rahorn continued to stare at Austin curiously. The Pokémon and humans were eye-to-eye. -eye. Rahorn then began to move closer to Austin. It looked like it was going to accept the offer, and then... Whoa! Austin cried in alarm as the Rahorn tried to go up and thrust Austin upwards with its horn. Boom! Rahorn was thrust face first into the ground as Haunter held the rock type's horn with her claw. Kakik! Guys, does anyone have any idea to convince Rahorn to join the team? Pika Pie! Why don't you ride it? Yellow exclaimed. First of all don't listen to these two idiots and second of all why don't you have a competition of dominance over the rock type? Pray tell, how do I do that? Stare into its eyes and show it you will, your will to be as strong as an unbreakable rock. Austin nodded and turned towards Rahorn that had been pinned to the ground by Haunter. Why don't you join my team? Austin said as he started at Rahorn dead in the eye. The Rahorn stared back defiantly at him. Austin and Rahorn stared at each other, their eyes locked in a fierce competition for dominance. Austin's eyes were cold and calculating, while the animals were wild and untamed. The tension in the air was palpable and both Austin and Rahorn were on edge. They were locked in a battle of wills, each trying to outstare the other. Rahorn snarled and bared its teeth, trying to intimidate the human. But Austin remained unruffled, maintaining a steady gaze and refusing to back down. The staring contest continued for what felt like an eternity, with both Austin and Rahorn unwilling to back down. But eventually, Rahorn blinked, breaking the stare and conceding defeat. Austin let out a small smile of triumph having won the staring competition and established their dominance over the animal. Tapping the safari ball onto a horn before it landed on the ground and began to shake several times. After a while, the ball dinged to show a horn was captured. Omake paragraph. Although the geological processes which cause Gue Dud to form are still poorly understood, they universally create a hollow, spherical geode at the Pokémon's core, often filled with some gemstone or precious metal. These geodes, after their discovery a couple of centuries ago, have become a target of young treasure hunters, drawn by the dream of rare gold, emerald, or platinum geodes that would leave them set for life. Typically, they bring a fighting-type Pokémon such as Machup to a nearby cave, some stronger, less Pokémon-adept ones simply carry larger rocks themselves to smash the Gue Dud open. The individual fights are not especially difficult, but the quantities produced by individual Gue Dud are small, it is neither a lifelong career nor the get-rich-quick scheme the hunters desire, typically they work for a few months before they give up retire in satisfaction, or end their lives out of guilt from too many Gue Dud screams. These hunts are the leading cause of death among Gue Dud, and Pokemon rights activists would complain, were it not for the alternative. The rate of Gue Dud formation has increased in this era, and many caves are all but dominated by the rock Pokemon. These hunts, for all their brutality, play a necessary role in population control which water, ice, ground, and grass Pokemon are either poorly located or unwilling to provide. Chapter number 247 Choo Choo, The Piku Great work, Ash. I bet that Rahorn will be a good addition to your team, Yellow praised. Surprise, your plan didn't get you killed. Lucario jabbed back. Thanks, everyone, Austin said with a smile. It was then they heard a rumbling sound. Lucario. Don't worry it's just a Toro stampede. Let's get out of here. Yellow cried as she took off running everyone else following suit. Pika, Pikachu. Pikachu cried out as no matter what, they always seemed to find themselves being chased by Pokemon. This is ridiculous. Yellow cried as they continued to run. Lucario, who is the strongest Tauros in the Stampede? Austin asked as they continued to run not wanting to be in the path of the Stampede. The Tauros leading the herd is always the strongest, Lucario informed as Austin stopped. Don't tell me, Lucario said. I am going to catch it, 
Austin said as he jumped onto Haunter who began to mimic the sounds of a motorbike. Pikachu facepalmed as he saw his trainer fly away into the forest. Yellow looked at Lucario. What should we do, Lucy? Yellow asked causing Lucario to look at her in shock. What did you just call me? Lucario asked but suddenly a bush near them began to shake. Austin and Haunter stood in the trees as Austin scanned each Tauros as fast as he could. There were about thirty of these Tauros, and there were six in the front. That narrowed it down significantly. The leader would probably move before any of the others so he had to look for just certain actions in the stampede, whether it be a shift to the right, or left, slowing down, or speeding up. Austin figured as he whispered something to Haunter who began to giggle. It was then Austin saw a particular one speed up a little faster than the others. It wasn't long before the rest of Toros matched its speed, and Austin figured that it was the leader. He could go like ash and capture all of the herd but no way in hell he was going to pay for the food and other essentials for that many Toros. From behind the group, Haunter let out a screech that spooked the entire herd. For some reason, Austin suddenly stopped as he didn't throw the safari ball at the leader. Slowly but surely the leader Toros calmed the herd down as their movements started to become more wobbly as they slowed down. The stampede continued to slow down as the herb looked around to find the source of that noise but Austin and Haunter were long gone. Austin glanced at the safari ball in his hands before placing it back on his belt. Haunter looked at Austin in confusion. Did he want to capture a Toros? Austin could practically read the question from the look on Haunter's face as he smiled. Don't worry, I just changed my mind. Haunter was taken aback by Austin's answer as the transmigrator looked at his hand. What was he doing? Even if this was Ash's body, Ash's world, and Ash's Pokemon, why was he trying to maintain the status quo of the anime? Was it to maintain some timeline that probably doesn't exist in this world? Even if he was trying to go back to his world, it didn't mean he had to follow Ash's example, this was his journey and he wasn't going to spoil it by capturing Pokemon that he genuinely didn't care about. Beep. At the sound of the Pokedex, Austin opened up and glanced at an unread message from Bill. I have something to tell you, call me. Austin read the message and thought, Bill should learn how to word his messages better, or else someone will think he is a pedo. With a chuckle, Austin returned to his group that was sitting beside a tree as Yellow was playing with something. Oh, you're back. Are you done with the suicide attempts or should I give you some time? Lucario asked. Austin just rolled his eyes as he curiously looked over toward Yellow who turned and said. Ash, can you help me? Seeing Yellow almost in tears, Austin went over to check where he saw a small, rodent Pokemon with pale yellow fur. Its ear tips, collar, and tail are black and angular with twin pink cheek pouches and a tiny nose that looked like a dot stuck inside a small hole beneath the roots of a tear. Should I even ask? Well... I just wanted to play and Pika got scared and ran away into the root before she started crying out for help. I propose that I should destroy the tree and let the small creature out. Lucario's words caused Pika to cry out. Piku. 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 No, Pika doesn't like the idea. Should I have Haunter go down there? Austin's suggestion caused Haunter to phase out of the shadow. Slap. Lucario and Pikachu tried to stop themselves from laughing as Haunter bitch slapped Austin before going back into the shadows. Okay, cancel on the Haunter plan, Austin stated as he rubbed his cheek. What should we do? We can't leave Piku. Yellow, no one is leaving behind Piku. Wait, I got it. What is it? Yellow curiously asked. You can catch Piku inside a pokeball and then release it. What do you say? Pie. What the hell are you staring at me for, translate? Austin said as he tried to get a cigarette before remembering that Lucario had thrown his pack out and Fuchsia City had a ban on cigarettes. Piku doesn't seem to agree, Lucario said as he readied his fist to break the tree. Wait, wait, wait let me convince Piku, Yellow said as she stood in between Lucario and the tree. Let's give Yellow, a chance. My way was much better, Lucario grumbled as Yellow took out a fishing pole before clamping a poke ball on it. Lowering it down, Yellow closed her eyes as she telepathically communicated with Piku. It is always a surprise to see the aura of a psychic wielder, Lucario stated with nostalgic eyes. Why? Because unlike normal aura usage, a psychic wielder's aura is like a beautiful artistic network of lines that seems to be unconnected yet connected at the same time. Ding the sound of the poke ball alerted everyone who turned to see Yellow happily looking at the poke ball in her hand. Opening it. A Piku appears on her hand who looked around in confusion. Piku. 
Piku said as she released small sparks that stung Yellow's hands before giggling. Piku jumped down from Yellow's hand causing Piku to catch and ate a berry that Pikachu threw at her. Piku, as promised I will release you, Yellow said as she handed Piku's Pokeball to Austin as she had no idea how to release a Pokemon. Piku, hi. Ash, wait. Austin didn't even bother trying to release Piku as he knew something like this was going to happen since Yellow in the Pokemon manga had a Pikachu. Yellow's face lit up as she asked Piku, will you join my team? Piku finished her berry and smiled before nodding vigorously. Yay. Piku, do you want a name? Pi. Then let's call you Choo Choo, Yellow said as she picked up the small Pokemon and hugged it who reciprocated the hug. I thought, Miss Yellow, would name the rat Pishy, Lucario said causing Pikachu to glare at him. Well, her naming sense is unique, Austin said with a chuckle as he saw Piku struggling and calling for help as Yellow had fallen asleep midway through the hug. Piku seemed to get annoyed by the long hug as she released the electricity which shocked Yellow but didn't wake her up. Austin and the others burst out laughing as he saw Yellow's hair turn into a golden afro. The stampede of Tauros had resulted in some Pokemon of the Safari Zone suffering some severe injuries. Tangela was one such victim. Thankfully he was able to escape in time but his vines had injuries decorating them. Suddenly from the bushes a pink, ovoid Pokemon with stubby arms and dark pink feet, tiny eyes and three hair-like growths on each side of its head. The tufts of hair have dark pink tips. On the center of its belly is a dark pink pouch that contains a single white egg. Chansey. Chansey looked at Tangela before waddling forward to help. Chansey offered Tangela her egg as Tangela looked up at the helpful Pokemon's face as a chill went down his non-existent spine as he screamed out in terror. Tangela. Omake Paragraph. During earthquakes and landslides, rolling graveler is among the most dangerous hazards for people living in mountains. Dislodged from their position, the rock Pokemon will roll downhill at dangerously high speeds, picking up smaller rocks and items on the way larger ones will even absorb people, smashing them over and over in an uncontrolled, fatal roll until they hit an obstacle or break free. Indeed, Graveler's unusual texture is the result of these downhill rolls, as smaller rocks become part of them each time while weakening their round shape. It was witnessing one of these tragic events as a child which led an obscure game developer to create the smash hit Graveler Damashii in which one plays as a graveler and attempts to roll up as many items as possible so that the Deoxys King can turn them into stars. This is not the only appearance of the Pokemon Graveler in video games, although perhaps it is the most popular one. The attempts of people to escape from rolling graveler have led to a common level in platform games where a large graveler rolls downhill and the player must dodge obstacles while keeping their speed up to escape. Thanks for listening. <laughs>